Hello everyone, welcome to DPA Open Mic episode 70 and uh, yeah, so uh, I didn't manage to do it yesterday because I was super tired and actually I'm also super tired today and uh, yeah, I, I did a one hour nap and yeah, let's see how this goes uh, so because I'm super tired as well so anyway, I forced myself to wake up and do this so you know, yeah, yeah, so be nice to me and uh Hopefully you guys can hear me. Uh, can you guys hear me? So I gotta let me know in the comments uh, if you can hear me well, and I'm gonna drop the link to join the open mic right now. So the title for today uh, is Macron going crazy, and uh, Ukraine also going crazy. Everybody is crazy. So, yep. The, the audio is Gucci. Okay, sorry. All right. So I'm going to drop the link to join. And uh, and the link is now dropped in the YouTube's uh, live chat as well as in Rumble. For those watching on Twitter, if there's even uh, people watching on Twitter, do come over on YouTube. Join the, chat, the live chat. We have the best live chat uh, in the world uh, right here uh, on YouTube. And uh, for those on uh, Rumble, uh, yeah, it's okay to stay on Rumble, you know, it's okay. <laughs> so, and yeah, so uh, so I've dropped the chat. Uh, for those that want to join, can join. If not, I'm going to start on the monologue. So for those that have not watched the Haiti report, I did a very comprehensive Haiti video. And uh, the V is super low is way lower than how I, or what i expected you know i'm not sure maybe youtube is not pushing it or maybe people are inter intimidated by one hour video but you no know, hi then i don't like friends <laughs> i came i came on just to to talk about how bad france is how insignificant it is how uh how failed of a state it is that they have to go on and like the president has to go on and talk this way and act like he's the leader of the free world. Friends is a joke. You still in Mexico? Yeah. Hey, Dan, Mexico. what's up, man? You've been doing good. You and Sen, you're doing good. Enjoying Mexico. Trying to make a baby and then go back to Russia. Have it there. Jesus. No, I mean, I mean, is she like in Mexico? Yeah, yeah, she's freaking enjoying the heat because it's still winter technically in Russia. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but let's talk about how much summer. we all hate France. Huh? Let's talk about how we all hate France, how pathetic it is. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of weird that it seems like in the last few weeks, all of a sudden, Macron wants to start talking all this shit and, and acting like he's going to do something. And then you think about like what shadowy said, I don't know if RL said the same thing before, but it's kind of like, well, shit's so bad at home. He just starts getting all boisterous and threatening and act like he's a badass just to distract people. Cause I mean, think about it, you had all that 
bullshit conscription talk when all the farmers were writing and all of a sudden, oh, Russia's got space nukes. And you know what I mean? It's like every other week there's some thing that takes the heat off of him, like unemployment, you know, or the migration shit, whatever they don't want to fucking deal with. So they could throw the Russia boogeyman out there every other day. Yeah, as far as I remember, when we were doing these open mics, uh, RL would be stuck in traffic because there's protests in Russia. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but like that was the thing. RL would be stuck in traffic driving somewhere because there's protests in 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 France. And uh, yeah, definitely they they probably have so much internal problems that they this guy's just speaking out of who knows why. But take I like. Huh? Well, I was going to say, I saw uh, somebody took a picture of like a billboard that was put up, I guess, back when the farmer strikes were going on. And it was a picture of Macron's wife, like with her hands pleading. And it said something in French like, please stop protesting and rioting. You're stressing out, you know, my husband and he can't get an erection because of it. And it's hurting our relationship or marriage. <laughs> I was like, damn. But you know what I'm saying? It's like he don't want to deal with his ho home problem. So it's like. Look, look, the Russia boogeyman's coming. The boogeyman. I mean, every it's getting so old. It's like every other week they find some, you know, one day Russia steals dishwashers to to build missiles. The next day they got space nukes. Now, all of a sudden, yeah, it's like make up your mind. You know, I can't keep up with all the stories every day. I mean, one day they're the most evil, sinister, diabolical people on the planet. The next day they're like inbred retards that can't do nothing it's like okay well am i supposed to be afraid of them today or is that next tuesday at seven before dinner and then i eat dessert then i'm not afraid of them again you know it's like so it's i mean i i can't i gotta imagine even whatever side you're on if you're paying attention and you're at least a reasonable person at this point this has got me mind-numbing all the bullshit and crap they try to it, manipulate people with every other you know with all these stories all the time you know, now Macron's out here running his mouth like, really, dude, apparently your wife says you can't get an erection, but you're going to go fight Russia and Ukraine. Yeah, I don't know what it. to say after that, dude. The, the, the ending was hilarious. But the the super panel conversation about uh, so why it had. The idea is like, oh, the Ukrainians can go into Russia. And my idea was like, you know, unconventional, just go into Russia any which way. It's just crazy that some people thought that that was the dumbest ideas. People were saying that uh, people thought that going Ukraine going into Russia was probably the dumbest idea. And it ended up happening, literally. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. You know, man. It, when when Watt was talking about that, you know, that was back when the M1s were there, but they weren't there and nobody had seen them. And I don't know if it was Watt or somebody was saying, you know what, you know, maybe the M1s for their their one last hurrah, you know, the big PR stunt, they lead the push into Belgrade, you know, maybe because they got 30 tanks and a bunch of shit piled up, they can actually get across and get in there a little bit. They get their PR shot. But, you know. I, that was that was one story though, but I mean he's right. You're right though. Wyatt was talking about you know maybe they'll do some clown ass PR stunt into Belgrade or wherever, and they did. And I it, think that it's not like, even a PR right. stunt. I think that they understand that they have a better chance of causing havoc because in war, I mean, you want to do this. What's better, ten guys in a trench waiting to get our like artillery shelled to death, or ten guys going across the Russian border? They found out a better way to use their men which is uh, going, sending them, so they get some sort of uh, craziness done in Russia. But I'm just, it's its a little bit annoying that when people mention stuff like that, they, they discount it as like lunacy. But why has been talking about that for before this one happened, before the other one happened, way long time ago. And uh, I just had to say that because... I, uh, yeah, uh, it, it's got to be way early last year. Because he talked about specifically going in that area because that would probably be the only place they could make a dent and get like a positive story out of it if it worked. We have a French man. Go ahead, Shadowy. Tell us about I wanted how... to add something. Wait, I Shadowy, think, tell uh... us about how shit France is. Oh, I'm <laughs> going to do that, but later. Tell us no, how you're okay. going to save about the the train. Train. I think the naval drone attack at show Russia that Odessa has to be taken. 
Okay, no with the Belgorod attack. Ukraine is going to show Russia that Kharkiv or Kharkov need to be taken too. Basically, to be safe, Ukraine is showing Russia that they need to make sure that uh, uh, Kharkiv and uh, Odessa is under control. I yeah, think Kharkiv it's can all, be the Abdivka. most of Ukraine. <laughs> you know, because by the time uh, you're going to get more of most of Ukraine, because you you Ukraine was just going to have to keep trying, right? So, what is muted? <laughs> some of you know some of the other people that I kind of follow, and I I kind of agree with a lot that they're saying because it's not like an echo chamber. You know, that's one thing we could clear up right off the bat. You know, we have people from all around the world on this panel and they all have different backgrounds and different experiences. And it's not an echo chamber when you have people who can look at a situation and based on their experience because they were in the military or maybe they had a job or just maybe it's a hobby that they enjoy studying history. You can see patterns and things that don't make sense, that are idiotic, insane. And, you know, it's not an echo chamber for regular people to sit here and look at the Ukrainian war and see that it's honestly going bad for Ukraine, very, very bad for Ukraine. That's not picking sides. That's just telling you how it is. And it's pretty fucking sad that people still want to be in denial when you consider what's going on over there right now and how bad it's going to get. And to follow up with what Shadowy was saying, Ukraine is making the case for the Ukrainian territory to be completely occupied by Russia because Russia cannot trust there to be anything of the previous Ukraine left. Which would require, I think so. I've heard people say, 500,000 troops, 100,000 police, and they take everything because they cannot afford to leave anything behind that is even remotely sy sympathetic to NATO or the West. And by them continuing to do these attacks, they say, they're, say, they're speculating that the Russians may be considering or planning for the eventuality that they may have to just take over all of Ukraine. I'll shut up. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Oh. This is the oh, first time you can called, you guys right? Can hear me? Yes, we can hear what? you. Okay. This is the first no, time I just, you're uh, on, right? I'm just, oh, just on for a little bit here because uh, I'm in the middle of making Sunday dinner. But um, I just, uh, I think how the war is going to go is going to really depend on the, like how overwhelmingly Putin wins today in the election. Like if he's take if he takes eighty plus percent of the vote, that's basically the the Russian people saying, "Go all out," and I think we could see a big change in how this war is being prosecuted after the the results of the election come out. Like if it turns out that that he's getting like sixty percent of the vote, then it's probably just going to crawl on as is. But if he gets a massive, like if he gets a massive like both in turnout and the percentage of the vote share, then I think he's probably going to turn up, turn on the screw, turn the screws on, on Ukraine. And, and this thing will probably be, if it's not over by the fall, it'll be more or less over by the fall, in my opinion. So anyway, just thought I'd drop in and say hello to everybody because it's been a while since I've seen you guys. So um, have a great uh, rest of your day and I'll be watching. So Take it easy, do, do, give me, give me your email in the, in the private chat. In the private chat. You have my email. Know. I'm. I'm. I've been on so many. Uh, on before Wyatt. What was your previous it's just name? Been a while. You... Quit bitching and just resend it. It's always been Melkor. Yeah, it just... It's always been Melkor. Always. Why you cannot find in my, in in my in my in my list? Yes, I know, but I, I, I don't have you on my list. It's... I'm, I'm, I'm in your. I'm in your. Uh, I'm in the, uh, the the open mic chat. So the lounge. So, yeah. Holy shit. Okay, I, I I need to go and can no, look of course it's okay, old so, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask something about the. I think we have very sadly for the past Ukrainian two different citizen statue. Basically, if uh, the new republic uh, in Ukraine uh, are attacked by the Ukrainian army, it's not as serious as if it's a core Russian territory. So I think Russia is going to create some kind of uh, glassy of march of uh, uh, border territory uh, with uh, Ukrainian uh, conquest. And if there is a border incident in this territory, it's not going to be a serious issue. 
because they just want uh, to protect the core Russian territory. And, uh, and that's all. Vaughn? Yeah, I was just going to say, and also with with the election thing too, that's something that I've said something about before too. I feel like if Putin wins handily, that's just the confirmation of his support, of the people's support, and it'll give him a mandate to fight the war however he sees fit. And I also believe, you know, I don't want to get too far ahead because I know we got a lot of stuff to go over, but just in this this whole thing with the, you know, the Ukraine, what Russia wants to do with Ukraine, I. I firmly believe that this spring, summer, and into late summer, you're going to see large-scale gains of territory by the Russians because there's going to be general collapses of the Ukrainian army. And uh, by the end of, like I said before, October, whenever it starts, you know, before it starts snowing or raining and it's not muddy yet, really, I figure they'll be at the Dnieper in large parts of the Donbass and it's only a matter of time before the Ukrainian army collapses in, in areas. I mean, the, the shit in Belgorod is just another example of how thin they're spread, how, you know, yeah, it was a good splash for a second. I mean, they fucking, you know, whatever. This shit's going down this summer. This is going to be the summer of love for the Ukrainian army. They're going to fucking feel the heat because it's going to get turned up. I mean, they're they're dropping fabs like fucking raindrops on them. They're going after the Patriots. They're going after the artillery. Every time Ukrainian units move towards the front, they get hit with fabs. They get hit fa with fabs in their fortifications. I may not, this may have been said before, but I've seen a picture now. They're using the uh, whatever 500 cluster munition, and it now comes with a glide bomb satellite navigation kit. And they're putting that shit on these troop concentrations on top of fabs. I mean, there's no way these motherfuckers are going to survive through the summer and hold the Russians back. There's not enough ammo in the fucking world, and there's not enough bodies in the world that can match the Russians and exceed the Russian firepower at this point to turn the tide. This is going to be the last summer for Ukraine, as far as the Donbass goes. I, I wanted to add something about these things. The I think the idea is that Russia is going to change the speed of the attack of the the rhythm of the attack or the form of the attack after the presidential election is a mistake. Uh, since the beginning of the war, Russian has uh, evolved his uh, tactics, not because of politic decision of political or political event, but because the army was ready. When the army was ready with a new weapon, the new weapon arrived. When the army was ready with a new offensive, they start the new offensive. They don't wait for some. They don't wait for some kind of political event, an election, or anything else. They just uh, follow their own rhythm. They don't want to make the same mistake that the Ukrainian is doing, where basically the battlefield decision are taken for, uh, the, uh, is taken by the politician in the capital. No, 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 no. Russian army is, I think, smarter than that. Well, I don't they say decide not... on the battlefield what is going to happen in the battlefield, not in Moscow. All, all I'm saying is, is it's probably going to embolden the Russians to maybe take some more risk or push harder. They can push harder right. and still not take they casualties. They can on. just bomb They are already more. pushing very hard. They are right, already they spending are a lot of money. They have hundreds of thousands they of more men they can surge in. They have thousands of tanks they can surge in anywhere they want, anytime they want. All right, and every day that number grows more and more. They can, they can amp this shit up anytime they want. I want to support uh, Sh Shadowy um, saying that, uh, and I had this insight recently, what happened in the beginning of the war is that the Russians went into some some kind of blitzkrieg, meaning like spearheads, deep penetration in Ukraine. The problem was that the Ukrainians countered this strategy by attacking the supply lines of, of the Russians, meaning that the Russians become overextended, their supply lines are vulnerable, and their blitzkrieg basically broke down. That's why they retreated in the north in the beginning. What happened then is that the Russians got their act together, meaning that they went back to the Donbass. That was their uh, self-announced phase two. And what was the advantage of the Donbass is they had no problems in the rear, the rear was safe, and the supply lines are short. So a complete reverse of strategy. 
And since then, they have stayed in the Donbass and they just have uh, retreated whenever that was necessary, just like in Kherson, just to have the advantage. And the front line has not moved that much. And people drew the wrong conclusion from that, saying like, oh, the Russians are not capable of anything. But you should know that most killings in the war comes from artillery. And Russia had the artillery advantage from day one. And they have like a seven to one artillery advantage. And if you know that three quarters on average of the battlefield deaths and wounded come from artillery, then you know that Ukraine is losing because it has... This is a, a, a winning strategy for Russia, meaning that they're just exhausting the Ukrainian army. And that is also recently admitted in Western media, saying like, there's a shortage of manpower, they're running out of men, and uh, they're running out of equipment. And that, that is what's happening. And I agree with Shadowy that why would Russia change the strategy? I mean, if you really have to go on the offensive in a risky maneuver, you're risking to lose a lot, prestige, men, material. Now they're winning. Uh, of course, they have losses, but they are on, on average they're winning. I have uh, the the things I've said in the past, like implementing your war style on your enemy. It, it causes like a, a snowball effect. So Russia was not uh, using any war strategy in the beginning, and then they figured it out, and they're implementing their style against Ukraine and that's why they choose where the next big battle is going to be every time uh, they started in Bakhmut they did Avdivka they they will choose where the next big battle is going to be and they will suck the Ukrainians in into into meeting them in battle this is uh this is classic war war uh the battle the the way the art of war you know implement your style of war on your enemy don't let him use his style don't let him get his feet under him and just keep going. And yeah, Shadowy is correct. Uh, there's not going to be some sort of ramp up. It's going to be gradual. It's going to be uh, very, very disciplined. Um, and in my opinion, from what I know about Russia, uh, yeah, they do have the manpower, but they're better off not throwing the boys into trenches so they can die. It just doesn't make sense anymore. Russia has learned a lot in two years and uh, the West is pretty much trying to learn from them now because the kind of stuff that the Russians are doing, these huge uh, organized attacks on cities and towns uh, in the numbers that they're using is incredible. I yeah, think. I was just, I mean, I'm not really disagreeing with everything. What I'm saying is, is, as you know, every day the Ukrainian army is attrited more and more. And as that happens, there's going to be more and more opportunities and the weather is going to be right. The time is going to be right. And there's going to be plenty of chances for the Russians to move forward, take areas break through without expending a lot of guys because there's not going to be anyone it's just like when i talk about odessa everyone wants to always say oh amphibious assault what if the russians just attrit the ukrainian army to the point where they can just drive wherever the fuck they want yeah maybe they got to drop a few mortars here and there and clear some rats out but that's what i'm talking about at some point the russians will be able to move and go where they please the only hindrances will be whatever resistance they've run into or if there is some random minefield or entrenchment system they've got to clear around or go around. But at some point, they will be able to drive around and do what they want. I'm not talking about them breaking through the lines and shooting 50 miles into Ki towards Kiev or something. It's like there's going to be gaps in the line that they're going to fucking pour through and they're going to fill up and create the next bloom or blossom or wherever. And like Dan said, they can they pick and choose the war. Like I said, they have hundreds of thousands of guys, thousands of tanks, all kinds of equipment. They can literally move any kind of battalion tactical group anywhere they want north south east or west on that front and drop them off on a train and the isr is going to pick it up and think is this another russian attack here and then the ukrainians got to send people there and then maybe they don't do nothing so they wasted moving those guys and then they hit somewhere else that's where it's getting at and every day it's going to get worse and worse to where the R russians can eventually just drive through areas because there's no one left or very little people left I think we have to to not forget something. Every time the Russian army uh, or Russian commander decide to go faster, quicker, further, uh, someone, uh, some of kind of officer make a mistake, and a lot of Russian soldiers are killed. The best speed for the Russian army is slow, and even when they are slow, they are advancing way more than maybe six months ago. 
I think Wyatt could told us that that uh, today they are faster than six months ago. I think Wyatt. I should I should interject uh, in the sense that um, we might all praise the Russian army, but there have been recently quite some examples in which they really fucked up. Yes, and one one of the examples was in Evdevka when they tried to break out and it was smashed. And, but they tried uh, to go too fast. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, I, I think you're correct. I think I think you're correct, but I think we should really be careful by overestimating Russian capabilities. Exactly, and uh, that despite the fact that Russia is winning, they're still uh, not mature enough, in my opinion. There are still going to be a lot of uh, Russian commanders, there are going to be a lot of mistakes, and a lot of Russian soldiers yeah, are going but, to be killed. You know, you know it's a, it's a thing, war, but mistakes happen. happen. I mean, that, that's going to happen no matter... I mean, they're they're doing the strategy of ground and pound. They they make mistakes and lose guys. They, they push too fast, they make mistakes and lose guys. I mean, and the idea that they can't ramp it up, I mean... If they're dropping 200 fabs a day, they could easily drop 300 or 400 if they want. And eventually they, they'll be able to because there won't be any air defense left so they can fly more planes in or they can fly bigger planes in that carry more shit. I mean, who's to say at some point they won't have a TU-95 bear orbiting in Russian airspace getting calls from dudes to drop 2,000-pound satellite-guided fabs for them like air support from 50 miles away? Eventually, it's going to be that easy. They're going to fucking do whatever they want, whenever they want. I'm not overestimating their capabilities. I'm just saying as this war progresses and they're attrited, their advantages are going to multiply and multiply, and they're going to have more and more opportunities to create the battlefields they want when they want. I think I'm one not, I'm not talking that. like Superman. Shit's working for them right now. They can keep it the way it's going, it's working, or if they see opportunities to amp it up to keep it working, they can. I don't think they're going to go out there and just, oh, hey, there's a hole. Let's drive as fast as we can. I mean, yeah, there's dumbasses that do that, and they get killed. And then there's a new commander, and hopefully he doesn't make the same mistake. I mean, I think those vehicles that got tore up in Adivka, I think that was probably the M1s. They probably did move them in, and maybe those M1s tore up those APCs and shit trying to run those guys in there. And then once the Russians knew they were there, it was game on. Then you saw the M1s get knocked out. And now it's back to the Russians are kind of slowly pushing. The M1s, what, stopped them for a couple of days, a week maybe. And I don't think most of those crews survived. I, I think in, to... in warfare, like in, war, in modern warfare, the thing is that uh, maybe we watch too much American films or, you know, you know on war, and then we, we, we fantasize on how, how easy it is for advanced military can operate you no know, maybe we got duped by you know the gulf war the how us invaded uh, iraq and uh, afghanistan and whatnot so i well, understand that war is very warp but if you look at israel is still stuck in gaza you no know, i expected them to have wrapped up everything you know but they are still you know slowly fighting and still you know a lot of israeli soldiers dying so not to make and that is against a a very small militia group not to mention now, you know, Russia is fighting a full army. So I think, yeah, it's, it's very easy to underestimate, you know, of, of the, the, the defenders, you know. Well, styles make fights. That's why uh, I say that unconventional war is, is hell. Like, uh, you can see the difference between a conventional war and an unconventional war. And and it's like a something in between somewhere else. But styles make wars. And the, the Russians have a different style than the Americans. Um, we can fantasize how the Americans would have done it, but the Russians are doing it right now. And actually, to me, in my opinion, since this started, um, I was living in Russia and everybody from the West was saying, oh, the, the three, it was supposed to take three days. But no, the, the front line is massive. Nobody in the world can deploy right now an amount of men to, to man the front line for either Russia or Ukraine. If the Ukrainians were to go away and, and, and they asked France to man that front line, the fucking front line would crumble <laughs> immediately. That's why this this war is so complex. If you asked any other country besides probably China and India, because they could just put bodies there, maybe not with weapons, but get to throw men just there. Play maybe. It's just it's just incredible how huge that front line is and it changes every day sometimes it gets bigger sometimes it gets smaller it shrinks i don't know like yeah russia has the men to deploy 
hundreds of thousands. And one thing I want to say is, even if you took the weapons away from the, every Ukrainian, I've said this so many times, to kill 100,000 men, it's so difficult just to go get them, the logistics, feeding your men that they have to eat every day before they shoot. If 100,000 Ukrainians showed up in front of your house, it would take you so long to kill them. So even if the war is winding down, it's still going to have to take long because it takes a long time to kill motherfuckers. That's just how it is. If uh, Upgrade or Nunia has nothing to add to these topics, I would like to, to change the topics. I'm not really sure what the topic is. I only came in uh, a couple minutes ago. <laughs> we are ago. speaking about the rhythm of the operation. Uh, yeah. We can yeah, talk about anything, man. A little bit. Going fast uh, or going slow? Agree. Agree want to say something. No, he, he raised his fingers. Yeah, exactly. Let's put the finger. I just wanted to uh, get an answer or maybe ask a question. So we, we always talk about how the Russians are doing uh, the war right now in Ukraine. And everybody's telling it's, take, it's taking time, it's slow, so on. So. In comparison, how would the, uh, the American military uh, do the same operation or the same war with the, uh, against the Ukrainians um, with the same support? How would they do uh, compared to? The we would do Russian way better. Military? Okay. And I'll okay. say it well, simply because we have a better navy and air force. We would probably not even have to land people. Honestly, we would just kill them from the ocean and just suck them dry from the ocean. And that's just my opinion. But to land people, we would do worse than the Russians because Americans, we don't know how to die like Russians. On the ground, we don't like to take casualties like the Russians can do it. The Americans, no, and the Russians have, this has been something that the Russians and the Soviets have been able to do better than anyone else. They have been able to sustain casualties like no one else. Americans, we can't sustain casualties like that. If we lose, Half a platoon, that platoon is gone forever and it's gone R&R &R somewhere in the United States. Like I've seen it personally where where if we lost five guys from a platoon, we're, we're not fit for combat. We have to take a little bit of relaxation. Like, no, the Russians, they, they, they redeploy men. But the reason why we would do better is because our military is 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 has a. Uh, an ace in the in the cards, and that's our Navy and Air Force. We would simply destroy Ukraine from the ocean. Yeah, I mean, I agree with Dan. I think we would rely on our Air Force and our missiles to do most of the work, or at least create such an advantage on the ground that it would be easy. Like Iraq or something, you know, you blow the shit out of everything for six months and then just drive in there. But yeah, we would. I, I think our Air Force and Navy would be the ones doing most of the work. And, and this is considering even if NATO, will you uh, America will not be in NATO and NATO will play a big part to support Ukraine against you. We, or is this just because well, you mean, just NATO right gonna now bring? Think that what's NATO going to bring? Like 40 German Leopards, a couple hundred Polish M1s. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and we know where they all are. Hell, we probably built the storage facilities for them, so it's not like we can't just okay. blow them up. No, I'm just saying, I mean, do you I take the risk think, like shoot the uh, Air Force and Navy would, would just sit there? I mean, think about it. It's just like if if you if you were gonna go fuck with Iran, you know, everyone's like, oh, we need to invade Iran. It's like, why would you invade Iran when you could just sit in Diego Garcia with B fifty twos, fly two hundred miles out, launch twenty cruise missiles, a B fifty two, turn around and land, and never even get picked up by Iranian radar until they track the missiles coming in. You know, I mean, why would you even risk a guy or a boat? I mean, a sub could surface a thousand miles away, fire tomahawks, and the Iranians wouldn't know anything was up until they picked up the missiles. I mean, I figure they'd be doing all the work. Because he's right. We can't take losses on the ground. You start losing. Well, I mean, look at Kabul. People lost their shit over 13 guys because it was bullshit. Hey, guys, let me just jump in real quick. Um, well, Dan said something earlier that uh, kind of piqued my interest. He said something about how uh, the Russians were, and the Ukrainians for that matter, were defining the battlefield, right? And I think that in the West, we've, the last 30, 40 years, we've been, you know, beating up on wedding parties and, and third-rate armies like in Iraq that 
we 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 wouldn't know how to fight a ground war against Russia. We we simply wouldn't. Uh, you know, keep in mind, Iraq won back in 1991 or whenever it was. I mean, it took it took the United States like eight nine months just to get the equipment in place to fight that war, right? And it had a lot of uh, you know friendly uh, nations in the Middle East helping them out. Um, you know, this ground war in Ukraine uh, that, you know, the Russians and the Ukrainians have, to, have defined, they've defined this as being a ground battle, trench warfare, all that, because that's real war. And um, I, I just don't think we're equipped, uh, either in terms of equipment or knowledge, how to fight a war like this. Uh, you know, and, and the only ones who really do right now uh, in the West are the Ukrainians, <laughs> and, and they're yeah. all getting killed. So, but, but what what would you think, Ananya? Like, imagine uh, we we had a, an air force and and the navy during the during those times, and they did whatever they wanted. Our navy and our air force did whatever they wanted in in, all, in these two wars. They have more experience. They have more uh, mission time than than most nations in the world. Of course, we would not fight like the Russians and the Ukrainians. There's no point. If we were to go to war with Russia right now, we wouldn't land. We would just simply do what the Japanese did in the Japanese-Russo war and, and, and sit in the Pacific and, and mess with them on the, in the Far East. I mean, the, the styles make wars. The Taliban won the war because they implemented their style of war on us. We had to just follow them and chase them around in the desert. Why did the Vietnamese win? Was that, I want to ask, ask everybody here a question. Was the Vietnam War a conventional war or was it a guerrilla war? Go ahead, Shadow, guerrilla can war. you answer that? Guerrilla war. Yes. It was no. guerrilla war? No. No. It was because they had warfare. airplanes, they had, they there had conventional military. There is just one special thing that the logistic uh, link of the Vietnamese was not in Vietnam, but in uh, the country on the other side of the borders. Okay. So China, which in mean uh, what I think it was. Uh, so what do you but, think, but, Shadow? Was conventional or was it a guerrilla war? Conventional with uh, specific logistics. Yes, exactly. So, so like war and styles make the 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 the, the outcome. But and that, actually, I'm going to add something I, about this war. The Vietnamese were cheating. They had the general gap, and the general gap never lose the war. Damn it, your French, your French accent. Sometimes I can't understand what. Well, 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 Dan, I will. I do want to jump on. He's the guy who was leading the Vietnamese army. Oh, he was okay, incredible. Okay. It's an incredible guy. If you read the history, he never lose anywhere. He wins against everybody. He has the right. win against the Japanese, the French, the Americans, the Chinese. He never lose basically. I mean, the way I kind of see the American military right now is yes, it's got a powerful navy, but how useful is a Navy these days? And, you know, yes, there's a powerful air force, but I think the Russians have got an even more powerful anti-air defense systems. So, uh, you know, I don't think the Russians are too worried uh, or the Chinese for that matter. You know, how, how would the Americans actually fight a war in the 21st century? I'm not sure because the majority of their assets are still tied up in the 20th century. You know, an aircraft carrier is a, is a target. Not much else, you know. You've got the Houthis now are are testing uh, hypersonic missiles, so uh, I I don't see a, a bright future for any sort of navies unless they're submarines. Let, let me interject about uh, Vietnam and Afghanistan. The problem was that we are too much focused on Western forces, while most of the soldiers in Vietnam and Afghanistan were local forces. And what the Taliban did was not to fight the Western forces; they were uh, and the Vietnamese did the same. They were actually targeting the the police, the local police and local forces. And once they were out of the way, there was no more place for the American forces to stay. They were surrounded. And that's the tragedy. Like all those village heads, all those police, all those civil servants were driven out of the countryside into the cities by both the Viet Cong and the Taliban. So in the end, every time a Westerner comes into the village, they have no idea whether they're dealing with the Taliban or a local uh, bona fide uh, person. I mean, they were lost, cultural and, and linguistically speaking, while the Vietnamese and the Taliban, they are locals. They know everybody and they know how to take out the spies and the informants and the local police and the, 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 the heads of town. And yeah, that, that's how they lost. 
That's because really good of you to mention, by the way. That's really intelligent. That's what happened. They used to kill the, the Afghan police, the Taliban, and, and they started disappearing. Like uh, patrol bases with, with the Afghans disappeared, and it made it harder for us to go into towns, harder for us to patrol. And it was a nightmare, actually, because, you, like you said, you don't know who you're dealing with anymore. Sometimes the Taliban would put their own guys into the police force in a town that they took over, and it's just hell. Yeah, I was just going to say, too, like with the American military today, I mean, with all the uh, new things they're doing, I mean, that's already raised a lot of questions about readiness. And then if you think about the general public, there's no way, you know, like the Russian people, they've been preparing for this and they've always kind of known there's going to be some kind of maybe conflict with the West. You know, I mean, it's always kind of been there for them, not solidified. You know, by appearances from the outside, it appears that they're fully bought into the narrative of Putin and the Russian government, and they're fully down for the fight and seeing it to the end. You know, I don't think the American public, especially in probably a lot of the West, I don't think they're mentally prepared to see or do what the Russian people have seen and are ready to do. Because, I mean, we see what's going on over there in Ukraine, and if you get two big countries like that, you know, yeah, there might be a lot of big flashy hits and fancy shit, but eventually it's probably going to stagnate at some point and you're going to see a similar situation in Ukraine. I mean, like Dan said earlier, I don't think the American public's going to be ready to see, you know, hundreds of dudes getting wasted every fucking day. And, you know, artillery barrages and fuel air bombs and, you know, ships sunk and, you know, I'm gonna you'll have that two aircraft shot down. I mean, I, I don't think we're mentally prepared for that kind of a war yeah, i'm gonna I'm leave guys but w the one thing the re one reason why i believe we're not so good at taking casualties is when i lived in russia you know russian uh geography is so massive most of the soldiers came from siberia where i lived and we're talking about thousands of little towns that if if 10 guys died say from my town nobody would know in russia so like you take 10 from here and there's thousands of towns in siberia 10 people dying from each town doesn't seem so much. But in America, most people come from cities. You know, we're like, we're more in, in bigger in bigger towns. Can you imagine like 10 guys dying in a town where people know each other and stuff like this? And they're so close to a city. Like if 100 guys die from my them. town in like, what? People, um, when there is a guy who disappears in a city, he, nobody knows about it. When there is a guy who disappears in a small town, Everybody well, Sally, know about what I'm it. talking about is these cities are so close to each other. If 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 a thousand guys died from Texas, people would know. If a thousand guys die in Siberia, nobody fucking knows in Moscow. Trust me, the disconnect between Moscow and the rest of Russia is massive. So much that people in Russia say, oh, Moscow is not even Russia. There's a big disconnect from Siberia, where most of the troops come from, than America. In America, most troops come from Texas. If 10,000 Texans died, the fucking country would be like, holy shit, they're killing 10,000 Texans. Maybe the California boys don't want to go to war. <laughs> this culture, there's a different culture in Russia. I, I just, this is why I believe Americans are not good at taking casualties is because we're too tied uh, to civilization. We don't have a Siberia. There's not enough boys in the Midwest anymore right, ready to die. They've already moved to Los Angeles and they're they're getting started in their acting careers, shadowy. This is our culture now. All right. So later, guys. Uh, see you. I, I see want you, Dan. to interject in the sense that people's. Yeah, I want to defend Americans a little bit. What you see with American army is that a very much a methodical approach towards tactical problems, meaning that they're really focused on tactical acumen and they really have a kind of learning cycle, which goes very fast, to be honest. Um, and you saw that in Iraq when they had to revert to uh, countering guerrilla warfare. They had this kind of websites where people exchange their experiences and really learn very quickly. And that's contrary to the Russian army, which has been really slow, to be honest, to adapt to the uh, Ukrainian situation. I mean, pff, uh, I mean, they have been adapting, but I think the Americans would be much faster to adapt and they're much more methodical than the Russians are. Because sometimes I really think, like, what the hell are they doing, uh, like driving with columns and... and, and 
uh, it's 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 really hard to get a <coughs> grip on because only you have a small section of the Russian army like the Wagners, which are really professional, really good. But a large mass of the Russian army is technically really poor, to be honest. Based on what? I mean, I... but what are you basing that on? Hey, the, he says no more sound. To do things, how to act, how to what to watch for. I mean, in the beginning of the war, for example, when the Russians were ambushed, they were literally lost, and these were the professional soldiers. I mean, honest, honestly, it was really abysmal at eh, the performance of the Russian army. Based on what, like, you know, I didn't see any videos of show, showing that. Like, I think we need to be careful. Yeah, I, I, I think they were ambushed, things. and the infantry was losing, uh, running around like chickens without a hat. I mean, okay, uh, so, so that's that's a one-off. Is that a one-off situation that you're gonna cover the entire Russian army with? Because no, what, I, 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 what I've observed from the very start is the Ukrainians getting their asses handed to them. That's just me, uh, you know. Uh, the, the Russians I, I was were, just gonna say too, uh, and I think some of that stuff too could have been maybe some of the militia units, which obviously wouldn't be as well trained or organized. So maybe they get confused as Russians. But the other thing is too with the uh, well, somebody else can go ahead. I was gonna say something, but I forgot because it took too long. Sorry. Just bring my point home. Kharkov is just or Kharkiv is just across the border with Russia. How did ma Russia di didn't manage to take it with that surprise attack? Or we've just attacked with the, the the first tank guard tank army. I mean, that just shows for me. Uh, I mean, not In taking Kiev. Yeah, kind of excusable, but not taking Kharkov just across the border. I mean, are you joking me? Yeah, they didn't bring in enough men. I think we all agree with that. And they were thinking they didn't need to take Kharkiv. They say they were thinking that Kharkiv was already there to. Directly, so I just think, have to send the police force to occupy the city. And it was and a big I, mistake. I do agree with what you said about the you know the American military being able to you know catch up quick, but for in order for that to happen, you have to have the right people in place. And like with the current administration, all this talk of increased production and this and that is just talk. It's not going to happen. So even if you were to get Trump in and magically he got everything in place that needed to be put in place. You're still looking at a year or two. I mean, you're still behind the curve. I mean, you can't. You've got to get all the right people in place to make those decisions and calls that you say need to be made, and then they have to implement them and start. So, even then, you're still years behind where your rivals are, as far as Not their just, mindset. On top of that, even I don't think even Trump will go to war because if you understand that, like the, the advisors that he have, you no, know, I I bought a book, but I haven't read it you know, from his advisor. But it's like, if the ultimate enemy enemy is China, then going to war with Russia is the most stupid thing you can do because you are just basically weakening the two main power that actually can pin down China. So, like in when there's always a three polar kind of a situation, the two well, of them I, fighting is I, always beneficial for the, the other one. And I was just referring mostly just to to the increases in production and more military, you know manufacturing and stuff like that you know i mean honestly even if trump was to get in i mean i don't think he's going to start wars but he's talking about building up the military getting production and stuff going we're still years behind that i mean even if best case scenario you know because think about it, you still got to get people train them hire them buy the machinery get everything set up i mean like I said, you're talking like the, the Christmas miracle if it was to happen in, at the end of 2024 and maybe you could get that all going hot by 2027, maybe 2028 if you're well, lucky. You first but then the next guy to... comes in and reverses everything that was done. So, but then First, you need to clean uh, the Senate and the Congress to be able to, to stop lobbying stupidity. Oh yeah, that's and, what I'm saying. Uh, I mean, Pentagon so in many, France. So that so just things for you that you need four years at least. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. There's so many variables you'd have to eliminate and take care of. I you mean, it, like I said, it'd be the, the, head, if the, the top off. of the pyramid, and that's very, very hard. Upgrade, upgrade. I think Gabriel was first, right? Gabriel, you 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 put your finger up. You can go. You can go. I go after you. Hey guys. 
nice to see you all again. Long time. Uh, just real quick, a um, couple of points. What? We got, you got to respond to the super chat, Gabriel. Shit. Uh, sorry, it's Sunday. Um, it's pretty hot. It's summer here still. So yeah, I, I hope it's it's not indecent exposure in your countries. The important part, he did not deny his Jesus Christ. That's He's in London. I think about the... the, and the I'm, I'm, right I'm not, I'm the, not the Messiah. <laughs> he, guys, he's in Argentina. He can't afford clothes. That's all it is. That's that's probably the the, the issue. How are you, buddy? But I'm not. I, I, I hope you're doing well. I think about you every time I think about Argentina, and I <laughs> I uh, I feel bad. Yeah, don't don't worry about me though. I'm I'm pretty resourceful. Uh, not not money wise, but 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 in other stuff. Uh, I can make bread, you know, <laughs> and I can fish, <laughs> and I do carpentry. <laughs> uh, Jesus, okay. really is Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the Messiah. I swear. <laughs> hey, uh, I, I just am. I I am. Uh, <laughs> okay, so, um, did any of you uh? hear about this article in uh, Marianne uh, publication from France. Well, uh, it was basically like a leak of French intelligence on like the situation of the uh, Russian Ukrainian conflict. It was, it was devastating. Well, it's, it's the things that we've been talking about, but it was like on an official uh, intelligence briefing scale. So it said a lot of interesting things, but one of them was that uh, Russia, Russian armed forces are like the standard of uh, effective defense um, tactics and strategy, preparedness. And, and well, all uh, the other stuff about the depleted U Ukrainian manpower and et cetera. But uh, like back to the, the start of the discussion, yeah, like the the Israeli conflict is is really representative of like the contrast between uh, Western versus um, Russian uh, doctrine. Like it's like why it said it's it's amazing that they haven't wrapped this up. They're fighting like yeah, you can say unconventional warfare all you want, but Ukraine also has unconventional warfare. They they're also doing that. It's not like. Uh, you can't do both things at the same time. You can have an armed forces like Vietnam. Vietnam was a good example of that sort of hybrid conventional and unconventional warfare. And that was so effective on them. And so uh, Ukraine has been doing that and it's been quite effective uh, in, in their own way. That's that's part of, of their major successes, like all the sabotage and shit. So um, I think there's a there's a there's a very significant difference in in, in like strategic planning like um, and and that's where you get like the all this technological development on very fancy Wonderwaffen versus like the mass production of like availability of material and ordnance mm. and that's super significant in a long run like and that shows what U.S has been facing versus what Russia has been preparing to, to face. They, 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 they aren't so concerned on super high tech, uh, weird gadgets, James Bond stuff that, yeah, they're, they're probably really uh, successful, but how overly engineered is something is also how frequently it will fail and how catastrophic a failure will be. Like I have a, I have a friend with which I work from time to time and he has a, a Russian uh, was pickup, like the same ones that show up on the on the footage, you know, like these kind of sort of Volkswagen-y style roundish pickup trucks slash vans. And it's super primitive, it's new, but it's like riding in a World War II style uh, car. Uh, it's super funny, like the gears and shit, they're like just the, metal bar with a you know like the panel is 
screwed on, you know, it's super basic, but yeah, like with a screwdriver and uh, um, like some pair of pliers, you can fix any shit that comes up on, on the, so, so yeah, that, that's, that's kind of like what, what I, I wanted to say. And, and also that um, like the, the U S has, has been fighting inferior forces. Like you can't compare the USA's adaptation to like the Iraq, Iraqi um, circumstances that came up with uh, like the level of confrontation that Russia is having with Ukraine right now. Like people forget that Ukraine is uh, like, isn't Ukraine. You're, you're not, it's not like big, bad Russia fighting a poor, tiny country. Like the amount of support that Ukraine's been receiving is just like absurd. It's uh, massive. And and uh, Russia isn't or wasn't a major superpower. Russia was a broken country trying to get back on its feet. So it's actually quite impressive once you realize that that difference. So that. Yeah, uh, I, uh, I can uh, add to. Yeah, I can add to uh, what. Yeah, yeah, Brandon. Hello, I'm a faithful observer of this chat every week, so I appreciate what you guys do. I've my first time on though. You guys were discussing. Sorry, I, I, every time I adjust the audio, uh, some people's audio just disappear. So, uh, sorry, Brendan, the last sentence, can you repeat again? Sorry, sorry, I was just going to say, I'm very interested in one of the things you guys were discussing about the speed of the advance of the Russian army. And I don't want to change the topic back if we've moved on. I missed some of that while I was getting in. Yeah. No, I think we can you? always go back later. No problem. Yes. Just, oh, sorry. I, I wanted to, I wanted to mention that it seems like, and I heard you guys discussing this a couple weeks ago about the way that warfare has changed. And it seems like, um, as I think one of you was mentioning the Blitzkrieg uh, attempted at the beginning of the war, it seems that the way that ISR has developed, especially with drones, um, something that both sides were utilizing poorly at the beginning, but it's advanced and advanced. You can't concentrate forces, uh, certainly not even close to the lines, but you can't advance them in large groups beyond your electronic warfare and the range of your artillery, which has to, which has to at this point be moved up in these very fortified positions. You've seen what the Russians have on their artillery positions. They have these fortified, bunkered out areas where their guys can run if you got a high Mars coming in or something like that. All that has to be leapfrogged slowly. And if you get an armored company out, you know, unsupported like you saw in the summer with the Ukrainians, they're just sitting ducks. So the whole, the whole combine arms warfare for the Russians, had, the whole doctrine had to be work, reworked in my view, and that the companies, you can only really concentrate about a company level force before you get some major, you know, artillery or HIMAR strike on it. So you have to, you have to constantly keep a, like a leapfrog approach, advance, seize a village, move up your ISR and move up your electronic warfare and your drone operators, put all that in place. It's going to be slow. It's not like when we went into Iraq in you know 2003 or whatever it was, and we drive all over the country in three weeks, you know, everybody's near peer, and so you got to move slow. There's no, it's not just the fault of the Russians or the Ukrainians. So that, that's something I had to wanted to point out. And you know what? Uh, this way of doing war is way better for the civilian, because if you look at the civilian death toll in the, in the Ukraine from the conflict, it's very low. And uh, we are very happy about that, I think. Lowest um, ever, probably. The number of explosive uh, bombs and artillery shells that has been thrown, the number of deaths, uh, civilian deaths is very, very low. It's I'm because the front line don't move. Sorry. I'm um, yeah, I think also this has to do that the war is already two years long and that the Russians had some setbacks at the beginning and had to retreat from a large part of the country. So it's give time for the civilians to actually 
uh, evacuate some zones. But there are still people who are living near the front lines, you know, like I was uh, we were talking about it uh, when one guy came who was fighting for the Ukrainians um, here on the open mic. So there's still people living just near to the front line. So it's, it is what it is, right? But I had to uh, agree a little bit with what the, um, the previous guy uh, said, uh, Rob, that um, there was there was strategic mistakes uh, done at the beginning of the war, especially from the Russian part, uh, intelli from the intelligence side, right? Because if you think you can just go with 120 or 150,000 soldiers and everybody will collapse and it will, they will take over everything and you see that they resist, then uh, obviously it's going to be a little bit of a problem. And there were like footage of tanks who run out of fuel, you know, and they're just in the middle of the fucking place, you know, and the farmers laugh at them like, you need some fuel, you know. So there was mistake done definitely by the Russian army. It's not like the, the, they are perfect. Everybody's doing mistakes. But I think they learned. They learned uh, quite well, especially they made the wise decision to retreat from uh, useless uh, terrain especially from Kherson and uh, Kharkiv, to rebuild, uh, make defensive line, do a proper build-up, proper training from the troops. And now you really see that the machine is going, right? And uh, you see that the Ukrainians have big, big, big troubles uh, to repel their attacks. They just put bodies, actually. So it, it, you can say the Ukrainians doing a good job, but they have huge casualties. You know, that's, that's the problem. And you cannot maintain this casualty rate on definitely. In undefinitely wise, right? So they're going to be a breaking point once, and that's why you see the Western leaders are very nervous uh, that this point is coming soon, and uh, that's why they, especially what Macron is saying, we need to send troops to help them and so on to to help them. So it's it's really difficult situation right now for the Ukrainians, and uh, the battlefield is also not in their favor. So. I don't know. It's time will tell, but it looks like it's very difficult for them. Yeah, Vaughn. Yeah, go on. I was just gonna say. I mean, look at that attack up in Belgrade. I mean, you've got that one video of the tank that's got knocked out, the sixty-four, and there's probably what like twenty dead guys laying around it in the ditch and stuff that got hit by like I think they got hit by at least a Lancet or some kind of drone. It was big. I saw it fly into them, and then I'm sure they got hit by artillery and other stuff too. But I mean. Complete waste. I mean, and it's like, you know, they're Ukrainian because you can see the fucking yellow tape all over them. At least one group is is hit by Lancet, which is a surprise. Uh, the the infantry cluster, they they were they got hit by Lancet, and that yeah, is a surprise that because thing was huge too when it hit them. I mean, I was like, yeah. damn. I mean, because it, it's not meant to hit uh, soft targets. It's supposed to hit you no know, vehicles, which means that. It had been circling around and they cannot find a target. That is scary. Imagine you are the Ukrainian soldier and then the Lancet, after circling for so long, decided to hit you. Means you are dead, man. You have no reinforcement. So, and that is probably also true because uh, some of the geolocations and uh, videos that uh, I have been uh, fo following and plotting, you realize that they, 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 they can't get the reinforcement. No one is backing them up. And then they decided to run back across the border. And then they got hit by the drone again. By you no know, other FPV drones getting hit by mortar. It's like, oh my freaking God. And and we have Kopi. Oh, another guy who don't want to wear the shirt. No, he, he want to compete. All these long hair. I think it's a long hair what problem. Is this like, what is this like naked day on the open mic? <laughs> Shirtless Jesus day. Guy, I, I really yeah, hope because it's, I mean, it's not Ghana, a recent exposure in, in your countries, in any of your countries. Uh, in my country, oh, really? it is actually a death sentence at this moment, which is why I'm in Ghana and enjoying the lovely shirtless uh, weather. <clears throat> I just came on because I missed you guys. How are you guys doing? Good. Uh, I think Brendan is next. Brendan? Hi, Brendan. Nice to see you. Welcome to the open mic. Thank you. Yeah, I wanted to uh, mention something about what Vaughn said. Uh, did you see the uh, Did you see the Ukrainian? I don't know if he was a colonel or somebody in the intelligence. Maybe just today 
was talking on Ukrainian state media that the Russians had achieved a level of drone manufacturing where they could have one drone for every Ukrainian soldier that was on the front line, that they could literally kill every Ukrainian soldier with a drone. Um, the numbers are insane. And I don't think, I don't think that the Ukrainians have nearly the level of like electronic war warfare that the Russians have. So, you know, we've seen the numbers that um, two thirds or in, I think the numbers are climbing of the Ukrainian drones that are getting defeated by electronic warfare. Um, you know, they're, and they're talking about, you know, manufacturing half a million or something drones. Um, but I think the Russians are having more and more and more success because they've really learned how to locate and target some of those electronic warfare systems. I'm, I agree with you. I think given the attrition rates that those things are bringing to the battlefield, I don't see how you can maintain a front line for very long like that. I think the 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 this offensive is kind of a, I would say quite quite a massive disaster if you believe the Russian defense ministry's numbers because they are quoting like super high numbers and it sounds like the casualty level of the counter offensive on uh, at Zaporizhia. So like in the first three days, they are talking about like you know, 1,500 people dying out of 2,500 troops. That is like ridiculous. 60%. How, how do you lose 60% of the troops in three days? Uh, upgrade. But you yeah, look I at totally like when the Russians wanted... Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Brandon. Yeah, I totally agree with you why it's, it's, it sounds a little bit too high, you know. Even if they attack Russian land and you will have a response to uh, that, obviously, but... You, you saw that uh, many of the uh, the front guards, you know, they were just running away because they were just like there to check out the situation. When somebody comes, they just go back and just tell the, 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 the troops back there and then they pound them like crazy and then they they disappear. Uh, but I think it's a, it's a big mistake that they do it again. I mean, like, it's so useless. You need every man everywhere on the front line. You don't need to go and attack Russian territory. It's useless okay you do it for uh publicity stunt right to uh, disrupt their election or the whatever they wanted to do it but it's totally useless you're just losing equipment and you're losing manpower and you're losing morale because if you don't achieve anything then it's it's just a side up right who has no impact on the overall war and the war will not be won if they even if they take belgorod okay then if they take belgorod then they have at least a bargaining chip but they will never take it. They need hundreds of thousands of people to to, to attack this city, probably to even at, to to just break through, right? So I I don't really see the sense and the logic, but probably it's a little bit of like what they usually do. The Ukrainians it's just regulation stuff, regulation stuff. You know, this attack is just propaganda. The, yeah, that's what I mean. The it's, decision it's to make the attack was not in a military headquarters. It was in a political palace. Yeah, okay. I, that's what I mean. That's it's cool. Budanov's uh, uh, doing, right? He's uh, he he yeah. he likes to do this kind of uh, side shows, you know, who is totally useless but great on the paper and in the newspaper, you know, that they all oh, they yeah. attack Russian and so on. It's useless. It makes uh, sense. Make, yeah, come with. Yeah, it makes sense. Just like Krinky, it's it, they're they're doing that consistently. It's it's a uh, it's a trend. It's a tendency. And yeah, it's probably Budanov, definitely. And it, it's a, it's a good it's a good uh, demonstration of of like the, the the Western style of 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 strategy. Like they 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 the Ukrainians are good fighters. I've I've seen the footage, and they're actually pretty. I mean, of course, there's juicy stuff like always, but um, they they've been super good fighters along this whole. This whole uh, war and 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 it's it's impressive, but it's super wasted. It, like it's it's a over focus on tactical achievements and a total disregard of of long term strategic um, planning and object objectives. So yeah, that and, and uh, before I go to Brandon, uh, I just I just want to add if you understand the Obat, uh, the the Ukrainian armed forces right now. Uh, you realize that there is way too many formations, and one of the formations is actually under the uh, the intelligence, uh, military intelligence group, and and 
I, if I'm not wrong, the in the this the intelligence group is the one that is actually organizing all the raids across the border. Uh, so it's like it's very like un unrelated to the to Sers what Sersky is doing. It's like it's doing their own thing and whatnot. Then and and the fact that we're seeing the freedom of Le uh, freedom legion of Russia or I forgot what's the stupid name, like it, it's just some very cringy name. Um, the it just shows that this is actually also part of this Intel uh Intel group that is organizing the the assault. So because if it's the Ukrainian army, they will not have these you no know, all these weird weird groups. But it it does also shows that the if it's this Intel group that is organizing the the offensive at Belgorod, they are not going to go very far because their their formation is not big enough. Like, and and I think Krinky was might be a different group because they are the Marines. They are that is doing the the job. So. Uh, but for me, it's just very messed up. It's like it's all over the place. When I saw the old I was like, "What the fuck is this, man?" Like they have the territorial defense, they have one big army, and like it just doesn't make sense to me. But then, yeah, I, th I think you're right about that. And if you look at the beginning of the, it's interesting to see how the. I'd be curious to know what NATO strategists are doing to adjust their their concepts of war. Maybe we should read some papers at some point, see what they're coming out with. Because it seems like at the beginning of the war, the, the Russians had everything built around the battalion tactical group, right? Everything, every unit had its own artillery, its own drones, its own, you know, it had probably understrength on infantry. And it was designed to operate autonomously, seek a breakthrough. And, you know, the weak point on that was Brandon, logistics, You have to be obviously. careful with that. That was at the beginning of the war. For the yeah, Russian army I'm... is changing today. Today yeah, they are going saying. back the to the I... old model of the artillery division system. Well, that's, that's that's what I was saying. I said that was the way it was at the beginning of the war, but it's changed because yes. the 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 thing that the Ukrainians had at the beginning was a very integrated. And there was videos that various groups did about this. The integrated artillery management system that the Ukrainians had. There was a name for it. I think NATO helped them develop it. But it was like you call you basically just mark a target on the map and the nearest gun hits that target. And it's and the the entire um, artillery and drone system was all integrated on this digital digital system. And I think it was helped. It was supported by Starlink. And the Russians didn't have it as far as I can tell anything equivalent to that. And it seems like what has happened over as things have degraded. And I feel like the Ukrainian army, even though it was chaotic at the beginning, I've heard a lot of interviews with uh, foreign mercenaries who fought with the Ukrainians say that, man, every battalion, every brigade in this army is operating independently. You know, I think you've probably heard those interviews too. Like there's very little top down control and there's a lot of negotiation behind the scenes about who attacks where and what people are stealing from each other. There's a lot of accusations about that. And I think the Russian army has become more integrated, probably developed a similar system to what the Ukrainians have. Because you can see they're hitting deep strikes, short kill times, all that stuff's new. That stuff we haven't seen from the Russians until the last few months. So they've clearly learned and redeveloped and reorganized their entire structure. And I feel like the Ukrainians are becoming less integrated with time. And you're, you're starting to see that. You are missing two, two different notions. The, the size of the battle, anti -battle group in Ukraine and in uh, Russia, at the beginning of the war, was basically the same, okay? It was uh, artillery, armored vehicle, tanks, infantry, and the same uh, group. Today, in uh, Russia, they try to create specific artillery groups who deal only with artillery. They use them to a uh, specific area, like in Advika, in... Uh, in all the place where they need a very, very large artillery concentration because they have understand that for uh, with the static front line, you need large uh, artillery units who can work independently from the uh, front line troops, basically. And they have, they have created this, uh, I don't know the size, they are brigade, company or so, and I don't know the size of the unit, but they are very independent. They have the, a lot of drone, a lot of autonomy to, to shoot the target, and they are very quick to answer to the frontline troops. That's why they change in the Russian army. The communication between the frontline officers or soldiers and the artillery. 
the speed at which an Atayui uh, could fire the first shot after the, the first call of the front line is way, way more quicker than the beginning of the war. Yes, I think that's what I said. <laughs> I, I exactly. think that's been the biggest change that's happened in the Russian army. And I think you're seeing that now. With the, they've gotten a, a lot more volume of precision music, munitions too. Krasnopol, Tornado S, all these things that they had in very limited quantities, they have in large quantities now. And like Wyatt said, they've probably got Lancets orbiting, you know, on standby every, you know, five kilometers or something along the front line. And as soon as somebody calls out a target or somebody sees something with one of their um, their Orlans or something, they just drop it in there. It's that that I don't see how I don't think NATO has anything like that in terms of volume of it, it being able to cover a thousand kilometer front line like that. I, I don't see how we could possibly defeat that. We just left. A see, lot of you left. guys are keep seducing the seducing the audience you know, with no shirts on. You see, people have to super chat. Uh, yeah. so, uh, uh, who, who's next? Jadavi or Upgrade? No. I think... Yeah, upgrade, upgrade. I wanted to, to change the topics. Oh, uh, I, I actually, if I can I respond to the super chatter. If, if I can no, just okay. respond to the super chatter. Um, and I can respond to maybe on Gab Gabriel's uh, behalf as well. Uh, you see, uh, where I'm from, it was a minus 10 when I went down here. So it takes a bit of time for me to climatize. So even though I'm on my sixth week here, it's still hot even in the evening. So uh, you just have to bear with it. Um, and I have to stand up here, so because that's almost as I have connection. Thank you so much for the uh, for the super chat, by the way. Very nice. Also, I see that that's from South Africa. Um, I wonder from who. Mm. <laughs> Maybe, maybe if, if more super chats ask for uh, us to dress, we will dress. <laughs> oh, this is a reverse strategy, you know? Yeah, we, we get reverse the, the only fan. <laughs> yeah, we get the reverse only fan. Everyone take it's off the clothes and we'll get super and chats to get the clothes on. <laughs> All right, uh, upgrade, upgrade, upgrade. Yeah. Is it reverse only fans? We need to put things on, or what, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the more money, the more shit. They send super <laughs> chats, we'll, we'll start dressing. <laughs> no, I just I'll only agree to, to uh, this. I'll only agree to this if I get to be the one who pimps you all out. Uh, we, Only we Wyatt talk laughed. Percentage. Only Wyatt laughed. <laughs> Thank you, Wyatt. Uh, we, we oh, Wyatt, you bring uh, everything down. The open mic. We should not confuse the open mic with a place where pimping is endorsed and allowed. Uh, we should take such discussion to the lounge. <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to add, yeah. maybe uh, because of the previous point was done, that we don't have uh, any um, military equipment who can uh, compete with the Russian one. I think we have, we have, but problem we don't have enough of it. And uh, the only way uh, to counter it is probably to put bodies on the ground. And that's why they're talking about bodies on the ground, right? Uh, soldiers to go there in Ukraine. So there, there is possibilities to 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 to, to counter it, but the problem is it's going to be a third world war if we counter it. So also have the the problem of this point, right, which is now debated around Europe, right, between the Germans who are cowards, apparently, uh, according to uh, our president, our French president, right, but the Germans give much more equipment than the French did and much more money. So it's just ridiculous. I mean, yeah, well, who wants Naomi. to go? Naomi, 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 Naomi. Naomi. Did you guys hear about... Um the Kraken unit in Robotine complaining about the Russian guys who are invading Russia right now, stealing all their equipment and drones. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I didn't That's hear anything about one, it. But, uh, what's but the that story? Would be so, the, so the Kraken unit that's, yeah, the Kraken unit that's working in Robotine 
is complaining that the Russian guys, all those Russian volunteers that went and invaded. Um, so I haven't heard about it, but it makes sense. Stole, stole a bunch of equipment and all of their drones in order to do those ops. <laughs> Sounds like Makes another sense. day in the Ukrainian army. But that seems like a long way to to transport everything as well. You no, know, from all the way from from the Zaporizhia line all the way up to the Yeah, that, but I that, think no, that can be I a think those, I think those I think those Chechen guys were actually working over there, and so before they left, they like stole a bunch of shit before they went. Wow. You know those it, Al Qaeda guys from Syria. Or maybe it was stolen directly from the factory. You know. The command was going to be sent in the Robotini, and it was sent yeah. in yeah, the Like they oh, but it makes sense because if it makes sense because if, if they're using material and ordinance over there, they're taking it from other places that are needed, where it's of needed, course. where it's probably more needed than than to like this suicide banzai dash against a uh, super well defended area. You know, it's a and good I, way for I them, think... you know, like, I'm sorry, I'm not raising my hand. Can, can it's I go serious, okay. I also didn't raise my hand. I'm, I just want to add that I think the, <laughs> because the, from my understanding, the Intel unit, right, actually have a uh, like first, first take in terms of equipment because they are like somewhat like rank higher than the, the standard military units. So they, they might have the capability to take the unit, the, the equipments first, their priorities, but no. But I, I, I'm not sure that the the, the, Ukra the Ukrainian Obat is all over the place. I have no idea, you know, how to how to read who is higher, who is lower. Uh, but Naomi. Well, I was just thinking about how you know you guys are talking about how it's a suicide mission. Well, the Ukrainians hate the Russian volunteers, so maybe it really was a suicide mission. You know, one way to get rid of them. Makes sense. Oh, yeah, especially uh, listen to Budinov, Budinov, I'm sorry, Budinov's um, announcement today talking about their Russians. Russians are Russians. Yeah, they don't like them. Okay, <laughs> sorry, carry on. About suicide mission. In uh, France, uh, one of the previous people speak about the leak in the Marianne uh, newspapers. You have to understand that the Marianne newspaper is basically on the strict opposite the political side of Macron. Okay, it's a very political newspaper, Marianne. And uh, if they had a leak from the military, it's really, really strange because uh, Marianne is on the very left side of the political spectre. And in the military, most of the military in France are on the very right side of the political spectre. So it's very strange that a military guy gives some things to Marianne. They, it's more logical for them to give it to uh, the Figaro, for instance, another French newspaper, but on the right side of the political spectrum. So that means that the leak was specifically targeting Macron. And I think it was a message from some military officers, French military officers, to say Macron to stop saying bullshit. Basically, the French military don't want to go to Ukraine. Or at least these officers who leak the document. Yeah, my friend, stop even... talking smack. Can they even choose? If your president order you to no deploy, you have to deploy, right? He said you can no. choose they to can. The then you then you just go to jail, right? So because if you, you it's insubordination, insubordination, right? And if you, you leak mean? documents, uh, it's uh, I treason. Hmm. Can, can, can. The same thing. What happens when the whole like whole unit, like whole brigade, whole battalion, uh, decided to you no know, ins insubordinate subordinate? Like, can you jail the whole brigade or the whole battalion? <laughs> oh, you can. You can disband <laughs> the unit and create another one with a uh, on by, by changing the numbers. If you want an anecdote uh, on the first regiment étranger parachutiste, the for pa the paratroopers for the foreign legion. There was a, a first uh, regiment, and he has been disbanded because they tried to coup uh, Charles de Gaulle in uh, 58, 59. Wow. They were in the plane uh, going to Paris when they received the order of the French uh, 
Air Force to go back or they are going to be destroyed by the Air Force, basically. Hmm. What if we see this kind of shit happen today? Oh my God. That would be like so crazy, right? And so the first uh, regiment has been disbanded and they created the second regiment and he has a strict order to never go back to the French uh, continental uh, part of the country. They have their base is now in Corsica on an island in Mediterranean and they are forbidden to come back on the continent. Imagine uh, one quick military. question on that. I heard something about Corsica wanting independence. Can you say anything about that? Of Corsica, you have what uh, maybe 10 to 20 percent of persons who are uh, somewhat uh, autonomous guys, somewhat, but they don't really to cut tie with the France because France is giving a lot of money to Corsica. So 70 to 80 percent of the population want to keep the French uh, citizenship. Yeah, that's always been like this. Corsica always had like this independent movement, but they always talk a lot. But after when they uh, need to put a plan together on how to be autonomous, they don't have any because friends like Shadowy said, give them a lot of money. It's basically the same with all the regions who want a little bit autonomous. There's other regions like Bretagne and so on, the Basque region. <laughs> I think what they really want is just a little more autonomous uh, autonomy. Basically, they want to be free to teach uh, Corsica language in school and things like that. You know, very yeah, small yeah, things. I basically. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Hmm. But it's maybe, kind of thing. maybe Russia could make some special military operation in Corsica, or they don't need it. We could give the they give them the island. Give yeah, give it yes. for free. Honestly, for we support. trade them for uh, gasoduc, no problem. Would be fun. Maybe oh, they're waiting for Macron to for deploy. The yes, for us, no. <laughs> no, no. May, may, maybe they'll wait for Macron to deploy uh, in 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 Odessa, and then they'll 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 defend the rights of Corsicans. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now me. It's interesting. The French military are leaking things to the press, and people are saying that it was the Americans who leaked that German conversation, the American military. So what do we got? I don't know. Military folks who are not wanting to fight this war anymore, which makes sense to me. Yeah, I, I, I heard that rumor too. For, uh, really? US military to leak something to Marianne. Marianne, like I told you, is basically a communist uh, newspapers. So it's really strange for a US uh, soldiers or US intelligence guy to send something to Marianne. No, 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 not that one. Not that one. Ah, I'm sorry. talking about the German, the German conversation leak from Singapore. Ah, yes, this one. Yes, okay, sorry. Oh, I don't know. That's how things are done in America, though. I mean, there's constant, constant strategic leaking. You know, if you if you follow American news, whenever there's some kind of uh, military industrial complex priority or goal shift just watch for the leak from an anonymous source and you'll know exactly what everyone wants done that's pretty it's pretty common you know I, I wouldn't be surprised at all i'm i'm really amazed i'm really amazed that that the um, the amount of of uh intel that that gets uh flooded into the media like it's it's practically absurd how you know like the new york times or or the economist or financial times they're always throwing out like some some uh paper or whatever of like what the plans are in ukraine of what the plans are with taiwan of what the, they're always throwing their plans out it's like uh really weird yeah, but if you're you some have... guy on Discord who shares something, uh, then you're going to be strung up publicly. Yes, I'm that. going to jail. <laughs> the double standards yeah. are amazing. Yeah. So oh, don't forget think... one thing. Most of the time, where there is a plan or an intention with leaked to a newspaper, it's not by the military. It's by a think tank. And the think tank is paid when they make report to the military. And to make report to the military, you need to be um, to, to have a reputation, basically. 
So if you leak your plan to the newspapers, you are increasing your reputation because more and more people are going to speak about uh, your ID, basically. Well, I, th I think what it also shows, too, this link between, you know, the government slash deep state, whatever we're calling it these days, and our media, it just goes to show how propagandized we are that, you know, uh, uh, a policy can easily become front page news because it gets leaked because they want it to leak because the media is part of the machine. And I think, you know, for somebody like me who, you know, in the last several years, I've kind of, I've kind of realized, and I think we all have here, that we realized that we we've, we've probably been lied to our whole lives, and that's a pretty sobering uh, feeling to have when you realize that everything that you've been told is is probably untrue, and the fact that you've always been told that you're the altruistic good guy, well, that's not true. So uh, yeah, I think. Um, I think our various governments have got a real problem on their hands, guys, because uh, people like us are waking up every single day more and more, and um, that's not good for them. Vaughn, your turn, I think. Uh, I was just going to say kind of on Nunya's point, you know, like my dad's a Vietnam vet, you know, and he's a patriotic guy. You know, he grew up baby boomer, and uh, it's kind of sad to see, you know, as he got older, kind of realized, you know, he's proud of his service. He's not regretful of the time he spent in Vietnam, you know, his buddies he served with. But at the same time, you realize a lot of it was a lot of lies and bullshit and got him into war as a young man. And he has friends that he saw take off one day in Vietnam and never saw him again to this day. So it's kind of sad to see that realization come to people, you know, like, you know, I'm proud of my service and stuff, but, you know, and Dan is too, but you, you kind of sucks to figure out, you know, you're just used for a cocksucker like Lindsey Graham or Joe Biden to make a buck. Because I mean, think about it as many times as we supposedly have saved the Middle East. I should be paying like fucking 25 cents a gallon. But, you know, it, it never translates. All these great, lofty, righteous causes, they really don't ever translate to anything good for a regular dude. Doesn't matter if you're in America or Europe or Africa or China. If you're a regular dude, just nothing ever seems to pan out off the promises of these, you know, righteous causes. I wanted to add something about the newspapers and the propaganda stuff. I read a, a news a news article from the Washington Post earlier this week, and I'm going to repost it here. And this news article was really strange because basically it was saying that Ukrainian strike has killed five children in Belgorod. And I was very surprised to read that in the Washington Post. And it basically describes the life of the Belgorod population under the uh, Ukrainian strike, artillery strike, okay? And uh, everybody was a brain understand that what is going to happen in Donetsk on Belgorod and the other city uh, uh, of, under Russian, uh, in Russian territory because of uh, Ukrainian artillery. Okay, everybody understands that. But to read that in the Washington Post this week, I think the thing is going to change very quickly in the US media very soon about the Ukrainian are, is a good guy and Russian is a bad guy. Okay, Russian is still going to be the bad guy. But very soon, we are going to have more and more news articles about Ukrainian being also the bad guy. There was a yeah, story this week they were talking about some of the stuff going on in Belgrade and the offensive. You know, and you get the mix of, you know, where they word it to where it sounds like it's going good. I think it was the so Wall Street Journal, China? one of the papers that was covering it, did mention that some of the groups involved in the Belograd stuff are actually Nazi affiliated units. So I kind of think what, you know, that that's starting to, like Shadow, he says, it's starting to turn, you know, they're starting to lay that little groundwork and put it in people's head that there's Nazis there now, you know, when there wasn't before. You know, it's like, you know, they did they let it slip or are they 
<laughs> Guys, come to Canada. Come to Canada. You will not find any support here for, for this fucking war. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. After I mean, that, like they're, already, they're already laying yeah. the groundwork, you know. Now there's and Nazis. I, Somebody will remember I, hearing I saw a story about Nazis in the New York Times or someplace, you know. It'll start getting traction. Oh, I, I've said this before. That standing ovation in the House of Commons, that was the death knell for the Ukraine project. Because as soon as that happened and everybody started looking at it across the world, they were like, fuck that, we're done. I, I can certainly say that about Canada. Interesting. Right. Hey, I, I have to go. I have to go eat and then I have to go out. So I'm going to I'm gonna say goodbye. And uh, just a closing thought. Um, did you guys monitor, uh, hear about like this whole Boeing controversy and just oh, to tie that with with a discussion about about like the the the, the usa slash western preparedness for for war because boeing is also a major military contractor so um that kind of is telling to me of of like the state of 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 the whole mic uh and one last one last thing um about like it's totally out of the topic but just wanted to throw it out there that i i was checking out that like the the past situations in history when there's been like a uh, certain international agreements on sort of multinational or international law like westphalia or or the united nations and all that shit there are usually situations where uh multipolar um uh in a multipolar situation, when there was like a conflict between uh, equal powered countries and they couldn't resolve it with brute force, so they had to like come to an agreement. And when that falls back to hegemony, then we start seeing brutality again. So that's that's kind of like a jab to Wyatt. Um, food for thought. Uh, and bye bye. Nice to see you guys. I'll keep hearing you from from afar. Hey. I just wanted to say before we move on to Ukraine, I was talking to Dennis earlier and, you know, he's been on the open mic before and he wanted us, he didn't know if he was going to make it, but he did want to bring up the fact that the Ukrainians had passed that law or regulation that would allow foreign nationals to serve in the Ukrainian National Guard. And maybe if that had something to do with the, uh, Macron's talk of French troops, like they're not French troops, they're foreign volunteers that join the Ukrainian National Guard legally. But then they were saying, would there really be any volunteers that would want to sign up for that? You know, it's too late for that. I think nobody yeah. wants today to join the Ukrainian ones. Maybe one year ago, maybe today, no. Yeah, and I go? Yeah, he just wanted to, he just wanted to get that in there. He wasn't I, sure think when, I think when the French families start getting the bodies of that those people, <laughs> way before that, are... my friend, way before that. Oh yeah. No, no. O only orphans are allowed to fight. No, only orphans are allowed to join. So no need to send the body back. Nobody no, here to clean. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I I came on to talk, to to actually uh, talk about something that Vaughn touched on. Uh, and, and Nonya touched on, which is basically this whole idea that, uh, you know, the, the, the regular guys have, have, have uh, in, in the West have this, have, have, have good intentions, they're loyal, they're patriotic, they want to do good, but then they were sent on this uh, weird missions around the world to kill other people, and then they, they, they see their friends get killed, and then they are disappointed in life and stuff like that. But if you employ some empathy, uh, to, 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 to the political class in the West, uh, I think you'll see why all of this was done over the years. So the, the West, at, at a, at a, at, uh, after they started to come out of Europe, they, they all realized one thing. They were under men. There are far fewer people in the West than the rest of the world. That it still it has always been like that and it will always be like that. And yes, still to this day. There's just fewer of you guys, fewer uh, European dudes. And so the way that they colonized the world back then was this, um, this 
a huge difference in technology because they have been fighting wars among themselves for over 20 years. They have improved their tactics, technology, equipment, etc., whatever, uh, to, a, to the point where they have a significant superiority in technology. So they could colonize a large portion of the world, even the very, very populated India and parts of China and whatnot. But technology itself has, 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 has caught up in the rest of the world. So uh, for the political elite in the West to maintain their primacy, uh, especially after World War II, they can't, they, 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 they can't just, because you know, if, you, if, you, if you have this, the mindset that every, every single human is the same, like I'm the same as you, you are the same as, the, a, a, a person in China is the same as a person in the US, a person in the US is the same as a person in, in, in Siberia, a person in Siberia is the same as a person in Africa, Right, each each person then has the ability to have, have the about the same productivity, and if you so, if 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 you compete in a world where you have very few people, and the people in this other group, which is not you, you define them as not you, the, the global majority, then you cannot compete because I mean unless you are willing to work much harder than them or much. Uh, you know, are you willing to sit in a factory to make an iPhone for 12 hours a day, every day for 20 years? No, but there are people in India, there are people in China willing to do that. And so how do you compete at that point? If you do, if you, you and technology has more or less evened out because technology has this weird way of finding its way because it's knowledge, right? Once, once one guy knows it, it spreads around. So the way that the Western elites decided that they, to keep their prime position on the, in the world is to go and put other people down. They went out to the to the to the outside world and say, "Okay, I'm going to create chaos here. I'm going to create chaos there. I'm going to create chaos all over the place, so that all these places are in chaos and they cannot come up." And and of course, they know that this feels bad for the Western population. So internally, they have this propaganda that we're doing the right thing. We're trying to spread democracy. Or trying to what so you know if you are a western elite you know person and that's trying to formulate all this like kind of civilizational policy you are thinking i'm doing the right thing by sending <coughs> troops to iraq to kill a million children i'm doing the right thing because this ensures that my people the people in the west you know even though i tell them i'm doing good things i know i'm doing evil but i'm taking one for the team i think that's the way they think and, and if you are able to kind of uh, employ a bit of empathy into that, because there's no other way for West to maintain its primacy unless they keep other people down because their technological age has, has passed, right? So, so, so for, the, for the Western guys who, who, who say that, oh, my, 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 my ancestors or my, my dad or my granddad went to this fort in this useless war, not really, you know, in its own, if you, in its own way, you can you can say that this their their contribution even though they think that they are now they think their contribution is bad but when they, they, when they were doing it they thought their contribution is good in the overall plan the scheme of things what they did also kind of helped you guys keep your standard of living to this day it is you know sure a lot of bad things were done in the name of doing yeah. that but it's you know it's yeah, uh, so there's they no real good or evil in like this world, right? It's evil. just... Yeah. No, yeah, and Drew, so Drew... To them, it's like a necessary evil, you know? And Drew, just, so just to be I clear... Yeah, just to be clear, Drew, I'm willfully ignorant for a reason, right? I like stuff. So it's not like I woke up one day a few years ago and said, holy crap, wow, we are the bad guys. No, I, I think, you know, I think we all know that we are. Uh, but we're, like I said, we're willfully ignorant because we we kind of like our lives the way it is. And, you know, unfortunately for us, that's changing rapidly now. So uh, we need to kind of... Yeah, because you're, you're losing right now. Yeah. So you're feeling yeah. your standard of living go down. Then, yeah. And then all of this comes up. If your standard of living was still high, you wouldn't be making all these questions. You'll be exactly. still thinking this is the right way to do things. We are, we are the best. We are the good guys and, and whatnot. The, the only yeah. reason you guys are questioning yeah, now because you it's feel like, the pain. If it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. You know, if everything's going good, you're not really worried about it. So, 
Yeah. Even if you but know it's, it's wrong. It's, it's nothing to blame about anything. All people like that. When eventually yeah, another bad. civilization gets to the top, they will think we are doing the right things. Look at it. We are the leaders of the world. Be they be it's Chinese like, or Indian or Russian or it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, the humans, you always take the that's path, how we function. You always take the path of least resistance. Yeah. So all this regret talk, you know, it yes, but you know, you know, it, it, it it's not I think yeah. they, they did contribute. I mean, to I agree with what you're saying. It makes a lot of sense too. So yeah. Okay, I just came out to say that. I'm gonna run away again. Bye bye. I so I, I, I think I think that was the next one, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, you see, <clears throat> it's not that we made the the best or the worst, uh, that we are the best or the worst, but we created a certain world with a certain um, discourse or narrative on it. And this is based on the creations of the United Nations. On the, uh, in 1960, the resolution 1514 that initiates the decolonization process all over the world and there is a promise to the whole the colonized world that we are going to enable them to improve their lives. And this didn't come. And then we had the end of the Cold War and we made the same promise to all the poor countries living in complete poverty in miserably that we are going to help them. The only country that got out of extreme poverty was China. The only one. But because, of course, because they are an authoritarian, they are... Uh, uh, they are a, a very disciplined country and they could gain the game of globalization. But we promised with globalization we we're going to give freedom and prosperity to everybody, but it didn't happen. It still doesn't happen. But China gained the West and in doing that, it shows to the whole world that it can do it as well. And this is good. Now, the other problem where we should look at, we have never been as technological advanced like we are nowadays. Yes, some... In order for us in the West to live better, we need always to be in some kind of advantage towards the others. But technology has advanced so much that we actually can provide for the most poor countries just to improve a little bit of their lives. It's just a little bit that makes such a difference. And we shouldn't, and that's the point where we have to, to look at what we are doing now. We are trying to block the, the global South to get that little bit. We are trying to create some kind of economic uh, disasters. This, this, this whole thing about Ukraine is about creating economical disasters, famines in the, in the rest of the world. It, it, there is no need to block the grain. There is enough grain in the world. Why is grain so expensive? It, it is intentionally done. And this is the thing. And also we'll see things with the medicines the same way and so over. So I, I'm not sure he was uh, with the finger up, but I think it was uh, Chadovi. No, upgrade, I think, first. Upgrade, okay. On Brandon after, on after me. Yeah, I, I, I just had to add something uh, to what Drew said. And he, he corrected himself uh, uh, afterwards, but to always blame the, the Western countries to, to, to make war around the world. I mean, like, this is true. Just take one history book in your hand and you, you, should, you should understand that everybody's doing it, right? And everybody's trying to improve uh, their country and before was with con uh, conquering other places and uh, what uh, Plata said was very interesting like we uh, the western countries also decided to abolish slavery so they implemented slavery but they also abolished slavery so it's a, it's actually a good thing because it's useless to force somebody to make something it's gonna have zero input on your economy it's just gonna cost you much more than it's actually producing. So we try to implement this global uh, global trade uh, between each other, and it was pretty much a success because there was peace in the Western world and mostly around the world, uh, and uh, GDPs and so on, and the living standard grow uh, uh, pretty much. Even now, you can see in you you, you can, obviously there's always. Uh, famine and poverty around the world. But even in Gaza our days, people have phone to record all the atrocities was happening. I mean, before that, nobody would see any of these horrible things uh, uh, which are happening there because there will be no technological advancement. So technological advancement is very important, obviously. But the, the, the increase of, of capital and increase of, of, um, of money around the world, yeah, uh, 
what the colonies were given the tools to succeed they choose ethnic co yeah that's another part right they 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 got freedom obviously even if they got freedom it doesn't mean that everything gonna be perfect <laughs> because two is back obvious right if you <laughs> if you leave a state destroyed and then you say yeah now you're free yeah but you destroyed my entire country <laughs> so what i have now i don't have any liberty and i'm bind by uh with you still so um who is uh, next can I respond because he he was you know i i, I just like to respond to what upgrade just said and yeah. i i disagree that you know the uh, fighting just because other people are fighting wars in the past and therefore you are going to fight wars right now and it's justified no there's there are many I many ways to go about the world yeah there, there are many many ways to you know try to maintain primacy I'm saying that the 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 if you see from their perspective, that's what they try to do to maintain primacy. But you don't need to maintain primacy. You can just be like everybody else. Why do you need to? My point, yeah, my point was like everybody does it, not just the Western no. world. Before, oh the yes, of course, of course, the Mongolian tried to conquer entire Asia, and they didn't do it by diplomacy yes. or by trade. They came in with horses and killed everybody until they yes. bowed down to them. Wait, and that's wait, the same wait, with the Chinese, wait, and the same with wait, the Africans. Wait, 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 wait. When you say everybody does it, you are painting the whole world in a huge brush. It's fact. There are many, it's many. Fact, Drew. Go history there books. Are, Everywhere in the world, there was war. It's not something special. There are, there are the many, world. many civilizations that did not do that. Okay, cite me one who never did a war Singapore. in the entire world. Singapore. Tell me one country who never did a war in the entire world, Singapore. who conquered no other country. Singapore. Singapore is no. You have to quote a country that's more than one hundred years old. Malaysia. Uh, Ma Malaysia is not more over one hundred years old. Huh? Indonesia. Malaysia. Indonesia also not over one hundred years old. These are all Thailand. after World There's War Two. Thailand is thousands of years old. Hey, come on. Thailand is thousands of years ago. <clears throat> Thailand fought with the Burmese. Huh? I mean, if you no, want to split hairs thing, on what not. kind of war, why there was a war, that'd be one thing. No, but okay, I mean, yeah. there's no way you can yeah. say that. I mean, every civilization had a war. Every tribe, every freaking no, so, family, literally. No, and and to wait, wait, and to say that this idea that uh, you know the 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 world created by the West after World War Two was this utopia of peace is nonsense, and that there's this huge technological av advance because of it is again nonsense. I mean, when, when, like, when, why, why did the Arab people come up with algebra? Because at that time, they're in that place on earth in Babylon, they had peace because they had this huge empire and they were a, they had peace and prosperity. And when you have peace and pro prosperity, you get people who get you understand the oh, they gained their you're empire. Making point, man. You're making my point when it's oh, exactly that's a good yeah, yeah. finish. Yeah, you're wrong. Hey, hey, you are hey, hey, you are hey, Let me finish. Hey, hey, and hey. why did the why did the Chinese invent gunpowder and all those things back when they had their own big peaceful empire thingy, right? Oh, and so technological advantage <laughs> yes yeah exactly they didn't invent it to kill oh, people they, didn't kill they invented it to for fireworks oh, they didn't kill each but other. anyway yeah, that sounds like technological advancement no, 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 cor no, wait, wait, wait. correction correction the, huh? the 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 invention of gunpowder is not for fireworks the the invention of gunpowder was because they was trying to find for the elixir of life trying to live forever <laughs> and then they accidentally <laughs> found gunpowder Yes, yeah. anyway, so, uh, so technological advancement isn't, you know, it only happens when you have a, an era of peace and an era of stability, okay? No, and please. Now, let me finish what my Martin? point. If you can just shut up and let me finish, I will finish and you can talk, right? Technological advancement only happens really, really quickly in an era of peace, in an area of peace, a geographical region of peace where you have a large security and people like me, people who are nerds, people who are, uh, you know, scholars, they can exist and they can they can function and they are not running away from bombs and trying to survive all the time. And they have extra food. And that's where you see all the technological advances in the world. I use, you know, 
do you would you say the Arabs are smarter than the Europeans because they invented algebra? They invented a lot of things during that time. No. Are the Chinese smarter than the Europeans or because they invented gunpowder and all those things where they had a lot of peace? No. We are all the same. We are all humans about the same level of intelligence. The 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 the, the thing that allows for technological advancement. The thing that allows for is peace, and it, when a country, a bunch of countries in the West goes around colonizing other people and killing people and disrupting and causing chaos, you only going to get technological advancement in that twenty percent of the world. The other eighty percent of the world is being disrupted. You don't see it because you live in the West. You don't see the chaos. You are living there in peace and harmony, and you see technological yeah. advancement around you. Yeah. You have you have a world that it is like that. Wait, wait, Drew. We have a world that it is like this. I'm not done. I'm not done. Let me finish. Let me finish and then you can go. Okay. Let me finish and you can go. So if the U.S. had kept to its promise, which is to actually bring peace to the world, instead of going around disrupting everybody, right, where there was peace in the world, like really peace, where all the regions of the world could develop without the chaos, our technological advancement will be far, far further now than, than what we are now. Because what you need is peace. And when, after this uh, whole Ukraine thing and the West declines and whatever, whatever, and there is peace in the rest of the world, including hopefully including the West as well, right? I think there will be a period of strong uh, technological advancement if there is peace, and we, that's what we need to strive for. Not if we you know, have trade. You if don't need another hedge. Okay, Prata, go ahead. Prata, no, because go ahead. If you emotional have emotional damage. Look, look uh, Drew, you, you you were right about what you said, but this is and we understand the pro the problem is that the world has been living since the Second World War. Is most of the world that exists today is not the West, so it exists is most of the population, everything, and they were promised guy, uh, time and up again uh, prosperity, which didn't come. I understand all your points that everybody is trying to to find its interest, but the thing that is moving the world now is the loss of confidence and the West promises. If you understand what I'm talking about, the, the world lost its confidence and is going to look for other ways, almost the same way you said everybody works. But I think it's a different way. They are going to look for. And you were saying about technological development doesn't help by itself. It happens because you have a challenge and that challenge can be competition to be better than your than your comp competitors, to be to have a better market position. Yes, it is good when you have peace, but also happens with war. It happens all the time. Technology de development happens when you have a challenge. If this challenge is on peace, you have technology made for peace. If it happens on war, you have technology for war. Exactly. It's the wrong kind of technology. We don't want technology for war. We want technology for peace. Yes, we want. And, and, and if you see the, the level of technological advancement in China right now, they have a lot, lot of competition. May I say something to, to the technological advancement? You, you made my point, right? When there is no war, you, you use the technological advancement to build, to build things which people which are going to improve the lives of the uh, average people. That's why you have, and when I was 10, the TV, how it looked like this huge motherfucker where you could barely uh, took by, uh, take by yourself because it was so heavy. You had the antenna on it. Now you have flat screen TV. You have, you have phones in your hand. You have, my father, he had phone, this huge phone, you know, with the antenna, you know, this huge phone in the old movies, you know. They, they, they don't exist anymore. Everybody can make a video call, uh, uh, can text to anybody in the world in, in, in a couple of seconds. And that's just because of technological, technological advancement and because there was also a certain peace around the world. So you don't need to actually invest money, right, into military production and you can use it much more efficiently. And rise the level of everybody else to, to say that the entire world didn't increase 
It's, it's ludicrous. Like you go 100 years oh, back, people are still were going around with some, in some countries, they were still going around with some horses in some countries, right? Now, most of the people around the world have cars, you know, they have a flat, they, they have the technology advancement could be more. Could have been more. Of I didn't course say it can always advance. be more, Drew. Of, of course, it's going to always be could more, be right? More. But, could have been a lot more. Be a lot it's more. Like 20% of the world is doing the technological advancement. I'm and not the other is not. I'm not arguing. Uh, I, strong, I strongly disagree. Is the too, only disagree reason too. why the in peace time there is a, a huge advance of techn technology is because of industrialization and uh, and uh, modern economics. The, if you go back to the old times where everybody's just farmers, the kings only want you to farm. No one is supposed to invent shit. So un unless you are in the direct servi servitude of the king and the king asks you to do something, you no, know? yeah. or you have a you know, Leonardo da Vinci you know, sitting somewhere and you know, cannot control himself but keep creating things, and then you know you will, you will send your in inquisitor to kind of try to catch him, and then you will just change country, change kingdoms. But you know. The, the I don't think peacetime brings a lot of technological change because even let's say you see like the invention of gunpowder, that's because the emperor demanded an elixir of life, and then you know, and then they all the all the Taoist priests or don't know what shit, you know, they start to all the alchemists start to know, mix time. shit up. And but did yeah, but, <laughs> but that's only because the the monarch demands yeah. it. It doesn't come no, naturally. The the the, so, the, the, it, the issue you have here is a, a difference between correlation. Causation. No, you're, you're trying but the to thing is, two different things. But if you That's if you track you the technology, but you track the technological advance, it takes them long. You know, it takes decades mm. and centuries yeah. for yeah. like it, if it you don't like use squat for like two thousand years, no, then yeah. it, like because of industrialization in modern economics, you know, consumer uh economics, you know, that it makes sense for you know peacetime for people to you know develop things because it earns money. So it's a bit different. I, I I mean, in modern day, I can agree that in peacetime, you can get certain type of uh, quick technological advance, like what we are seeing now. But you no, know, war always push things much further and much faster. That's what yeah. I think, uh, not peacetime. Yeah. So, yeah, but that, uh, I, of course, you can argue, uh, you can um, disagree with me. So perfectly fine. No, no. A lot of technology that we have nowadays was developed during the Cold War, either by the Russians or by the, the, the Americans. And it is military technology that was adapted then for civic uh, uh, use, civil mm -hmm. use. Yeah. Yes, but we could have we could have had civil technologies for civil use. Is what I'm saying, which is what's happening right now, where we have a regions of peace in like China, in India, in, you know, where they are not uh, subject to coercion and, and, and political stress. There is huge technological advancement, and not for war, and we see it today. So it, you know, so it's it, if if we had this from uh, after World War II, if the U.S. had just implemented this system where there wa wasn't chaos, where there was peace, I think we would be far along, a lot further along today. That's I still disagree I because the technology is developed for war in peacetime. For example, if you look at the let's say the autobahn, you know, let's say the the just a simple thing, you know, the the super highways in Germany. Those are what Hitler developed and built for war, to so that they can move their troops quickly. You I know, mean, for every technology highways. that you you yeah, just there's not even technology, possible. just just like uh, infrastructure. You know the yeah, same sure. thing. You know for everything, every, the internet, like, signal, computers. You know all start off as a military. Even war. It was a bunch of uh, nerds sitting in no, uh, uh, the, the university of. in the US. No, yeah, no, the no, technological because no. internet start, from Dapa and Dapa was a military network. Every, Yes. Yeah. Yes. But, so okay, the internet, internet, internet. On the you, same you internet, have nuclear power. I'm sorry, but uh, I have it's all DOD stuff. Up for ten yes. minutes now, so I'm going to to. Me to too. <laughs> sorry, yeah. but oh. what I want to say is, Drew, I don't agree with you. War is right. an accelerator for science. It's a very sad thing, but it's a true thing. It was the it same is. thing for the Y word in Europe. It's a war. We increase the size of the network incredibly. For the aircraft, it was the same thing. It was World War One. We increased the capacity of the aircraft very importantly. Uh, for the rocket on the space conquest, it's von Braun and the oh. Russian guy who increased that. And it was after or a bit uh, in World War uh, Two. For internet, it was DARPA. 
It's for, always for the same thing. You need the war to go faster with science. That's another okay, example. I can, but it's the truth. The, 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 I, can the, even the, call you, I can even call you historical examples why it's not true. Japan closed its borders. They stopped using uh, gunpowder. They want they 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 control. You know, they close up the whole the whole empire, and then and then by the time the next time the foreigners appear, they are already outgunned. The yeah, techno yeah, the technological yeah. difference between the West, the rest of the world, and Japan was like so huge Japan to the point where they have no choice. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. That's a very but bad example. Peace, right? That's a no, they fought between each other. Why do you know that? Japan, it was the Edo Japan? time, the Shogun time. Okay, man. Come okay, on, you okay. know that. But so that, that's a very bad experience. example because Don't Japan wasn't close itself out. Let's let's follow the war. fingers. It closed itself out from competition. Competition is what drives. And you know, I can name many many technologies. Solar panels that didn't come from war. Uh, you know, your water filtration systems didn't come from war. Osmosis systems didn't come from war. Many uh, nuclear power plants, even though they they develop nukes from that technology, oh, it starts so from civilian yeah. technology. There's so, so many okay. technologies that start from civil. The reason you think that war is the way to drive technology is because we've been living in a world of war. And now, how, who would have funded war. the Manhattan Project from private equity? That was like what the Manhattan Project the GDP. No, like, the Manhattan that? Project. Is the same the same Manhattan Project that? exactly but, the Manhattan Project created nukes but before the manhattan project they were already trying to use nuclear power we've for trying, power we've been trying to do fusion nukes. nuclear fusion for 50 years using private funding and we haven't done it but if and that's the us war. government through but i'm that's what i'm saying if you don't have a war you don't have the motivation to put a trillion they dollars did. behind they something. were already trying the space to use program was what, what was that like five percent of us GDP. come on Drew, we let's gone to the moon if we weren't competing with the ussr as soon as the ussr seemed weak we quit trying we still can't go back like competition with who it's a life or death struggle that's why people are motivated otherwise they go back to doing like, every technology we enjoy today was invented in either from technologies that came out of world war ii or the cold war i mean that that's almost true of everything yeah but the, the competition you need doesn't need to be us killing you it can be economic competition it can be political competition it can be there's diplomatic nothing competition. More, there's nothing there's nothing more motivating than survival <laughs> yes. yes agree motivation agree. for survival I agree with that. and stronger. i agree a lot of technologies came out of of war but i'm saying it's a survival ship bias is we are we we came we see it today because it happened but there could have been an alternative a better alternative. yes but it would have been way way more slower oh my god oh my god yeah, i disagree Boss is angry. Boss is angry. Boss is angry. Boss is Let's fucking move on. Okay, I'll go, I'll, I'll okay. go away so you guys can move on. Drew and Wyatt are here, and they both huh? live in China's backyard or have family in the backyard, and no white might be back up there. What do you guys think about the reports that the Chinese are going to be unveiling a new strategic bomber that may have characteristics like the B-21 or the B-2 Spirit? Don't care. <laughs> I'm just curious. I mean, I know Drew, that yeah, ain't your thing, but I'm we don't just, care. I figured maybe you see a news story about it, or maybe you people talked about it, or uh, I know Drew. Yeah, don't care. Whatever China's weapons are that they can print and whatever, it's all untested. Eventually, how how do we know how well it works until you know they actually get into a war? <laughs> right now, it's all just. Well, you know, Drew is exactly blueprints. right. For the military technology in China to advance, they need a war. No, that, and, 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 right now they <laughs> yes, are advancing military that's exactly technology what you said, dude. But it's untested, so we don't know if it's good. They are still advancing it. It's just it's untested. Uh, and yes, if I, they I do just want right, they need to go and create that thing. They can same scientists could create civilian things to improve our lives rather than you know like planes to bomb I, people. I just, Why do we need more planes to bomb people? Uh, I just I just want to have a quick answer <laughs> since it was also a, uh, asked quest, a question to me. The reality is we already cannot win China militarily. So it doesn't matter what kind of shit they develop. We don't we can't win the war. So so that's why you know we don't care. Uh okay, I got a point to upgrade. Yeah, I, I think I, I give a little bit of credit to Drew because the the technology which are created, they always say is from the military, but it always comes from the first idea for good for the humanity, like uh, 
uh, nuclear bomb, right? This is the best example. Nobody wanted to build a bomb out of it. They wanted to use the energy to improve the life of everybody, right? But then somebody came and said, let's build the bomb out of it because we have the enemy there and we need to kill him. So yes. the military is always taking the ideas from the from which were created or are being created for, for normal people who just want to improve lives of everybody and then use it to actually make some weapons out of it. And yes, then they, they pay the money them. for it. Pardon? They pay the money for the research. Not always, not always, but most of the time it's true that they pay. Uh, but military is also uh, the state, so actually everybody's paying at the end. So all the people yes. uh, give uh, taxes. So it's not just the military. It's easy to say just the military, but the military is founded by the people. So it's actually something which built by the people, not by the military. The military just had the authority to push it so far until it gets done. That's that's the good point about the military because they are above uh, many laws. But so they invest in technology that I, will work, and not universities in, uh, investigate technology that sometimes they still don't know what is that for. Yeah, so that's exactly. the difference with militaries. They look for things that will work. Drew yeah, was exactly. saying about the solar panels. The solar panels were invented during the uh, space run. It was for the for, for the satellites. They invented the the space. They didn't they never thought about people. <laughs> it's alien technology, guys. Why nobody's talking about the alien technology? They found space shuttles uh, in 1932 in Italy. They got it in America. It's uh, out of this planet. So somebody got that technology, anti gravity stuff. So how many years ahead of us of this current army? Uh, technology that we have, how far ahead they are, we don't know because they have the technology and it's hidden from the public eye. Uh, we have the leaks, we can hear about it. It exists. It's not a taboo anymore. Finally speaking on BPA about aliens. But uh, yeah, it is It is something real and somebody has that technology and they're using it to reverse engineer it. And uh, we don't know how far they are ahead. I'm... I'm I've been I got to go here, but I wanted to respond to Drew's initial point, which was that Western, I know Westerners feel discouraged about the current situation, but I can only speak from the American perspective, but, and I think probably Vaughn would know what I'm talking about, but you know, I, I'm a millennial and when I grew up, the cold war was just ending. Right. And so <clears throat> we were the good guys, right. You know, remember that book, the end of history and all that stuff, like we'd solve the we'd stop the evil empire and now it was going to be this <laughs> Pax Americana and everything was going to be wonderful and if you look at like the uh the 90s the movies that I grew up on before Marvel became a thing you know the big uh the big blockbuster movies that everybody saw were like The Patriot and Braveheart and these like really um kind of libertarian freedom of the human spirit leave people alone you know fight the power type of messaging and America really cast itself as the underdog. I mean, at the tail end of the Cold War, one of our blockbusters was Red Dawn. Like, we're worthy underdogs against the Soviet Union, you know, like, like where we had no chance and there's some rednecks in the mountains shooting them with lever action, you know. Like, that was that was what we grew up on with that steady diet. I mean, and we were idolizing. And we lost him. Sorry. CIA got him. Oh, no. Oh, no. He <laughs> said too much. Vaughn, you must be careful. No, you'll be next. <laughs> oh, but it's interesting. He managed to mention something. I got him. Oh, he's back. He's back. But, but he knows his mic. Brandon, you're sound. muted. Brandon, you're muted. Can't oh, hear no, you. What, what happened to your sound? Oh, no. Oh, no. Can't hear you. I'm sorry. We lost it. We lost it. Oh, no. CIA I got you. He <laughs> mentioned something very interesting because wait wait this until, is interesting the, the FBI the or CIA the they shut him off is supporting what I said. Hmm. So, but he, he, uh, Brandon mentioned something very interesting until the, the Second World War until the Cold War, the Americans promised um, and all their uh, their proper, well their perspective of life. The American dream was about freedom for that you can do things that you're not uh, you're not blocked. You you have freedom 
to to go uh, to the woods, to build your own house, to have a really beautiful family, and so on. And after and after the Cold War, the Americans start to sell this idea that you are freedom for, from everything. You can do whatever you like. It's freedom from your family, freedom from your traditions. It's not anymore freedom for, it's freedom from. And um, this is actually where we are today in a kind of uh, uh, um, a, 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 a gap between are the way we have been, because the rest of the world doesn't understand that, between uh, because they haven't had yet freedom for, they still don't have freedom to eat, to have a meal on their table, they still don't have freedom to have, to be able to grow a family uh, and, and be offering their children a, f a better future. So, we're both, so when we are already in this dimension that we want freedom from, from traditions, from our sexuality, from our gender, uh, you see, uh, we are creating a gap where the rest of the world doesn't understand us and we don't understand what the rest of the world wants from us. Can you guys hear me again? Sorry, uh, somebody called me right yes, as I was can. making my point. Yeah. <laughs> um, ah, I thought I thought it's the CIA, you know, it's like, yeah, it was, you say too much. <laughs> uh, uh, we're calling you. Wait, so, somebody calls you and, and it gets cut off. I, I have to change my point entirely. It was going to be something else, but I have to change it now. Uh, <laughs> um, no, but I was pointing like, think about being a millennial male in America growing up in the 90s with all that messaging, which I could only describe looking back as at best really positive nationalistic propaganda about the goodness of America and our influence on the world, right? And then that culminates in 9-11, right? You have this attack on the country. Wow, this is our Pearl Harbor. We got to go fight, you know, this kind of nebulous force for evil in the world, and and people were mad, you know. We wanted blood, we wanted revenge, you know. And I was a freshman in high school when that started. I was, you know, fifteen, and and I was all ready to go to war. But by the time I graduated from high school, it was, you know, two thousand five, and people, my friends who graduated before me were coming back either in boxes or with missing legs and PTSD and all the stuff and. And then you had like Ron Paul on, on television explaining how this was all, you know, engineered. And it was, you know, I think Alex Jones at that point had released his 9-11, you know, conspiracy documentary, you know, and all that stuff. And so, like, you have to see, like, the, the cultural swing that happened because, you know, we went from seeing the U.S. government as like this force for good in the world to suddenly having this, and, and in good grief, fast forward to today. And like now it's like everybody's super cynical. And if, if there's a great book called The 11 American Nations, I don't know if you've ever read it, but it talks about how America is a subset of national identities. It's not really one nation. It's got all these subgroups. It's worth your time if you're interested in it. But, you know, I'm kind of a, an Appalachian origin person. And usually the majority of America's fighting forces come from Appalachian men rural Appalachian men who are patriotic, who believe in the mission of the country and who want to serve and protect. And there's just kind of a cultural thing. It's Scotch Irish descent, you know, warrior culture. And that demographic is so jaded and so frustrated and feels so put upon by the powers that be, that we feel like a third world minority at this point, you know? And I think it, there's a real, and that's why of course the FBI and the CIA who called me earlier, are concerned because they're like, oh, well, this libertarian, you know, rural, they just saw something the other day, rural white nationalism, all this stuff, like they see that as like a fifth column within the country of people who are dissatisfied. And that was their warrior class for the last 200 years. And so they're not signing up for the military. They can't meet their recruitment goals. And, and people, as you know, in America are buying body armor and rifles and joining militia groups and doing all this kind of stuff because that's their culture. And it's always going to be their culture and it's threatening to the powers that be. So like, you know, the America isn't, I mean, we're red dawn in mentality about stuff, but we're, our target isn't the Russians anymore. And, and they know that. And it's very uncomfortable for a lot of people to realize. And I don't, you know, I don't think that the, uh, the rest of the West appreciates that because they've, I mean, frankly been kind of um, domesticated a little more than maybe <laughs> we have been, but that's the cultural, situation here and i don't know like that ha that can be a wild card in all of this is there is a sense of real cultural breakdown and loss of identity and despair that 
it's not for us. It's not like, oh, wow, you know, man, I wish we were we want cheap iPhones. Like a lot of us just want to garden and shoot guns in our backyard and be left alone like that. That's generally our attitude. And it's an unhappy group of people. So I don't, I don't think foreigners really appreciate about 35 percent of America's population is pretty much checked out and mad. <laughs> I, I, I just realized Brendan is younger than me. <laughs> because I was like 18, 19 when uh, 9 11 happened. <clears throat> and he was 15. So it's like, oh, okay, I'm older. Uh, Sorry. But, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is quite interesting to, no, to, I... to, to what Brandon said, which is uh, that the hidden wars of uh, terror, how the Americans created um, a counter. Uh, so they had the Russians, for, uh, they had the Soviet Union or the communists for a long time as their main opposition, their raison d'etre, in terms of the leading uh, power in the world. Then they had a kind of very short period of completely union of all world, and that was boring for them. Especially in 94, <laughs> especially in 94 when the so-called Asian tigers um, were turned, uh, um, they were growing, it was Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Singapore, uh, Macau, Hong Kong, they were industrializing very fast. They were doing all those electronical stuff that need people that have a lot of patience to put those sticks. And they were already inventing their own uh, own stuff. And this made Americans a bit scared, well, the American elite. And they suddenly create a kind of a, a stock exchange crash. And then the USA started to think, perhaps we need another another opposition power in our uh, in our and they invented the war on terror. Terror on terror is something that was provoked and created. And what happened in that time is that the sense of uh, liberties were shocking. Uh, the, this idea of liberties from which I was talking about, um, from tradition, from family, from it was not yet there, but it's today from gender. These um, they start to shock against traditional values. And these, these, uh, we saw this in the 2000s, 2011s, how fundamentalists were ever actually being able to attract a lot of people around the world. And this is the most important thing to realize is that Russia understood the point and took it over. Now they see themselves as the champions of traditional values. And in doing that, they almost destroyed Islamic fundamentalism. because That's a really good that, point. That's a really good point. Yes. So it, it, it is amazing how uh, now the U.S. is completely lost. There is well, another more or less um, <clears throat> balanced power called Russia, which assumed the traditional family values for itself. And the U.S. has no response to it because their, their gay rights, gay gender, uh, liberties and so on is not attracting nobody around the world. The around that's... the world, when they think about democracy and look at the U.S., they see a completely dysfunctional state where people fight with each other, where parties are not willing to, uh, 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 to lose the power, like we saw when Trump won, when whatever they did, and when Trump lost, he also did the same and so on, and probably like, we are seeing the Democrats are so this is not the democracy that they anybody the, wants to buy, and yeah. So go on. I want to. I want to. I want to respond to you on that because that's such a good point. Because Russia has a demographic problem. They know that the Rus the Russian um, ethnicity is in the decline because of the birth rates, and the only growing birth rates in Russia are Muslim, and that's been true for that was true before the fall of the Berlin Wall. And they've known that for a long time. So Russia's had to pivot their messaging to be more inclusive to the Islamic members of the Russian Federation and cast the story as, you know, we're all kind of in this together fighting for kind of a more, um, you know, that's kind of what Dugan's messaging was in many ways. It's kind of this uh, Russian, Iranian, you know, I don't know what China's going to, what role they really play in that. They've got their own. <laughs> issues with religion, but but they generally are con more conservative society. And so you, I think you see that change. And then on top of that, you look at America, you say that America is all about that, but that's not true for for the core of, of the American voter. Everyone's mm -hmm. kind of standing around looking like, well, what, what happened? Where I got left behind. Like, this isn't the America that I remember. And it's like things have charged on ahead without their permission or their input. And, you know, every weekend where I live out in the country, 
it sounds like Baghdad. I mean, there is gunfire all the way around me. And guess what? Nobody dies because everyone it's this is a very heavily armed country and people generally get along really well. It's this pressure from this pressure to conform because the propaganda I was referring, like the Patriot and Braveheart and all these like libertarian pro individual freedom messages that they pumped us up on, they created a monster. They created a generation of people who have that as their highest value. And that's what their American identity is. And now they realize, oh, we want those people to come to heal and do what we say and live in the, the this kind of globalist world where we're, you know, where you're supposed to fall back in line. And that's why I don't I just feel like this has to come to a head at some point because they, they've created, you know, this culture. And, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. I mean, it was always there, but they exploited it as a part of our national identity. You know, no, I, I, I think what happened, I think what happened to create your current uh, issue is, is that the, the, the Americans uh, uh, are split into uh, basically sliced into two groups. Uh, the, all the Americans got basically some uh, level of like uh, too much, too much um, uh, economic success. So uh, a lot of them became soft, but as that as that so when you you get a whole bunch of soft people you get poor leaders and then you know they make bad decisions and then but because but but when the consequences came they sliced it in two the 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 political elite managed to keep their riches and they make the, all the other regular people suffer the consequences so all the regular people are having inflation problems and difficulty going to buy stuff while the rich are still living in their bubble and but and and so <laughs> the current leadership is born in within that elite they live their whole lives in that bubble they don't see that they still think that america is the greatest country on earth we, as long as we we sanction russia the whole thing will fall like a house of cards you know if we send in our military they'll they'll be crushed there's no question about it there isn't even that doubt in your mind that your, your you guys will be number one and are still number one because they've been living in that, that exclusivity bubble, whereas the rest of America has felt the consequences of the bad decisions and leadership and, and are now facing even more and more of it. That's why you guys are feeling the pain. But your, your political leadership is just starting to realize that, oh, shit, you know, it isn't as nice and we aren't as powerful as we thought we were. So it's, it's that, you know, but at the end of the day, like you, I agree with you, it has to come to a head. And... Hopefully it won't be violent. Hopefully you guys can, will be able to vote in some more realistic political leaders who realize where you are in and then try to uh, engage the population to basically go back to your roots of being an industrial power, of working hard. Like, like you guys have to start working like the Chinese. Like work, at, start from eight, end at eight, you know, and, 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 and work hard and... and Nobody wants to do that. I know. And that's the problem. I like the French that's model. The problem. <laughs> but yeah, that's the too. problem. You can't have the French things. model and still be a viable that. superpower. It just can't be done unless you assume you're somehow more superior than the Indians who are working those hours or the Chinese they are working those hours. You're not. We are all the same. <laughs> so without that, you, you guys just have to compete and in, in real competition. You have to teach your sons and daughters to write do real jobs, not TikTok, not, you know, OnlyFans, but actual industrial jobs. That, London, like the US and the and, Chinese and, Communist and, Party and, to lead them. Yeah? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> that will never happen. I, I am not going to work in the fan factory, but on, Drew, Drew, just to introduce the second thing, Drew, I think, oh, he left. Uh, I think Europe, for what he was describing, the Europeans are much worse than the living in a much yes. bigger uh, bubble than the, the Americans do. Right, how's the figure, Brad? No, uh, um, just on what Brandon talked about, you no, know, actually, this actually happened to Singapore as well. Um, but in a different way. So, because Singapore, though we are a very small country, so there is this very strong urge to build a country because we were never a country singapore was never supposed to be a country so there's a lot of nationalism you know uh, edu national education uh, national songs and everything so they it built a generation or even you know a few decades of nationalism 
or nationalistic values into our country, similar to the patriotism in the United States. And then what happened as a result is that when Singapore, uh, the government started to want to import foreigners to 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 mix to to bringing on the China Chinese in to to keep that ratio between the Chinese Malay Indian or you know, the population ratio, it backfired because um, Singaporean Chinese uh, find the Chinese China, China Chinese they're not part of us. Like they 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 don't they don't merge with us. They don't want to uh, join and become Singaporean. They still stay as China Chinese. They cluster together. They don't mix with us, and it backfires very badly. And as a result, the elections actually reflected that result, and the government actually backtracked. So the so the what happened is a bit similar. It's like the the this nationalism or nation building actually you know create some kind of resistance where the People become really proud of uh, our grouping, and we don't allow you no know, uh, weird changes to this uh, status quo. You no, know? something like this. Yeah, it, it, I think in Singapore it's still not easy. Like we we are more acceptant of um, for we are still acceptant of foreigners, but it's just that you no, know, we have very high standard for what we expect uh, the foreigners to be you no know, added to our country, and yeah, it's that kind of thing. Like so. Like because during those days where we we, we realized something is wrong is that Singapore was importing a lot of the China Chinese that is not, not very highly educated. They are not high value in terms of financial or they are just here to do those odd jobs and low level jobs. And and somehow we are giving them permanent residence and it triggered a lot of Singaporeans. So this is a part of the nationalism. And I I, I can feel the kind of similarity to to the to the experience you know the Americans have. When you know suddenly this, the the, the mainstream media suddenly suddenly trying to push something else, we even have one 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 of our national days, you know, celebrating us to be a global city or whatnot. Then every every Singaporean is like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> you no, know, like national day, so, so supposed to celebrate you no know, Singapore as a country. They suddenly celebrate global city. Then they talk about you know, all the. Then they trying to like show off all the foreign the you know, the new citizens that is joining the country and. Everybody's sort of like, what the hell is this? And it backfired well, that, very badly. Well, that shows kind of there's an interesting carryover, and this takes time, but how philosophy, and I've always not really understood the connection between philosophers and thinkers and the society at large, because you can see that ideas start, it seems to do seem to start at the top. They have to work with certain, certain substructures and and uh, raw materials in the society that as they exist, you know, there are subcultures that already exist, but then they want to steer the society in a certain direction to be, you know, make S Singapore more globalist in its orientation or whatever it might be. <clears throat> so each place has to have a, a different approach to doing that and achieving that in America. I just don't, I, I, I don't, I can't speak for Singapore, obviously, but, and I can't speak for France or any of the other countries that you come from. I feel like Canada's long gone. They're done, but <laughs> Um, but yeah, they'll, they'll do whatever they're told up there. But what, um, you know, in the case, it seems like France has a bit of a backbone and a bit of a cultural identity. And at least as far as I can tell, and, and the United States has multiple cultural identities and many of them are not easily being brought to heel. So I don't know where the powers that be move from here, but it seems like it's toward a more authoritarian approach to just control. I mean, that's a large par portion of what the TikTok thing is about. You know, it's like we've got to put this genie back in the bottle because the internet has allowed people to discuss these ideas and gain a perspective that doesn't allow for the steering of society and mobilization of society for war or for major projects, you know, whatever it might be. Because for every American that was flying the Ukrainian flag, um, when the Ukraine war started, there was a whole bunch of them that were saying, screw it. We don't ha want to have anything to do with that. And it's and it's almost at this point become reflexive. Like if the media says we need to do this, half the country says we aren't going to do it just because you told me. And that's a big problem, you know, because there may actually be a situation where we really do need to get behind something. I mean, COVID was a perfect example of that. It's like, OK, I think I'm going to trust them. I think I'm OK. I think this is a real this is the real deal. And we've got to get behind this because we're all going to need to survive together. And then, oh, wait, they were lying about that, too. So like now nobody believes anything 
And America is a tinderbox in that sense. You can't be, we, you can't tell us what to do. And it's getting to the point where, yeah, conspiracy theories are running rampant because nobody believes anything. And that's why I watch you every morning when I get up while I'm brushing my teeth and making my breakfast because I want to know what's going on because I feel like you are one of the last, you know, there's five or six of you guys online who are trying to present the facts as they are, not at, in a narrative form um, to steer the political opinion a certain way. And so I really appreciate that about you. And uh, so thanks for all you're doing, Wyatt. And uh, glad you're in that time zone so I can watch you during my breakfast every morning. So, <laughs> I will, I will, so I'm I will try to do here. more. I will def definitely try to do more, you know, regarding news and geopolitics because the Ukraine war is Ukraine war, you know. But, you know, I think the the bigger, you know, the macro situation, I think, is getting more and more important. Ukraine yeah, war is a foregone conclusion. Yeah. So upgrade, upgrade. Yeah. yeah. Um, to add on what uh, you all said, I think um, maybe we should step one uh, step back and also see it from a different perspective. I mean, Brandon, you're from the US. You, uh, the US has great values. They fought uh, with us uh, against the Nazis, you know. Um, you, you, you have a, a country which is pretty pretty good who did good things in the world also horrible things obviously but also a lot of good things and uh, as far I as think, as far uh, as empires go we've been pretty benign i mean really i mean you've been one of the greatest empire in the world history so but, uh, but like not, not, to interrupt you, not to interrupt yeah. you i want you to finish your point but like think of the countries that we currently colonize it's germany korea japan they're prospering countries right we have military bases all over them but you know, we gave them their sovereignty back, sort of. You know, you like there's colonize, you colonize whole of Europe, not <laughs> yeah. only Germany. <laughs> you're wel you're welcome. You're welcome. <sighs> I intervene yeah. for a second. Sorry, go ahead, upgrade. I'm sorry. Hey, go ahead, upgrade. Hold on, hold on, hold on a second. It's a problem. Um, you know the guys who liberated Kosovo? Well, Kosovo lays on sixty percent of the world coal deposits. So the guys who are ambassadors. Right now, they have uh, businesses in Kosovo and they become multi-billionaires over there, just so you know how it works. So uh, divide and co conquer and then exploit. That's how American policy works, just to be clear. You know, don't make an angel. But it is as everybody else before. Divide and conquer, exploit. That's it. Okay. <laughs> I'm great. Continue. I'm great. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I, I, actually, they are doing I everything in Kosovo in order to stop the cold mines to operate. <laughs> Sorry, go on, upgrade. Right. No worries. No worries. No, I, I just think we uh, people are a little bit like uh, our days, like all negative about each country they live in. Um, we should also be grateful to live in these countries where we actually live. Most of uh, our countries where we live here are good countries where we don't have famine, where we at least have some rights, basic rights, and we can. Uh, protest we can like in america you can bear arms right uh, you can vote uh, even if there are, some people say it's not legitimate or legitimate it doesn't matter at least you can do something about it right there's some other places where you just get imposed things from the top and you shut the fuck up or you die or you go to the concentration camps so i mean to 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 make a picture around the world that everything is bad in my country and everything is good abroad. I mean, I've been in, living in lots of different countries uh, and uh, uh, because of my work, I also um, have different ties to different people around the world. And most of the time they're, they're envious our countries, you know, they, they envious our freedom uh, and, and other aspects of our lives, which are totally normal for us and we, we, we always bitch about, uh, oh, we don't get this or don't get that. But for other people around the world, that's they never get that in their entire life. You know, maybe yeah. some three, four, five generations, they never had this freedom. They never had the opportunities which we have. And what are you talking about, man? What freedom are you talking about, man? Hold on a second. If if my government well, doesn't always do in like what, a what is small man, talking like without no sense, man. You're always coming around and there doing is no some freedom, bullshit, man. You're talking nonsense. There is no freedom. Man. 
Okay. 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 You're from Macedonia, Bye. man. You've been in your country. Thanks, been, guys. Been in I'm gonna go work on my house a little bit. Thanks for yeah, there is no freedom. Sorry, bro. Bro. Yeah, yeah, man. Man. If my government doesn't listen to what is told, there will gonna be war within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying but, to tell. But then, if we don't listen but, to but the they upgrade. Hours, we're gonna have a war in 24 hours. You're talking about yeah, freedom? But, There's no freedom, man. That's blackmail. Upgrade is not your we country. Do do upgrade is your partner, man. He's not even part of the EU. Yeah. Upgrade is not even part of the EU. No, they are Switzerland. No, it's, yeah, it's a different country. No, the first country. Country. But it's the, upgrade is very correct. The thing is that how do we tell the others around the world that the way of life that we have <laughs> is nice and they should follow our way of life? This is the difference. What what uh, Goss is explaining is not very wrong. It is true that a lot of the European Union guys, uh, these these people in the diplomatic circuits of the European Union of the United States go to a country and they say, you have to do this and this and this. You have to have these laws and these laws. They don't explain, hey, guys, look at us. We have this life. This is not so bad. Why should you give gay, gay people uh, this uh, rights and so on? It is good for us. Perhaps it could be good for you too. No, they say you have to do this way and this way. And, and Goss is very, very correct about this. And we had this news today, or yesterday, that the Niger is going to expel the, um, the U.S. military from the country. It's very interesting to listen to the communique. They say that the U.S. made several diplomatic mistakes. They just arrived to the country. They didn't say they were arriving. They were like, they were like traveling around the country without no authorization, making conversations with people that don't belong to the government. And on the end, they, they said, well, we don't have to talk with these people. They are so arrogant. They are telling us we shouldn't work with Russia and with the Iran. Well, we are we are an independent country. We work wherever we want. But why, did, why are they reacting this way? Because the other ones were stupid. The French made an ultimatum to the to the coup. The, the Americans arrive and say you can't work with these of them. It would be much easier and fair if I just go to them and tell you, look, this is why I believe it would be good for you. Please let, give it a, a chance. And that would be nice. Yeah, let's change the topic. Let's talk about my... Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Let's upgrade, finish this point, and let's go to Ukraine. It's a good yeah, one. Yeah. Just real quick, I, I, uh, there's a uh, breaking news apparently, but Super just to, to yeah, just to to summarize what Prata said, it's totally uh, uh, correct what he's saying, and I understand you, uh, Goche, that you don't feel represented, maybe, or you think that it's useless that you even go vote. But you've been living. You you told us all that you've been living in in uh, a Soviet Union, right? So you can make the comparison between, right? You can make the comparison between that people which lived under the Iron Curtain run even to the gunpoint to fucking oh, go to God. the other side, you know, to have freedom and have another way of life. The, uh, my oh, wife God. is also from the. She's born in the Soviet Union, you know. I know how it is. It's big difference. There is Positive things which which happens right, but there are also a lot of negative things. I can tell you when I hear I that the my curtain. wife, pardon, I wasn't behind the curtain. Yugoslavia was 50 50 in sphere of influence, 50 50. Okay. Bulgaria was 90 90 10. Greece was uh 90 percent America, 10 percent Russia. Bulgaria was opposite. Yugoslavia was 50 okay. 50 in the sphere of influence. So I wasn't behind the okay. iron curtain. We were in the yeah, okay, but called, you still, the independent you still have nations. The Oh, yeah, still have the definitely, for sure. Yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. And you always bitch about that all, all the countries around the world get communist and the United yeah. States gets communist system and so on. So you know how it is. That's what I mean, right? And if you compare it, it this to what no you freedom. had before than what you had now, there is definitely some things who got maybe yeah. worse, but now, now it's worse. Maybe better. Yeah. Now, now it's, it's worse, worse than before. Yeah, you know why? Before in communism, I existed as a socialist republic of Macedonia, and I was Macedonian in it. Right now, I do not exist as Macedonian. There is no Macedonia. There is just citizens of Macedonia who speak the language of the North Macedonia. You understand me? They erased me. What you call freedom, I call euthanasia. They cut my balls off. They erased my identity. They erased the oldest nation in Europe, man, Macedonia. You understand me? There is a uh, bias. There is two types of nation. There is politically creation created nations, which are around 19th century, and right. there is naturally 
created so, nation. The naturally yeah, created yeah. nation, they have their own language with it anonymous. <laughs> they, they they come from there. Yeah, yeah. The, so, the toponymy is, the is from the there. Go, uh, go, go. The language is from so there. The you understand point, me? The modern nation said, created for uh, Prata, one second. The modern nations yeah. which are created for political reasons, they ha they gotta follow certain narrative. In this case, the Western narrative. If, not, if you do not follow the narrative or if you don't do what you told, there are going to be war within 24 hours on your doorsteps. <coughs> so that's what freedom. So I don't think okay, so. Okay, we get it. So you, you, you do what you're told. You're a vessel of the United States. I get it. Exactly. You exactly. keep going over with all the fucking time. Your you Majesty, know, yes, your greatness. It's bullshit. They stole <laughs> everything from you because we're fucking it's assholes. It. The thing about no, okay, not you, is, not you, man. you're not even off. in charge in the United States. I mean, the government yeah. in the United States. I know, States dude. Doesn't my government fucks balls, dude. I, you ain't got. You ain't telling me nothing. I don't know. I mean, it's like when I first met Voss. He's like, I hate America's no better, government. You're in, and it's no like, yeah, dude, so than I, man. Join the club. Okay, so let's move on. Transnistria. Transnistria. This is very interesting. There is a single airstrip in that in that uh, little country. It's very interesting. They uh, uh, bombarded uh, an airplane and a helicopter, and yeah, this is very interesting. Uh, it was a big explosion, so the, an helicopter and airplane was were destroyed. It looks like, and it's very interesting because it's a single airstrip. So imagine that the Russians are trying to bring pers military personnel. <laughs> You would, There's no way would to get there. That yeah. but, but you know, uh, Prata, why uh, Transnistria it's, it's, can be very important. Know. They have a, a very, very, very big Russian ammunition stock. Very big. I think Second World War area, after Second World War, between that, an old stock, but they can still use it. That's why uh, Ukraine is... It was waiting to happening actually that they're going to start like that. I don't I don't think that I don't think that airfield is in very good condition either. I don't even know oh, if it's no. capable of taking it hasn't been used. you know it aircraft. Hasn't been used. They might take helicopters. But the thing is is it's where it's located at. I mean you'd be I mean you got to run the SAM gauntlet to even get close to that place. I mean you'd have to cross oh, between Odessa and Mykolaiv to even get to there. Or or cross over Romanian air. I mean, you know what I'm saying. I mean, it's got to be something else then, because the Russians wouldn't be trying to force. I mean, fuck if they're going to send resupply to Transnistria, they might as well fucking go for Odessa too. Because I mean, that's I mean, there's there's so much Sam shit there. I mean, there's I I just can't see them trying to drop a supply ship or plane in there or something. You know what? That's that's I think they why. won't even try. I mean, think about it. They, they need to show the world Ukraine has a That the, uh, Can you repeat, Shadovi? The, the Russia needs to show Ukrainian as aggressors, as the guy who attack another country. So for us, it's a very good propaganda. Mm -hmm. They need Rush, uh, Ukrainian to occupy Transnistria. And if it was possibly possible to make some <laughs> civilian uh, slaughtering or something like that. Um, about the depot way, of it's, arms, it's... I just wanted to add something about the depot of arms, and then you can go. Out. It's okay. that it is mined. If the they so if someone tries to get it, will provoke an explosion <laughs> similar to earthquake of five uh, in the scale of uh, yeah. That's so big. So, so, yeah. So uh, I, I don't understand. Transnistria is not even recognized by most international countries as a country. So what they're gonna say? You know? They're gonna say they're gonna attack some country who don't even exist. It's part of Moldova, actually. So they there's a lot of yeah, excuses to so use. Say Russians, and that makes it okay. Yeah. yeah, it's just it's just an excuse. Uh, uh, you you can just use any excuse because it's not even recognized. First of all, it's. Like they can say it's part of Moldova, you know. There's Russian uh, people there who threaten our land. There's so many excuses to actually hit this target. I'm actually war uh, very surprised that they just started to attack it right now and not did it long time before, because it's a big problem. They could just uh, separate it into. They before. They already attacked uh, yeah, before. Yeah, but it's more shit, the first yeah? time. It's also mm. drone attacks. Um, so, mm. and they even have infiltrators the previous time. So it's not yeah. the first time. But <laughs> the, the, the thing is that Ukraine have uh, actually offered 
Moldova previously you know to solve their Transnistria problem before. Moldova say no, no, don't don't come in. And they Moldova also do emphasize that Transnistria is part of Moldova. So it, any attack is actually attacking Moldova. So it's a so it, it's a very weird kind of situation, uh, which is actually beneficial to Moldova actually because like you no, know, like it, it keeps them you know like safe from the this conflict, you no know, from this Ukraine conflict in a way. Uh, this is which is a very weird thing because Chinese is just supposed to be like a threat, but it's not. So it's like it keeps them like in this limbo state where they can like get away from the Ukraine war. Uh, but there's no way Russia can reinforce you, Transnistria. So the airspace, there's no there's no airspace to enter there. So I I, I don't think so. If if Ukraine really dare to attack into Transnistria, like for real, conquer it. Yeah, I do not know how the European side is going to like explain it away. <laughs> like it's it's going to be so difficult. But it depends if they give it back to Moldova, right? If they they take it and they give it back to Moldova, they will be like uh, taking this part away because it's there are a lot of Russians and Russian military there, so you can use this as an excuse to invade, give but, it back to the Moldovans. But, but imagine if they go in and take the ammo, come out, then they'll be stealing from Moldova, you know? So like, could be, could be. <laughs> well, but the thing is that Moldova, if Moldova does that and gives the authorization for Ukraine, because there has been talking talks about that, and gives you uh, um, authorization to Ukraine to solve <laughs> the problem, then uh, it is like Moldova attack the priest, uh, the Russian peacemakers. It's one thousand uh, militaries there, attack, and then Russia has the right of response. Well, the 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 um, famous Article 55 uh, of the Charter. Um, UN. <coughs> and in that case, 52, sorry. And in that case, Russia could attack Moldova. But the thing is that, like you guys said, in the Ukraine would lose all support around the world uh, in the United Nations. It would be much, much more difficult for uh, for Ukraine to uh, make it to Moldova. About the ammo supply uh, depot in uh, Moldova, I would like to to tell you about uh, a story of World War II. Uh, when the German army were coming back, uh, were were attacking near Baku to take the petrol, the oil field near Baku, very important stuff. Stalin called directly the governor of the area of Baku and gave him a very specific <laughs> order: if you leave. The Baku field uh, not destroyed uh, to the German. I'm going to give the order to your number two to kill you with one bullet in your head. And then he asked his number two on the phone too. And he gave him specifically this order. Basically, the number two, his new job was to make sure that the number one is going to blow up the whole field before the German arrive. It was the only job. Okay, and I think for the ammo supply dump, it's going to be the same thing. They have very strict order directly from the highest level to blow up the things if Ukrainian try something stupid. Yes, it will create an earthquake in the uh, in, in a five degree uh, uh, in the five uh, in the scale of Richard. So it will Ooh, be yes. something really really strong. And also, let's not forget there is a thing. Uh, it's 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 a half an hour from Tiraspol to uh, to uh, the capital Kishinev, and I think there is enough people in uh, in Transnistria militaries to really make a lot of problems inside of Moldova. It's like okay, the planes arrive, but what if uh, these people just go through uh, to Moldova and take over and take over Kishinev? They can. Because the, the Ukrainian, uh, the Moldovan army is, is shit. If nothing, they won't be fighting for a stupid woman like that Maya Sandu, which has been, which has, which made life of that citizens unstandable. They are some of the most poorest people in, in Europe, and they live in extreme poor conditions. And so I'm not seeing the army fighting for that bit. No time. And secondly, I can expect, actually, If they start attacking, if Ukrainians start attacking Transnistria, they won't fight Ukrainians. They will just come over, over Kishinev. Oh, there will be very, very potential. Uh, there's a big potential for that. 
I want Sorry, to add something off. about Moldova that a lot of people don't understand. There is a parliament election at the end of the year in uh, in the fall. And during this election, if you read the polls, the opposition party, basically the provision party, is going to win. So basically, the time uh, left to the pro-Europe uh, power <coughs> say, is limited. Okay, so they have to act this summer, or they can do nothing in Moldavia, Moldova. Mm -hmm. So, even if what you say is true, basically, the opposition could take power by some kind of coup, and they would have the support of the whole population. Oh, a big part of the population, yes. Not the whole, but the big part yes, of the not population. The whole. Something the like 60, 60 vs. Uh, 40. You can expect the north, the, the second biggest city, to completely uh, start to dismiss the, the government in Kishinev. You can expect uh, Gagauzi to also dismiss oh, the yes. government. So it's like uh, it's like uh, the, 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 the government <coughs> is feeling as a support in the center of the country. And like I said, it's half an hour from Tiraspol. They, in the, they, it's like in, in two hours they surround the city. There's little they can do. So, like you said, if if the the opposition party uh, allies with, let's say, the 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 military of of Transnistria and the Russian soldiers, I think they would have a big chance of uh, making a coup in Moldova. Uh, Cause in a country succeed only with the Western support. They don't succeed if it's like bottom up, uh, you know, the the people rising up. So it, it, I'm really surprised that still so many people talk about uh, like uh, how people of a country feel. Is there any case <coughs> that the feelings of our peoples are co considered? Are they considered by presidents? I mean, any place? Uh, they are considered. Are they, your feelings considered by Macron? No, no, they... no. What I want to say, the no, feelings no, no. of the people are matter. considered. Listen no, no, to no, me, no, please. No, you you, you please. said it. I understand it. Now I'm talking. So no president, no government considers feelings of their own people. So stop talking about feelings of the people. It's funny. I mean, it took a whole world to stop <laughs> Israel, and they were losing, right? The whole world was uh, demonstrate. I mean, a lot of demonstration against Israel, and also Israel was losing. If it wasn't, it was successful. It wouldn't stop. But it doesn't happen. It doesn't affect anything. But people feel. There's a lot of marketing by by the government for the people. To let to let them know how to, they should feel, and also there's police to teach them if they feel something wrong. So it's funny that still people talk about you know feelings of the people. It's government. What governments will do? I, I could not say, no. What army will do? No. Okay. There's NATO or uh, military already in Moldova. That's for sure. Before <coughs> they become members of the NATO. They already prepare everything. Everything is prepared for just signing the document. That's it. There's no change when someone enters the NATO and after. Because it's just a signature. Everything is already prepared. The military is in there. Uh, all the, 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 it's just legally becomes legally. That's how it goes. So legally, it, to me, it's, it's on the funny. constitution of Moldova. Moldova can't join any military alliance. It's on their constitution. It's always easy to change constitution by the two thirds, right? <laughs> but they don't of have it. So. They don't Shadow. have it. Shadowy. Yes, I wanted to add something about the feeling of the population. You are right. The government <laughs> most of the case don't care. But sometimes there is people outside your own border who cares about that because they want to use the feeling of the population to their own interest. And they are going yeah. to feed this feeling and to create some riot or protest in your country using these feelings. That's why sometimes it's important. That's why that that could happen with the Russian. The Russian could feed the, you know, the anti-Europe feeling in Moldova. 
It's like it's like it's like with the Ukrainian funding in the U.S. Senate. The feelings of the people are making them hesitant to send the money. Yeah, they don't care what we think. They were happy to send billions of dollars of weapons and shit. But now it's getting to be election year, and yeah, it's disingenuous. And they see the writing on the wall. Ukraine's losing. People are like, you know, why is this homeless man walking around in a blanket in 20 degree weather? And I'm hearing about we got to send another hundred billion dollars to Ukraine or fill in the blank country. I mean, that does matter. It's it, it, it may only matter at certain times. But and that's what we were talking about earlier. It was just like, you know, we sit around. It's not an echo chamber here. We sit around. We're, we're regular guys. You know, we're just talking about how fucked up it is. And, you know, why is it like that? You know, it's not like we're sitting here going, oh, I wish they'd listen to me. We know they don't listen to us. Only when it counts, only when it's something they get out of it, then they listen to us. Like right now, they they know we don't like the funding and the war. So now they're like, oh, well, you know, uh, maybe we should loan them the money instead of giving is it that's to why them. Johnson, wait till is the that's next why election. Johnson is not bringing that, is that's why I mean, Johnson bringing that bill, is that the reason why Johnson is not bringing it? What's, what he says, the reason that he is not bringing up the bill to the floor? Was what he said? Did he say oh, I care about uh, my voters? But that's a huge no problem it, for America. It's just a political negotiation to get funding for the border. That's all. You, I, if they get funding for the border, yeah, they will get funding for Ukraine. The that's it. They don't care the about border. your feelings, even for votes. He wants the money for the border because the voters that's want it. the border closed. He can't get reelected. I said it's disingenuous, but he's still responding to what the people want, even if he doesn't mean it. Yeah. If he wants to be in power, he has to do what we want, even if he doesn't want to. He has to fake it if he wants to make it. Yeah, I, I agree with Vaughn because in, in in this speech where Biden uh, was talking to to the to the chamber, you saw when they talked about Ukraine that he was nodding, that he actually wants to send money, but he is also in a kind of a pickle because he, ha he has to represent a certain uh, uh, population. Uh, um, and the, the, the Republicans don't want to send more money until there, there is many things take care of in the, our own country. And that's everywhere in the world right now. You see when there's bad times, when it's good times, there will be no problem to send the money. Nobody will give a shit because there will be good times. But when there's bad economical times, most of the time you look inwards and then you see all the problems and you start to uh, to to say to yourself, oh, why I need like Vaughn said, why I need to send 63 billions to the to the Ukrainians if we have homeless people, <laughs> veterans who are no jobs or don't get take care of uh, healthcare, who is um, a problem, right? And and so on and so forth. So that's I think that's a global thing. That's not something special to the United States. And uh, to, to Moldova, the, there is a rapprochement with Moldovan elites and also the government to uh, a European Union. And uh, that's also not representative totally for the people. This is split a little bit, maybe a little bit more pro-Russian or a little bit more pro-European, but it, it's pretty split, right? So that's why there's also an issue there. And like Prata said, they, they can't do anything because the constitution said so, but it can be changed. Uh, I give I give Jordan a point for that. Uh, Nunia, go. Yeah, just to, just to follow up on uh, Euros and, and Vaughn's points, I agree with both of them. I think, uh, Euro, you're absolutely right. I think the majority of these globalist elites uh, couldn't care less about what the majority of people in their respective countries care about. And I think that... Uh, that just goes to show in some of the hubris and the decisions that they've, you know, rolled out. Like this whole woke nonsense uh, has been a dismal failure for them. But they were so arrogant to think that, okay, the populace is just going to go along with it. Uh, now, Devon's <laughs> point, I see the, the, the paradigm shifting really quickly. Like we look at what happened in Michigan with the uncommitted voters. We look at what's going on in Minnesota. We look at what happened with George Galloway, you know, coming in and winning that election in the UK. Uh, I think a lot of people in Western civilized, like Western countries, we're all ready to toss our governments out. Uh, 
Now, I'm going to pose this question to you guys. The question is, what do we then do with it? And maybe this is just the optimist in me, but are we starting to see a movement whereby the people take back some control the way, you know, our, our democracies were designed? Or is it just going to be, we'll wipe out, you know, the Trudeaus and the Macrons of the world and they'll just be replaced with another dipshit? Uh, so I'll pose that to everybody because I don't know the answer. Uh, I'm, I'm hopeful it's the former and not the latter. But I think we've got an opportunity in front of us right now to kind of take control back. Um, but we have to do it uh, as a unified force in our in our let's, respective countries. Let's make a round one very quick. So don't worry, guys, don't waste too much time. Come on, I, I, I'm getting so cramps in my fingers, Shadowy. Come on, dude. Come on, come on. Dude. Who's I have, going? I have, I have, a, a, I have a fresh news. Putin wins the pre pre presidential elections in the Russia Federation with the result of 87% of the votes according to the exit poll data from video. Damn. 87%. Oh, poor I think that was only like 24% reporting. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, obviously he's going to win. So yeah, 87. But I mean, that kind of goes to Dan's point in the beginning, you know. 87 percent that gives very him close, very close mandate, results. that that gives him his mandate from the people to fight the wars he sees fit but yeah. who is they going have... to change their their government in the moment of war the russians would need to be suicidal it's obvious everybody is voting because <coughs> you want to fight in ukraine this but election I mean, just to see what's going to happen I mean, if he if, if he wins that big, that means the majority of Russians don't have a problem with what's been going on. Oh, I mean, no. they're they're do we have the they, participation? They, there may be doomers out there. You hear people write stuff, but obviously, the majority of the people are in touch or in tune with Putin's vision for Russia. So, you know, he's got like I said, he's got his mandate. If that if it holds eight over eighty percent, you know, whatever he decides to do, they're going to trust him. To be making the right decision and probably give him full confidence and support, unless he fucks up something on the battlefield. Well, you know, if something tr catastrophic happens, you know, then that's different. But I think right now that's just going to set the tone for the summer. You, you can see with with also the with also the financial situation of Russia didn't change doing because of all these sanctions and all that shit nothing's changed so they don't have a reason to put putin yeah. out so what i am seeing now that putin is again probably for a few years again president <laughs> he's going to crank some things up i was before i was asking i want to ask a question why is ukraine doing all that bullshit next to his borders are they are, are, are have they not do other things to do something like that they will like defend their people. borders that be attacked by the russians i don't know no they lost a lot of people in that stupidity <laughs> it is so sad just, just look at belgorod is uh, what they are doing there is fucking stupid it's, <clears throat> it's stupid i mean okay. i saw a couple of days ago it was like a thousand casualties so far and a you know, like half a, a dozen tanks and armored vehicles. So in three days, I mean, who knows what it ends up being at the end? In three days, one. It's crazy. It's yeah, crazy. and why are they doing it? Is because they heard the uh, Wyatt uh, idea. They heard Wyatt saying, uh, uh, "Do yeah, you yeah, think it's because of Wyatt?" To, of it was undefended area, uh, but that was right at the time. But uh, now it's not undefended. <laughs> so. Because yeah. the wish and sent to where yet to. Yes. Did you all talk already about the, the the three helicopters that been struck by the Russians? But the two two helicopters. That's not important about uh... three. Yeah, Pata. I mean that was just a lucky that was a lucky strike. And I mean you think about it, it, it just hurts the extremely limited air assets the Ukrainians have. Yeah, but it says a lot about your observation with the drones of the Russians. And other stuff. Yeah. Well, that's they, one they thing. Say, if you notice some of these first strikes with the lancets way in the deep or these, you know, precision munitions, 
there's no air defense shooting these fucking observation drones that are sitting there filming. I mean, you can't tell me they ain't got no air defense around an airfield that's got a MiG-29 and there's a fucking drone flying there watching the Lancet flying and blow that thing up and nobody ever shot at it. But, I mean, you didn't even they, see a guy with an AK shooting at it. But they took but their fucking air defense and put it on the around. front. There's a problem what's happening. What the fuck are they doing with the Patriot system just next to the front line? Because they're getting, they're getting they're trying, with they're trying to cut the fabs down. They're getting yeah, hammered by the fabs. Exactly. They're trying to push them back. Exactly, they're because they have huge dead. casualties. They need to they need to do something. They cannot just leave the fucking soldiers to die by uh, fabs. You have no response to it. So you need to push your air defense more near the front line yeah, and try but, to shoot but, down. But the Patriot is not a mobile air defense system. Yeah, yeah. It's, they, not, they, it's not a movable, they, easy they're movable doing whatever air they can system. to push those fullbacks back. They're just trying to keep them away from the front and and re, and reduce the amount of sorties they can fly. Because I mean, you, I, I'm sure everybody that follows it knows. I mean, go check all the open source. The the common theme is is they're getting the shit pounded at them by these fabs every fucking day. Literally, wherever the Ukrainians assemble, they get fabbed. Reinforcements, assembly areas, supply points. I mean, it sounds fucking brutal. And just think, every time they knock out another air defense system, that probably just means X amount of more sorties yeah. a day. And it, it, I mean, that's why they're so desperate, and they're putting those naysams up front and those patriots because, like. Like Upgrade said, they've got to give these guys a fucking yeah, breather. NATO, mm -hmm. NATO They're all said. talking about the, the second defensive line being built behind all these guys around Berdici and everything else. Those guys are getting the shit pounded at them as soon as they start trying to dig in. I yeah. mean, that's why they're doing it. They they don't have a choice. And the, yeah. the thing is also, but NATO said, asked Ukraine to not use these uh, Patriot systems anymore so close. Fucking expensive, also. Well, then maybe, they do? Maybe, you know, maybe NATO could send dudes to sit in the trenches then, so exactly. the Ukrainian guys can win. Yeah, but the I thing, mean, the, exactly. The, the, the I'm thing just is, saying, it was already a situation. In my point of view, it was already a, a big miracle that Ukraine got Patriot system because they are fucking expensive and they are they don't have a lot in the NATO of them. Um, yeah, but like you say, they don't have air defense systems anymore. Yeah, they've been pounded, but that is how the war is for the moment and, and that situation. Um, these patriots, okay, once you are spotted and you're moving them, you're fucked because you're, they are not active. They are not, they, they can be activated in a fast manner to, 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 to be used as an air defense this, this system because you're driving with it. It's not, yeah, it's, not, it's, not, not it's not just the problem of this. It's I think it's also the it's, problem it's, that there is. Just give me a second part, I'll give you the word after, just really quick. Uh, this is not just the problem of getting destroyed Patriot. I think also there is a problem of uh, ammunition. So they, they, they actually yeah. drive them around. Yeah, they drive them around to actually uh, figure out uh, uh, where, which way they can't uh, get hit, right? So, yeah. and, and like Vaughn said, man, if, if why they put them at the front? Because they're trying to save, you know, their Ukrainian... Uh, military guys, you know, the soldiers, if you hear every day that you're getting pounded by fab after fab after fab, please help us, please help us. After a while, you just do it. It's normal. You're human. You want to yeah. save your, your troops. You want to save their life. And you want yeah, to make it. Of course. It of course. Yeah. I, understand, I understand it no. completely. But the thing is, this what the Russians are doing now is instead to use artillery, they're using these fabs. Because they can, they can launch it for big distance. The only thing is, if you just, you just, you just need. How, how long is the front line of Ukraine? One thousand two hundred kilometers, two thousand kilometers, something like that. One thousand two hundred. How much? One thousand two hundred kilometers. Yeah. So, are, are you really thinking you can protect the whole line with air defense that they still maybe have? Uh, but Masam, it's not the whole line. It's just parts of the line because the Ukrainians have been full, foolish. They should have protected those lines earlier. They should have guessed that Adivka was going to fall, and they did, they had no lines bef before uh, Adivka, and they have been they have been doing all these types. And it's falling actually in. Uh, it's even worse. It's falling where is Adivka, and it's falling where it is Barmut. Yeah. They haven't been doing their homework because they are foolish and they think they were going to win. They are so desperate in their own ideology that now they are desperate in their own failures. 
and this I is mean, dude, you remember during the winter time when they were showing videos of those guys trying to dig fucking trenches with shovels and frozen ground and and maybe a random farmer's backhoe that they were able to scrounge up in the nearest village, you know, I mean, like Prada said, they they fucking procrastinated and fucked off way too long. And it's, they're you, fucking paying the price now. You, I mean, uh, I'm serious. I mean, the fab story, the, the, the whole line of the fabs, I mean, I don't think people can really even imagine or appreciate what those things are doing. And I've even, like I said earlier, there was a picture of a, uh, one of those, uh, 500 pound cluster munitions. And, uh, it was equipped with a fucking wing and a GPS system. So they put those on the cluster munitions now too. Yeah. So, I mean, but uh, about the second line, you want another story? There is a rumor that the government, the Korean government, paid a private company to build the second line of and defense. It didn't work. Because of at this point, it real. was a, it's normal. a not it's a combat waste. situation. Yeah, but and that was very strangely, the money disappeared and the oh, work hey. was not done. Just real quick on, on your point, Shadowy, I was talking to Thomas, and he's got, you know, family through marriage that's in Ukraine and he's we were talking about this maybe a week or two ago and then he said that specifically there were stories about all this money that was paid to private contractors to dig these fortifications and there was like nothing done and they didn't know was it because they were paid and they skipped out and didn't do the job or were they never paid so they didn't do the job so yeah I mean it's just a, it's just a folly of errors you know like it was probably a combination of stuff you know, obviously, but yeah, they but, they really, really, really dropped the ball. They but, were not considering. There is the RRK. How can how did the officers didn't go look for what they were being doing? How can okay they okay they give these contracts, but they should have been done. There should and have I been. I think it was about there. a half a billion dollars, about four hundred and eighty million dollars that that yes. was supposedly put towards Crazy. this. Yeah. Crazy. That's but what I think it's what he said. If he pops in there, I can ask him, but I believe it was four hundred and eighty million dollars and literally nothing got done from the did, sound of it. Vaughn, did you saw the, the video I send you on uh, the Wagner group um about uh, Patrick Lancaster with that with these uh, yeah. Von, uh Wagner guys? They saw a footage of a uh, Ukrainian shooting, shooting and being killed. Yeah. Did you look the state of these trenches? That's not a trench, that's just they dig just a piece out to be in it, and that's it. That is not a, 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 like a trench need to More be. like a rut. You don't have the fucking time to make a proper trench. You just dug it out, and that's it. They have nothing. Starts raining, they are fucked. Only by rain, they can be fucked in their trenches. And the problem is that the Russians became very... It's not only about the air defense as lacking for the Ukrainians. It's also the Russians became very good at launching fabs. The FAB is a new weapon system that they starting to use in Ukraine in mid-22, something like that. And in, in the first year of the war, they started very slowly. Now they're launching with 34s instead of two. They're launching four at a time. And they're flying by five planes. And they're launching even on three lines. They are, they are, they are it's, it's like they are using less artillery for the long-distance shots. And they prefer to use the FABs. And they are fucking accurate with it. They can take a oh. three line and the whole and the line of the three line. They're going to hit every point they set, like 100 meter distance. They're going to hit that fucking three line in a precision way. That's awesome. I, that's Could very good. You to say awesome. London, how is it possible? Is it a pilot or is it a weapon? It's got to be the weapon because it's good, weapon, GPS yeah. guided. So it just it's it's based on how good that. The CEP is. I mean, I know what he's talking I about. I've seen, about that. I've seen three fabs hit a you know hit a parallel line on is a three one? line, like one, then a couple hundred yards, one, then a couple hundred yards, and I mean, you can't That's tell perfect. me that shit wasn't intended. I, I, I want to add something about the, the, the Russian like more advanced technique. The the Russian uh, did not use uh, before the war laser guided munition. What they use is a bombardment bombardment computer. Basically, the pilot uh, push a button and the computer decides when to drop the bomb. It's the computer who makes all the calculation to decide when is the better way to drop the bomb to hit the target. 
So the pilot just has to, to fly in the right direction. The altitude and the speed, he don't care. That's the computer job to deal with that. And uh, I think for the fab, it should be the same computer. They you just uh, make a, a new software. The system is basically the same, I think. You fly in the direction and you hit the button. And in a few seconds, the bomb is going to drop uh, herself uh, Only... whenever it needs to be dropped. Only if you looked at Adyevka, they were bombing in the center of the city. And I think it was guided by the military on the ground. They asked, it's like it's like the US that need, we need A-10s. And the US sending A-10s. And the US normally is going to laser points of giving the target position that they need to, 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 to shoot, depending which weapon they're using. I think the Russians are doing the same thing also. They are so targeting they like in Adyevka uh, city. The system. Okay, do you guys know I think which, also, which... no person uh, uh, laser system, but, but the drones that they're using, they also can give the GPS locations that they need to strike because we see the footage of the striking. Okay, the drone already flying there. So I think the drone operator is going to give the the, the, the target numbers, the coordination of the GPS. Um, to, 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 to the planes or to the command center. The command center is going to send them to the planes and the plane is going to... Yeah, I think something Upgrade. like that. Upgrade. Yeah, so so um, there's more and more AI who's getting inside this uh, system, right? So the, the you don't use any more uh, humans to actually measure or uh, calculate where it's hit. You, you actually use technology so it's more efficient and more deadly and that's not just the the patriots and so on it's also when you say the uh, why it's um may uh, uh, i saw also the vampires who get destroyed all this armor who gets destroyed it's it's i don't know how much money is getting destroyed every day but this must be crazy amount i mean like that's why the, the i think the americans realize that and and, and getting on like you need to break this because it's too much money getting spent for useless shit. Like the Belgorod attack, they used so many vampires, right? And they all got destroyed. For what? For shooting some couple of uh, uh, villages just to make the PR stunt, and then you lose millions of equipment, which you could actually use to, to for defense. I, I really don't see the strategic value in yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, look at the million. fucking M1 tank, you know, it's like eight million dollars a copy, and they fucking drove it down the fucking street with no fucking cover, no protection, and it got fucking smoked. I mean, granted, maybe they did break up that Berdichi attack and hold off the Russians for a few days or a week, but cost them four M1s, and like I said, it doesn't look like maybe one crew survived out of the three or four tank or the four tanks. So, I mean, they lost four crews that they, you know, three crews out of four probably, or at least the majority <laughs> of those crews. Those are all the guys got the extra long special training. They lost, that's, you know, probably $30, $40 million worth of equipment. You know, I mean, like I said a long time ago, those tanks would have been great in the beginning of the war in little hunter killer packs sitting on, above the Crimea, lighting the Russians up when they came out of the Crimea to take, you know, Avastol and all that and Mariupol and everything else. Because back then they had air-to-air parity probably. They had probably had more guys on the ground and tanks than the Russians had available. And they had artillery back then and radar and air defense. But now it's like it's a day late and a dollar short by the far. Thing, like, yeah, it's a good tank, but it's really not going to do shit. It's not going to do anything better than a fucking T-55 if you're going to send it out. With no artillery cover, no air support, no like yeah, they are gone uh, in, in one strike. I think a very big explosion with that uh, radioactive. Uh, <laughs> that was that one. Uh, but I, what I was actually want to say about these patriots, we need, we don't need to forget. In July, probably Ukraine is going to have F-16s. But what are you going to protect these F-16s? No, perhaps yeah. they won't. But it's very interesting what most of Kiev. The European Union, well, Upgrade was talking about the AI, artificial intelligence. And the European Union was something like a month ago, uh, Fandel and all those little bastards, they'll always say, 
oh, we are going to integrate in, uh, artificial intelligence in these uh, in all the components, and the Russians will see it how bad they are. And now, upgrade and you, Mr. Lambo, are telling me the Russians are already using AI to do it, which is impressive. Who has the upper hand? And let's talk about AI. The Russians are very good programmers. They are, they are, these, what they are developing now, they will be using everywhere. They should be really afraid. And now they have the upper hand. They will learn about what the Russians are doing. They don't still know how the Russians are doing it. And this is impressive. Also, Putin had in one of his speeches, he said he wants to increase the amount of uh, quantum computers. And the Russians are very good in quantum computers, actually. And they have even one of the elements that nobody has at the moment, which is blocking the development of quantum com computers with neon because it's an inert uh, gas. And it exists, Russia is almost the only single producer at the moment. And they can open, they can start as many uh, um, quantum computers as they want. I, I, was, I, I was starting to say, Prata, you're going to say that Russians are using a lot of chips coming out of washing machines. So I'm oh, gonna, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, to, yes. to qualify, Ukrainians are very good programmers too. You know, a lot of people you know hire Ukrainian programmers because they are very cheap. But yeah, they uh, use... they, as a result, they're very, very good. You no, know, if you look like you, know, you look at some of the shit that you know that's out there, Life UA map you know, is Ukrainian, Deep State UA is Ukrainian, you know, and these are all very good apps. <coughs> right? And uh, and a lot of games also is all, is developed by Ukrainian developers. Yeah, What's so and don't forget I, I won't be surprised. Uh, they they have very similar stuff on in Ukraine. The problem is just deployment, you know, and to build the shit out. It's just difficult. Yeah, I I I, I and yeah, I, I think. And never mind. It's okay. Uh, I get to choose who is to talk next. <laughs> yeah. well, guys, okay. what about hey, I haven't choose who to about talk, the man. In Maria? That yeah, killed a lot choose. of foreigners. Mini, 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 I got to trigger. Yeah, uh, you I got to choose. Euro, choose. Euro, 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 Euro first. Uh, Euro, okay. Euro. Just uh, recently, I read uh, you guys talking about how Russians are good programmers. Uh, yeah, but uh, who's uh, who's directing them what to do? Uh, that's the question. It was just now I'm reading about a program that's gonna integrate uh, uh, one mobile phone. Uh, specifically designed for the military uh, to be spread, uh, it will include drone detection software. The network centri centric command and control. Okay, now they're doing after the United States already had it for like 10 years, network centric command and control. So why they didn't direct uh, earlier those good programmers to do it? Okay, so that's another question. They're doing it now, right? When they have to, when they finally realizing how late they are about it, but they're doing it. Yes, there's a, I think uh, the name is of the uh, app is Grom or something like that. Gromy, Grom. I'm not sure. I just read it like two days ago. So that's that's really good advance. It's a mobile phone that can be like to some sergeants uh, delivered to everyone, and they will have a drone detector with it because it's a radio uh, control uh, drones, right? So it can the, the phone itself can detect that frequency and so on, different frequencies within the drone control. And uh, another thing uh, about uh, strategy. Uh, uh, Mr. Da Silva with the super chat was wrong. It's not so many conspiracies, it's speculations. Talking about <laughs> speculating about how those gliding bombs are uh, working. So uh, it's speculation, not uh, not conspiracies. Okay. Um, the, the, let's say that the Russians don't use GPS, they use GLONASS. Okay because they jamming gps and there was news how they jammed uh, uh who was that uh, flying in uh, poland some american general was flying out of poland and they were jamming gps there so uh, when the gliding bombs uh they're controlled by glonass and inertia guidance 
and the uh, pilot uh, just needs the speed and uh, uh, altitude to follow that towards the target and it will program the uh, 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 coordinates into the GLONASS and it will fly. Yes, you need the AI to control, to make the flight or gliding of that huge bomb with small wings to stay stable, to fly controllably, right? That's why you need the AI and uh, to, to know the position where it needs to go. But it's intelligence where to drop it. That's the most important thing that you need huge huge drones collection and intelligence on the ground and uh, all of it it needs to be centralized so as soon as target appears or is known it needs to be sent to the flame that's a long way to be uh, to be sent uh, that information uh, to be sent to the command and then command send it to the plane and then planes uh, uh, pilot uh, uh, or the navigator actually uh, inputs the coordinates into the uh, the gliding uh, apparatus or gliding computer. That's how it works. And then it drops it with enough speed and altitude, and it will go there. It, the yes, computer will tell him when he's in within the reach uh, of that gliding bomb. That's how it works. Uh, it's combination of GLONASS and inertia. Uh, with the gy gyroscope, I, I believe they have inertia uh, control too. So uh, those two. Uh, also, there's a Baidu, right? Chinese coordinate system. But also you need to have precise maps. So there was a satellite or a, a plane. Uh, uh, how say uh, marking and uh, coordinating the grids precisely on a map so it doesn't matter what uh, where you uh, where you point on a map if it's not exact coordinate it's not going to work right uh, even if it's the target uh, if there's uh, something to destroy it right there but uh, they they can move in the meantime right that's a complicated thing. having intelligence that's the most complicated thing Okay, another point about uh, the Avdivka. I have one more point. Sorry, I was listening. I didn't interrupt. Uh, uh, it was the Russian strategic planning about destroying a Tavria army group, Ukrainian army group called Tavria. That was around Donbas. Okay, that was the Sirsky was commanding that uh, group. Okay, and uh, it was the how to say the least this damaged uh, group army group in ukraine uh, all the uh, rest of the army groups along the front line were really you know massacred and so on but tavria was the strongest so it was a decision by the strategy strategies to destroy that tavria <clears throat> group as the only remaining uh, strong group army group in ukraine and that's why they did it and they yes in the beginning they used all the gliding bombs on it to destroy it and it but initially the first phase was to actually to overcome artillery to uh because ukrainians had the initiative with artillery so they didn't allow any uh, russian artillery to come to the closer to the front uh, it was immediately hit so they had problems with uh, uh, artillery to position it in a range and to hit back to that artillery. And that was the first um, phase of taking initiative before we finished around the New Year's. The second phase is actually, I believe, ending now, which was, uh, you know, damaging those uh, uh, forces of Ukraine as much as possible, reducing it, attrition it. And now third phase is starting which should be much more stronger attacks, right? Especially that Ukrainians have an even longer front line down that they opened in Belgorod. That's even worse now for the for Ukrainians. And basically they're running out of, uh, uh, out of uh, uh, supplies and human forces. That's, that's it. Um, shadowy next. Thank you. I just wanted to, to add, we have to be very careful to not uh, mistake intelligence, intelligence artificial with just uh, simple software. 
today everybody is speaking about uh, EA and most of the time it's just uh, mislabel uh, old school software. And I think for the bombardment software, it's just software, not uh, EA. That's what I think. Second point about the uh, IT engineers that you need uh, for the Russian military, they could do the same things as they did for other part of your, their industry. They could use Russian civil IT engineers and hire them for military contract. And for the civilian IT jobs, they could use Indian. In India, they have a lot of uh, trade with Russia with going only one way. Basically, they buy, they bought a lot of oil. So they need to equilibrate the trade between the two countries. So you could imagine that uh, India would be very happy to sell something, in fact, uh, IT services to Russia for civilian purpose, of course. That's all. And next is uh, upgrade, I think. Yeah, <clears throat> just wanted to add on something what Jordan said. Like, of course, intelligence on the ground is uh, very important, but I don't think that the Ukrainians are hiding like where they are. I mean, there is a front line, they're sticking to their trench and uh, they're trying to defend each quadrat meter with all they have. So it makes the job of the Russians much easier than, than when you have uh, uh, constantly moving targets. Obviously, in the rear, they have moving targets, right? Who try to not get detected by various weapons by the Russians. But I mean, the infantry is still there in the trenches in the front line, they try to defend what they can. So it's uh, the damage comes from the fabs like that, right? They just pound the shit out of strategic positions or positions where they want to go breakthrough uh, with fabs, with artillery, with all these uh, things which they have. And um, yeah, you can disagree, but that's what uh, you can clearly see on the battlefield. They clearly it's attack close with artillery. Pardon? It's too close to the rep friendlies if they drop the bombs on a frontline trenches they cannot drop the uh, fabs huge fabs on the frontline trenches uh, unless they move away the friendlies have to move away a few hundred meters but there's a there's That's a why they don't drop bombs on on a there's, a contra, there's a counterpoint when you saw after the adievka when they broke through adievka and they went to the three settlements next to it they bombed the shit out of it with uh, fabs and they were going forward at the same time so they were they, they're pushing like that too you know it's not just yeah. the, uh, the one strategy and you follow just one strategy sometimes you use the opportunity to hit strong and then you go through so that's why there is yeah. piercing if you just continue to do it like that you will just grind them down slowly but if you want to do it a little bit faster you can hit strong and then go after it yeah, yeah mr lambo yeah yeah, it is exactly what you say. Actually, they are hitting the, the new defense positions that the Ukraine just took, like three lines, because you can hide very well in it. So the Russians want to advance. What they are doing is fab first these defense lines, and then they're going to come closer by foot after the fabs. They are not fabbing at 100 meters, of course, not at one or 200 meters, uh, from from uh, from from the Russians uh, that are trying to attack at Yevka, it was fucking close. <laughs> they were fabbing very close to the to 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 the, to their own people. Actually, it was uh, it was scary close. I never saw fabbing that close to, uh, to the site of the Russians themselves. It was very close. But they did that in a very fast way. It's that that. that if you can choose between calling artillery of calling fab to have a big result, you just call fab because the damage is going to do is, is amazingly big. It's amazingly big. And it's crazy that they're using that to, to attack trenches. It's, it's like, it's pretty new. It's like one month they are doing that. Fun? You are muted. Muted. I wasn't trying to change the topic or anything but i didn't know if anyone else wanted to do anything on ukraine and if they didn't we could talk about barbecuing on the weekend hanging out with your friends well, we can continue I, with ukraine. I would like to explain uh, how the frontline troops are uh, actually they're not sitting in the trenches they're a few up to a kilometer back behind the 
front zero front line okay uh there's only few uh very few in a front line themselves it's always the reinforcement when they're getting attacked those frontline uh, trenches it's reinforcement being sent the fabs are specifically directed against uh, those reinforcements that are supposed to be sent to improve defense or to counter attack so majority of the troops are about a kilometer or two behind the front lines it's only a small number of people guarding the front line itself so th this is how it works and and uh, i didn't i still didn't see the fabs being uh, dropped uh closer than 500 meters from the from the friendlies so uh, that's what i know so half a kilometer about uh closest was uh and it would be uh, uh, the, they will attack after they dropped and uh, get a clear from the aviation to go forward so and that's how i figured out it's going on so uh I'm, if you all don't know what to say i want to show you guys one article uh posted by rt russia today uh is very weird so uh, macron is proposing uh olympic ceasefire for ukraine um i my brain Jeez. cannot fully understand this um so he said that uh it's going to be between july 26 to august 11th so they're not supposed to fight because of olympic but at the same time you no know, russia is not supposed to uh, compete under the russian name and uh, belarus also no they are not allowed to uh they are, they are banned to to use their own flag they are supposed to present themselves as neutral at least yet they wanted no. russia to not can, can i add no. something about the olympic game i in want to add something to that too real quick when you're done yeah i just thought i well i saw the article i was like what the hell am i reading well it's much more interesting <laughs> what, what, to what, to him. what i want to say about that real can quick can i start is, first please well, about the said, olympic game in france Go ahead, because I think after me, we are going to, to say something else. <laughs> you have to understand that in France, this Olympic game is some kind of thing that's making everybody angry, basically. And uh, more and more people are beginning to think that it's costing a lot of money, it's disturbing a lot of people, and it basically is just for Macron to be uh, a star for a few days behind the, in front of the media. Yeah. And people don't like Macron. Really, really, they don't like Macron. So they want him to be, uh, to be with, uh, what's the word, uh, to be considered by all the media as some someone stupid and uh, ridiculous, what's the word. And uh, they don't want uh, him to be uh, good looking. So a lot of people are thinking about strike protest and riot specifically during the olympic game and you know the french guy they really like their uh, riot and strike and protest so it's going very difficult to run the marathon with the lacrimo with the tear gases uh, in the street it's going to become a tourist attraction you can charge the tickets oh, yes. you know, for tourists to, to watch it <laughs> no i was just going to say real quick just on the Olympic thing, you know, it's going to be bullshit about the whole flag and they have to be neutral and shit. The problem is, is if they compete and they beat the Ukrainians, the Ukrainian guy will be able to stand there on the stage and disrespect him or walk away from his third place finish because the Russian got second or whatever, you know, and they'll be able to do whatever they want to these neutral Russians that came that are supposed to be neutral. They'll be able to disrespect them, not compete against them, not shake their hand. There is just a small no, little problem you have to add to the mix. Most of the sponsors for this game come for, are from the Gulf states and from China. Okay, they are not from USA, most of the sponsors this game. So no, if you want to keep the money, you have to be very nice. May, may I add on something to what Shadowy said just before you go? Yeah, uh, I, I agree with Shadowy. Like, 
we had the World Cup, uh, Rugby World Cup, not so long time ago. And Macro, he went because he had to inaugurate the ceremony like every president does for big events. And he was booed like shit. Nobody listened to him because nobody likes him. And that's totally true. Nobody likes the Olympic. It's useless. It costs a lot of money. We are not prepared. We saw what happened with the Champions League final in Paris with Liverpool and uh, uh, I think Real Madrid. It was it was a shambles. People had tickets and couldn't enter. They got beaten by police. And it was we we gotta be again in the I'm international the street, stage. The street gang. Yeah, with the street gangs also crazy. It was it was it was total mess. And we're gonna be looking internationally like idiots again because yeah. we have an incompetent presidency, an incompetent government who is using big events to uh, tap themselves on the shoulders and say they're the best, like usual, and don't give a shit about anything else about the people. Because in Paris right now, it's a big problem, like Shadow said, because of the Olympic Games. There's a lot of construction work for this, uh, all these places where this athlete is going to be. But it's useless afterwards. We saw it with the Brazilian who also had it. And uh, it just costs money. And after they're empty spaces who nobody uses. Uh, Nunia. Imagine the farmers protest during a marathon. Oh, oh, I, well, oh, 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 they are going to come back to Paris just for the Olympic game. Don't worry. I think, it's a, I think it's a foregone conclusion that there's going to be riots uh, at the Olympics. Like uh, with everything going on in, in Palestine, if that's still, you know, motoring on as we suspect it will be, uh, I, I think the entire city will just be in chaos. But, you know, going back to Macron, he's he's flailing like a drowning man right now. And he's just saying whatever he thinks works. And, you know, to Wyatt's point, they won't even let Russia, you know, participate under their own flag. Meanwhile, you got this clown just last week was threatening to invade uh, and go to war with Russia. Um, and, and he expects them to somehow, you know, agree to a truce for the Olympics. Like, he's completely delusional, delusional at this point. Delusional. I have a good one for you. No, no. Wait, wait, wait. The, the okay, moment you go. he was asking about the, the truce, he was also speaking, I had a finger, uh, he was also speaking about how Russia can't win, how uh, France is going to do everything, even put uh, fruit, uh, fruits on the ground, if it needs to, in order for Russia not to win. So it's quite impressive. So in one way, he wants a truce, which is like ridiculous, like you all guys said. And exactly after that, he, he has all these warmonger discourse around. But this guy, I think internationally, Macron has made himself in the last three weeks the clown of the court. <laughs> not just yeah. three weeks. Don't forget his Africa turn, turn. his Africa wound. Like yeah, it's, it's, guys, it's really difficult to knock Trudeau off his mantle as being the biggest idiot in the world. But Macron has done it. Like, well done. Who I, think close. Know. I, I, close. I, I think, I think the only thing that the Russians are going to do during the Olympics is probably get the gold medal in fabbing. Yeah, long distance well, yeah. fabbing. <laughs> okay, I want to add something well, about actually, the Olympic game, about the stupidity of the government. They have promised promised the policeman a special uh, special money of uh, one thousand and fifty and five hundred uh, euro for every policeman who is going to Paris, basically. And there is going to be a lot of them. Immediately, all the all the state worker will go, who have to work. They they are not allowed to go uh, in vacancies during the the Olympic game. Ask the same thing. So basically, there is going to be 30 or 40,000 policemen in Paris and the area for the prime, for the money. But no, there is half a million to one million people asking this, uh, this money. And of course, if they don't have the money, they are going on strike during the Olympic game. Were they are, are they going to supplement any of this with military too, the police and all that for security? Yeah, or yes, yes. for sure, in France, there sure. is already these things before, and, against terrorism and the stupid thing like that. Yeah, no terrorism, yeah. but uh, gang raping, like uh, that too. 
Algerians, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and yeah, also to uh, they have like is, uh, yeah. Sorry, George. is the Notre Dame gonna be open by the by the Olympics? I have no idea. Oh, even so. better, even better. Lego is going to uh, Lego is going to release an architecture set from the Notre Dame. <laughs> you can destroy yourself to the roof of burning down. There's no yeah, also. What you see also is there is no enthusiasm for the Olympics because oh. they they uh, had like uh, calculated that on the inauguration ceremony there will be like two to three million people taking part of, but then they calculated again and there was like just three hundred thousand and three hundred thousand of them are all government employees who get inv invited by Macron to clap for him, you know, to 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 actually do. Oh, they are not going to clap. Yeah, 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 yeah. Going to refuse to give them the money for the exactly. <laughs> Dude, that's ridiculous. That means hey, I, have, I have another oh, stupidity wow. for you for the Olympic game. So you have but decided when... this week that if you have a baby uh, on site uh, on the Olympic game, you have to pay a ticket for the baby. I think, uh, to be honest with you, the whole imagery of the Olympics, and I know that, you know, obviously yeah. France, when they won the bid for the Olympics, you know, years ago, they didn't know any of this was going to happen, but. The, just the imagery of the Olympics happening right now with everything going on in Palestine, everything going on in Ukraine, everything going on. It just, it looks really, it's a bad look to me. And I don't know why it just looks very, um, and I don't know what the word I'm looking for. It looks very, um, well, elitist. Well, yeah. it's, it's, it's the most boring. It will be the most boring Olympics ever. And this is quite oh, impressive yes. because you see, the Olympics was always this kind of sense that we bring humanity together, that uh, we'll, we'll talk about peace, that we'll solve through sports, we'll solve our problems, we'll seat people that are against each other, we seat them at the same table uh, competing in, in rules and manners, and this is all destroyed, this doesn't exist anymore, and... It, 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 all these stories about Macron and the Olympics, I think this will be the biggest disaster as the Olympics ever. Oh, yes. And we, after this, we will need to reinvent the Olympics mm. all over again. Otherwise, the Olympics. No, is... you just need to organize them in Asia. No, no, no. Yeah. no. Why, 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 why are the Olympics not going to be successful? Yeah, 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 may I just. Again, these are all athletes that trained for years and years and years. It's not a country that organizes that's going to make a difference about the thinking of and the achievements that these athletes, yeah. Athletes but this want is not the athletes. I, I understand, I understand you, the athletes, but about uh, uh, but Olympics was also about the public. It's not just what, uh, it's it was great. They will also. come. I, they I, will have come. It. I think it will be it's... the most boring Olympics ever. Honestly, no. it, well, yeah, if Olympics you want to come to the Olympic game, do not come this year in France. Wait for the next one. But <laughs> this one, forget uh, about it. Upgrade. Tickets for the events, tourists, it's not such a big money. It's ad, ad money that plays the biggest role. And everyone uh, in Olympics is actually counting on the television networks to pay the licenses to, you know, uh, and they depend on the ad money in the world yeah right but all the television networks depend on ad money during those uh, sport event and it all depends how much uh, a viewership in the world is gonna happen are they gonna have the money is it gonna pay off that that's the only way you can characterize if it's gonna fail or not the the tourists themselves are not a big money well Don't forget the, last, the last the couple of the Olympics of the country the last couple of Olympics to that very point, um, you know, that with TV going down in terms of viewership ratings and all that stuff, the legacy media networks that are buying the, these uh, 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 Olympic events or whatever, World Cups or whatever, they're not getting their return on investment like they were 20, 30 years ago because, you know, traditional media, people just aren't consuming it that way so uh if they to your point about the advertising even that's going way down i must disagree i must disagree the world cup is watched by billions of people especially the final 
there's a big enthusiasm about football world cup so it's one of the it's, most it's watched. Uh, no, yeah. no doubt yeah. it's watched but it's not yeah. watched as much as it was 25 years ago is my point right yeah. okay I, I don't have the statistic in front of me but to to uh to add on to what uh, prata said the that's exactly it right the olympics was about to meet each other and even we have differences to be together and compete together right and i think uh, the olympics lost uh, uh, one of his uh, charm when they start to say oh now russia can just uh, compete in a neutral flag what the hell is this so you need to do all the countries in the world who do bullshit uh, why we don't do it for saudi arabia why we don't do it for yemen why we don't do it for all israel or whatever country so everybody is neutral and nobody can compete for his flag that's a big for me I, i'm I'm not a huge patriot, right? But if you can, if you compete for your country, at least you want to have your flag after when you want to be represented and say, "Hey, look, that's my country," right? Like that's that's a basic thing, right? They train so hard to be to represent their country with, with their pride, and then they're robbed by it because some uh, uh, international organization said, "Oh, that's not good. What you are doing, we don't agree with it." Okay, I, I understand also a little bit about the doping thing. That's also another topic, right? But it's not a it's not a it's not a, a, a solution to just ban or make it neutral, right? Uh, I don't know who was first, one or white. Right? I don't know, Mr. Limbo. First of all, why you go first? Yeah, I, I actually wanted to say very similar things to upgrade as well, because like if Olympic is supposed to be the thing that brings countries together, even the despite the differences. You know, even during the Cold War, the Soviet Union. You know, yeah. still participated right and with their own flag so now to, and they make they make shit up you know like the doping and everything then it's like okay you have the doping then you ban the athlete that do, that you no know, take the drugs but they ban the whole country because it's an excuse so now they continue to you know do this thing you know because of ukrainian uh, conflict it's like it's nonsense in the eyes of neutral people normal people it degrades what Olympic is, and I can tell you that the spectacle of the Olympic has been dying. Honestly, I don't even know there was Olympic this year. That's why when I read the thing, I was Me like, either. "What?" Well, yeah, it, it, like, no, I, I was gonna say, I, I'm going to make this prediction now on the Olympics. How many want to take this bet with me that the the media in the West or whoever's covering the Olympics, they're going to be such dicks? That when the Russians compete, they'll break away, so you don't see the Russian uh, athletes actually competing. You might see them if they win an event, but I wouldn't be surprised if mm. a Russian takes a gold or a silver or a bronze or medals. They probably just cut away when it gets to their you know, announcement. You won't see Russians under their neutral flag on Western TV, or hey. they'll do. They'll try very hard to hide it. I mean, I'm just saying that's the kind of petty dick shit they do. They can't beat you, rush, you rush on the battlefield. Oh, we're going to own them on NBC when we cut away to a commercial break when the guy's about to get the gold medal. That's the kind of gay ass shit they fucking do. I bet you they no, do it. I, I bet you won't see Russian athletes yeah. on TV. But they want to. Yeah, I'm not the, sure. I'm not sure about no the uh, your the your countries you no know, like the viewership of this kind of games anymore. Like in Singapore, like like even the Sea Games, the Southeast Asia Games. I, I got a strong feeling most people don't really care anymore. Like, you know, people don't watch. Like in Singapore, I think most of the people don't really care. We only celebrate when the, oh, the news the news came out, we won a gold medal and whatnot. You know, after that, like, nobody watches, nobody cares. The Olympics is the same thing, you know, they can they can cast it, but nobody, I don't, I don't have the feeling that people is actually watching. So, I'm not no, sure about I mean, you guys. I know it was no, me over the last please, 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 years. Please. Just real quick. Yeah, but it was I also just look another. At the metal count. That's it. I don't it really watch all... it unless it was skiing or something, snowboarding. It was event. Lambo, really. Lambo. But that was, I'm going to say also responding to juries, not only the ads that making money, you need to understand the country's organization, something is going to be economical for the locals, very good. Don't forget also, it's fucking Paris, it's France, it's a Europe. It's easy to go there. It's not somewhere in Brazil or something, in Rio or whatever, to go there. They're going to have a lot of tourists. A lot of people want to go once in their life to the Olympics. So 
people from Belgium, for instance, Paris is like four hour driving from Germany, not so far away from Spain, not so far away uh, from Italy, not so far away. So a lot of our Europeans are going to take their, 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 they're going to come to, to Paris. What's going to happen to Paris is depending about the, 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 the government, how they're going to, to look after the security of the people there. Uh, to, to, you're going to see some protests and bullshitting because it's France, so it's, they are used to it. So the police also already had a big plan to, to try to get the farmers and, the, and the, the, the guys of the gangs and, and, next, the, and, and the, the suburbs away from the Olympics. Are we never going to see it on the television? We're never going to see it happening. Uh, maybe we on Telegram, but uh, it's it, but it's going to be a very big. What Macron did is actually very good for the country economically. It's very good. It's very smart. And don't say they're going to be attacks and things that can happen. Don't forget Atlanta and United States. There'll be a terrorist attack in Atlanta. So no country is safe for terrorism or something like that. But for France, is for, for to 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 have the Olympics in your country. It's a fucking good thing. Economically, it's a fucking good thing. It's not only about the ads they're going to win. This is the Olympic organization is going to get that money. But but the, the economic the economics that the country is going to earn and that period of the of the Olympics is going to be big. We are not maybe watching the Olympics, but a lot of people are interested in that in these sports. And they're going to have a lot of crowding watching television, and they are going to have a lot of people going to there to see it happening in real life. I have a girlfriend that did participate at the Olympics, and she's going to Paris to see it. So she, she's just going there. It's normal. I wanted to add something about uh, one uh, idea about the ranking uh, of the athlete. You have to, to know a fun <laughs> fact about uh, Hollywood these years. Every year they calculate the the earning of every movie in the world, okay, and they make a ranking every month. This year they have decided to exclude China because in February the first uh, film movies who earned the most money was a Chinese movie, 500 million dollars. The second movies was a Chinese movie, 400 million dollars. And the third movie was an Hollywood movie, 170 million dollars only. So, since they don't want to publicize a ranking with two Chinese movies at the head of the ranking, at the top of the ranking, they just decided they are going to remove Chinese movies from the ranking. And <coughs> currently, Hollywood is the best movie maker in the world. May I add something what Shadowy said? If you say Hollywood is the best, uh, what it gets, we are really in big troubles because when you see the movies lately, they are horrifyingly shit. Oh, uh, June but, is very uh, The budget they have, the budget they have, and what they, they, you don't need to just look at what they, what this is the income. You also need to look what they spend on it. The spending went so up because of the CGI movies everywhere they are right now that they actually not making even half of what they spent that's why disney stock went down that's why they have big problems it's not it's it's not just because they make great entertainment they make sometimes great entertainment and they live from the past don't forget we watch the nice disney movies the disney movies with meaning which there was no political correctness well, the, 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 it was about the meaning behind the movie and even it was small so you are hurting my feeling yeah, I, I, you get me, right? Everybody yes, yes. thought it like this, I think, when, when you have this nostalgia about these movies where you have the meaning when you're small, you don't understand it. But when you grow up and you show your kids, you understand the meaning behind it and how beautiful it is and how smart these people were. And there were not, there were not uh, uh, boundaries about how to do movies or something like that. They were just in intellectually and crazy good people who did crazy good entertainment for everybody, for the entire planet. That's why everybody in the world watched Disney movies. Everybody watched The Lion Kings, everybody watched Pocahontas and so on. And to come back to the real quick and then give the word to one, to the Olympics, 
the, the, the thing is, I understand you, Mr. Lambo, when you say it's a great opportunity for the country, but if the country is able to take the opportunity, and I'm not sure if France can take the opportunity because there's so many problems sure. internally. That's, that's why every French pre person is like, oh, we're not ready for that. Trust me. If we can't manage to make a Champions League final, Olympics is bigger than a Champions League final, you know. Uh, there's just a that. certain I amount of people who can come to the to the stadium in, in, in the Champions League final. But Olympics is for weeks and weeks and weeks and millions of people come, right? And France already has a, a past of knowing how to uh, take tourists because we are the number one country from around the world with tourism, right? So we have this knowledge, but there's another level, right? And there is no, problems. The There's problems world. inside the country. You know it, Mr. Lambo. You're just next to us, uh, to France. You know how it's fucked up. Uh, You're thinking. Yes. No, it's unstable. It's unstable. How are you going to do some uh, uh, event like this big if you have the entire streets blocked by farmers? It's going to be everywhere in the news. It's going to be a fucking ridiculous shit show. Uh, yeah, I am, I am curious about the farmer thing. Uh, one, 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 one first. Sorry, it's my sir. I forgot the You're muted. You're muted. You're I was going to say, I'll let Shadowy go if he's going to say something about the Olympics. He can Mr. go before Lambeau, me. Sir. Mr. Lambeau? Yeah. I, I just wanted to say France has a lot of experiences to organize such big things. Football World Cup. Last year, Rugby World Cup. And that was in different cities. All over France. They have the fucking... They know how to do it. I went... I went a few times seeing rugby games uh, in France um, and, and, uh, and, and Paris and South of France. It's not going to say it's good organization is good, but they know how exactly. to do it. They know how to do it. They, you, you don't forget France, like all the countries in Europe, are known for hooliganism and, and football. They perfectly know how to, to counter that. And the hooligans in France <laughs> are not <Not> crazy. <laughs> they, are, they, are, they are bigger than the Belgian ones. They are not bigger than Italian ones. They are not bigger than... They are probably the same like UK or Germany. But they know how to handle these guys. I was just speaking about Olympics. You don't even have hooliganism in the Olympics. So they don't need the security for what's happening in, in the stadium. Um, they need it outside, so they can divide. They, I think, I am not afraid. I, but I am, I am still very curious about what's going to happen with the farmers. But uh, they're going to prevent. They're going to be very aggressive with these farmers. I, I think you are. That. You don't understand the situation, Mr. Lambo, and you are underestimate the hunger in France. The Olympic game for a lot of people in France is a symbol of the system. Basically, there oh. is going to be a lot of TV. A lot of VIP, a lot of politician guy, of course Macron, the best of one, the best one, and there is going to be. Don't, don't forget the ticket to enter the shittiest event is 120 euro. Damn. Yeah, for yeah. Okay? the French yeah. people. So it's an event for the for wealthy that. guy, mm -hmm. for the, Belgian for the one very wealthy game. guy, and a lot of people who just want to basically protest against the system. They are just don't happy with their life. They want to protest, and there is a lot of things to protest in the Western world today. They are going to use this event. It's not about liking the Olympic game or not. It's, a bit, it's about hunger. Yeah, and I know. Have it, uh, you have a place where you got really, really good um, symbol of this system that you are not happy with. So but honestly, don't come to this Olympic game. Choose another one okay. if you want to visit. Uh, oh, don't choose this one. Yeah, yeah, viens quand même, viens quand même. Bienvenue. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah I, so I, I, I got to get going, but uh, I just want to say this is an excellent open mic so far. I mean, I really like the way it's flowing good today, and I know you guys are going to eventually get to Haiti, I assume, and I'm, sadly, I'm going to miss that. But I will say this to everybody on the panel, and if you're out there in the DPA world, you really need to go watch why it's our and 10 minute presentation deep dive on the Haitian thing, because it'll get you up to speed on the current situation. It gives you background on the key players, a little bit of their backstory and history and some potential 
operations and things that can happen. And it's a really good primer to watch before you, you get into Haiti. But obviously, it's a little late now, so hopefully you all watched it. But if you're out there, definitely check it out because you, it kind of gives you an overview of what's going on. That You can kind of just sit back and see what's going to happen based on what he said. Yeah. But you all have a good week. Bye -bye, Enjoy bro. your Olympics. I'll yeah. see you all. So, so because of that, what Ron said, we don't need to speak about Haiti. Because uh, Wyatt told everything in that move and that video clip, so we don't need to talk about it. <laughs> but about the Olympics, I just want yeah. to, to say France was, are very patriotic and they are very supportive about their own people, about their That's own true. Olympic participants. I'm going to see, of course, the world for the moment is only complaining and shitting around, like in France, you're a specialist in it. Um, <laughs> It's it's that you know we're also complaining, but more on the internet and France going to on the streets, but they're going to support their athletes. They they are very supportive of it. They are one of the biggest supporters of their own athletes. If you're looking at the front, and they are and they're going to be proud if if some French guys can win a gold medal or even a silver or a bronze. And you also need to if you watch if you if you watch a French sportsman. Uh, on the Olympics, he always going to say, "I did it for my country." He never do it for himself, you know. He always did it for his country. Always. I I you run. Know, I one run spot man was going to say as that as fast I could. I threw that ball as far away. Yeah, but I am also very curious <laughs> about the Special Olympics after the Olympics because it's going to be also in France. How many Ukrainian participants are going to be there? <laughs> Do you know one sportman who say I did it for money? No, seriously. But every country that participate that, that use it uh, is for the money, so they don't care. It's everywhere, everywhere like that. Or maybe some countries paying a lot of money to the Olympics to have. Yeah, oh, yes. it's, it's not I think I think shadowy our government don't give so much money. When I saw last time uh, in. Tokyo or something like that. It was also no, but there is a sponsor. It was not so much. We got four gold medal. You get like twenty, thirty thousand US dollars. I mean, you spend your entire uh, life to train that sponsor. Advertisement contract. Yeah, but not yeah. all of them. By the way, some of them are seventh or eighth or twentieth. They don't give shit. They don't get nothing. They invested their entire money, their entire resources. Yes, most of them, yes. Lost most of them, you know. There's just only three spots you to get a medal, and there's hundreds of participants, and you need to qualify before that, and so on yes, and yes, so yes, forth. I agree with that. Uh, it's a huge thing. When 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 but some the, the guy who wins the medal is never going to say something selfish. No, I think this people are example also of that different, I, shadowy, I because these people they have sports in which the, it's not televised hugely. They don't get huge contracts, you know, like football players or yes, yes, I agree with that. Players. I'm yeah. just saying that the, the declaration of Mr. Lambo is really strange because uh, when you are in front of the media after you win, earn a, a medal, you are always going to say something nice. You are never going to say uh, selfish things. Okay. No, no, no. A That's Belgium what, what guy. Say. Going you to are say, playing. Uh, I did my best. Actor, basically. I did my best. I I trained. I trained the the, the, the whole five years for myself. I uh, I was very good at at, at blowing pipes. Uh, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> yeah, but we can be happy to send ten people to the Olympics, you know. But um, but we have very good ones. Um, the ones that are participating are pretty good. But it's the French one always say, I fought for my country. I did the best for my country. Always, never for themselves. And I don't know if you know, Shadowy, the French uh, professional uh, athletes earn nothing about money. Oh, yes, I know. They work in a decathlon part time. Exactly. They, 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 they don't even have enough money to that. have. Uh, to buy there is only food. a few spots in France where you could earn money. It's it's crazy. They are not contracted and sponsors like like football players and some exactly. shit. Maybe the best ones, of course. Most of the times, they have what they call the some kind of state contract. You know, they work for a, a, a star, a city, or for a government, or for directly for the government, like the police or the post yeah. or something like that. Yeah. And they, so the organization the allows them like to train uh, most of the time. 
Yeah, yeah. we're working for your own sponsor, Decathlon, something like that. Yeah. And that's, that's yes, what... Olympics are specifically designed to have non-professional athletes. Yeah, that's but what athletes... Olympics are designed for. You have yeah, professional athletes that are paid also. contracts uh, for the with the club. That's a no, no, totally no, no. different. You have you have allowed. like here in Belgium. They're not allowed. Hey, Lamba, I'm talking it's... a little bit. Um, they're not allowed to uh, to compete in the Olympics. Yeah, they have to be like amateurs. Yes, usually most of the sportsmen have the no. uh, job with the uh, uh, no. government, uh, with the city, uh, and uh, they're allowed to to train and compete. That's that's how it works usually. No, 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 but no, 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 they no. have their job also as a sportsman uh, so, th th to complete to compete. No. Uh, in it's supposed to be, but it no, doesn't like, really seem seems to apply across the board. You know, no, you have no, no. national footballers. Is every situation possible, okay? It's, wait, wait. Yeah. It's not Let me explain. Uh, it's like here in Belgium, I think it's the same for France. You have the states that uh, say to you, you are a professional athlete. So these athletes that been uh, contracted as a professional athletes can be able to participate to so to the Olympics. They're getting they're getting finances from the state to be that. I but they are, they are they are earning shit up with that, so they are obligated to do a normal job also. Mm. They're, they're Don't forget the, the football the situation is like that also. They're getting nothing from. So they are professional athletes that is actually making less money than a normal average worker. But because they need to train hours in a week, they are they can't work full time. So they're going to maximum work part time. In France, <laughs> you're not making a lot of money compared to Belgium, for instance. And they have a lot of athletes also. Compared to Belgium, we're going to send maybe, I just say sh shit, you know, we're going to say, like for the, uh, for, 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 we're going to send teams also, but, and, and, and solo athletes, we're going to maybe send 10 people. These 10 people are going to have very easy a sponsor. If France, in this, that instance, is going to send 200 people. So these 200 people need 200 sponsors. It's more difficult that each of these 200 people are getting a sponsor easily that pays enough for them, for their gears, for everything. So it's, 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 yeah. So yeah. Olympic I Federation of the country to doesn't to have influence, something. doesn't have anything. Is that, is that the case? Uh, Olympic Federation of the each country don't contribute anything to those sportsmen? Is I have no idea. Do you know that? So, so I want for to add something for... about the, the status of the sportman, the uh, be careful because in some for some federation or for some sport, they are professional. I'm thinking about uh, uh, bicycle and about uh, football, soccer. For the soccer, they are all professional with very well, very well good uh, salaries. Yeah, okay. And uh, th there is a lot of federation where there is professional. When I say a lot, uh, I think there is uh, what uh, 100 sports in the uh, Olympic game, and uh, maybe 20 of them uh, they have a uh, professional inside. But uh, not uh, there is not only amateur in Olympic game. There is a lot of professional too. Yeah, cyclists is a perfect example. We in Belgium yeah. are very good in cyclism. Are very good. We are on football. Mbappé is going to go to the Olympic game, and he's going to be one yeah, of the also best. Uh, but, but, the we, but we Messi? are very good. But these guys are, 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 are cycling game. or do the cycling, and 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 the year they have their contracts with their team, and they're getting uh, a contract for the state from the state also to. The bonus for participating at the Olympics, but these guys already has in their normal job because their job as professional cyclists, 
they were making a lot of money. We have, I, I know one dude, he's sponsored by Lamborghini in Belgium, <laughs> one, one of the dealers. So he's driving Lamborghini, sponsored by, by Lamborghini Antwerp. Um, th these guys are fucking, yeah, these make, I need, I'm speaking like the athletes, like the marathon runners, the guys that are playing ping pong, uh, this type of guys, uh, <laughs> the, the normal athlete, athletes that are hey, not. For the tennis, they are professional too. Tennis is exactly the thing that they're doing as full time. Because everything that you don't do full time, it's like BM, uh, like the mountain bi mountain bikers, like BMX, uh, like the skaters. Yeah, they have, yeah, but uh, like the runners, the, the 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 guys are doing these um, trampoline stuff, or whatever. These guys are not doing that, and um, you also need to. It's like juice. It's like all the sports that have a big television contracts or the big earners. Make that more sense? Yeah. Cyclist, football, basketball, uh, even maybe volleyball. Uh, all these type of sports. Uh, these are the big money makers because they have the, these big te television contracts. And these are like just just see how many they they earning at for playing football. Or, or NBA in the United States. These, these are the. Could we switch the topic? This yes, is really long. Heaven, you can, yeah, yeah, we, yeah, no problem. I just we, give we, my, my my conclusion, and then we can move on to another topic. Uh, no problem, uh, Jordan. Uh, there, there, I think there there is a consensus that you, anyways, you first of all you need to qualify, right? The best of the best go uh, first of all to fi fight nationally, and then afterwards they. I can represent their country. It's not like everybody can just be like, oh, I'm French. I can just go to swim against the best guys or make you do against the best guys, right? Uh, second all, of all, uh, it depends also the contract of the TV depends also on the national sports, right? Like Japan is very strong in judo. You have more uh, people watching uh, judo or karate than in, I don't know, in countries where there's useless and they get nothing, right? If you get success, you get more TV rights and you get also bigger sponsors. Um, I, I think, like you said, Mr. Lambo is also uh, to do with at the end of the, uh, when they get something, right? They, when they win something, because they have this like, um, uh, um, they're humble, right? Because they're coming from a uh, lower background, right? With not so much money. So that's why they're like, we do it for the country, right? We do it to represent our, our country and our people, not for ourselves, because they come from low backgrounds, right? That's why I think it's also a lot of time like this in France. Most of them, they grow up very poorly and they just get this chance to make these sports and then they go through and win medals, right? And all of a sudden, and so on. Yeah, Wyatt, go on. Uh, I'm finished with. So. Yeah, I, I just want to add one last point as well, is that the by right, my understanding was that the Olympics, you know, is not supposed to be for professionals. But somehow, it's full of professionals. So, it's a so the, the but the reality is because it's a business, they want people to watch. If you're gonna have David Beckham going to play for the England team, <laughs> you want David Beckham to be playing for the England team because that's going to attract views, right? Cristiano Ronaldo playing for Portugal, yes, he's going to get a lot of money, you know. So it, it becomes. Con it becomes corrupted, you see. But the thing is, it also don't make sense for it to be not for professionals because it's like you want to know the fastest runner in the world. But if he's professional, he still can be the fastest runner in the world. So you no, know, why are you forbidding? It don't make sense to me as well. Is it so the, all these contradictions though in the Olympics just don't make sense? You no, know, suddenly you know the doping thing. Some people dope the whole country got banned. Is that what the fuck? You know. Then after that, you no, know, for for unknown reason, you cannot use your own flag. It's like, but then Israel is going to come with their own flag. But yeah. despite you no, know, they they're killing more civilians than the Russians. Is like, what the fuck, man? So no, so I I for me that that caused me to you know just lose interest in the Olympics. Generally speaking, like the to me the whole value and spirit of the Olympics is gone. So yeah, Yuri. Yo, Euro, I don't know. Why you change the spelling of Euro? <laughs> yeah, stop changing your name. Something okay, you... to change it. It should well, sound the same. To about? It, it yeah. should still sound the same, right? Uh, no matter what yeah. letter is there. 
So euro, euro, you, only euro. Uh, you have you have thrown Euro European value away, you know. You, you <laughs> yeah, don't like you. European value. <laughs> How dare you? Any other topics you want to talk about, you guys? I could remove. I could put it without why. Just U R O. It will still sound the same, right? <laughs> In English. True. True. <laughs> well, true. Uh, maybe maybe this. Uh, the one that uh, Nanya asked about an hour ago, and I, I think it's a really important question. I and I have actually I meant to to talk about it. Uh, I would like to talk if you guys agree. And uh, this is about uh, you know what can we do to change this uh, that uh, governments our governments are ignoring us. What should we do to change? You know. What can you do? Would you like? Do thing. you guys agree about that? Uh, yeah. I start first. I start first. My my answer is very easy. Just vote them out. Like mm -hmm. I'm. Old, I believe in elections. So no, just vote them out. But the, the thing is, how do you going to get them to vote them out? No. Yeah. You you have to go into politics. So yeah, you I, have I to guess, know, create a movement. I guess my question was, has the political system been so poisoned at this point that we're no longer democracies like here in Canada voting for one party versus another, it doesn't matter. They're all the same. So, and same thing in the U S and same thing in, in Europe, I'd assume as well. So, you know, our, our, I guess my question is more, are we so far gone now that even if you do vote somebody out, does it even matter? And, and if it doesn't matter, then what do we need to do to make it matter again? I guess is my question. I think the the very big difference between the political party, at least in France, it's not about the foreign policy. For the foreign policy, everybody in France is going to say the same thing. But it's about internal policy. If you try to think that Macron is going to do the same thing inside France from... Uh, LFE, uh, uh, LFE is at the left party or for uh, the far right, it's a mistake. The internal policy is going to be different, but you are right for the foreign policy. Yes, use the Swiss system, guys. Representing of people and uh, get the fuck out of these tyrants who just rule you like uh, fucking bitches. Just use a couple of people who nobody knows their names because nobody knows their names, uh, which minister we have, and just uh, use the people with referendums all the time. That would be a much uh, better system because with the referendum, you can actually ask the people and it's like a survey, but it's, it's much better because you can implement and ask the people, what do you really want? Do you, we just passed a law right now, not so long time ago. Again, we do it frequently in the year. And I have a question useful. about right. this is the yeah. last uh, referendum about the seas of neutrality about Russia. What what, uh, what, what do you say? Switzerland decided to stop to be neutral with Russia. Okay, is there a referendum about that? About to uh, about the about the decision to stop neutrality in Switzerland. So. Neutrality is is a, is a is a topic which is very important in Switzerland, and it's true that Switzerland was one of the first country who implemented uh, sanctions, especially on the financial market, against Russia. But we don't send weapons to Ukraine, you know. Even if the Germans ask us many times, give us our leopards back, which we sold you, you know, we didn't send them back. You know, we just kept them because we don't want to uh, get involved. Afterwards, what is done behind the scenes that I cannot, I, I, I cannot uh, know, right? But honestly speaking, we could ask again the Swiss population. Everybody can go and uh, make a referendum, right? You can, you just need certain amount of uh, uh, people who signed the the referendum, and then it will be voted uh, in this, uh, for the Swiss uh, population. So everybody can start it. You just need Swiss citizenship. Yeah. And you need something else. You need make uh, media recognition. You need uh, the media, in part, to speak about it. If not, support it, because if there is no media with you, 
I think you cannot about you cannot try this as a referendum in Switzerland. Like I say, nobody uh, put a referendum to stop Switzerland to do sanction against Russia. Why? Yeah, yeah, but it's not it's not imp so that's why the people can do it, but they if they don't wish to, they also don't need to. That's that's the beauty, right? You can do it if you want to. If Tomorrow you get Swiss citizen citizenship and you think it's a problem, you can go and uh, do it by yourself and be a big boy and uh, try to uh, convince the people. And uh, most of the time it's pretty neutral. You get a sheet of uh, like a book, a little book. Each law is uh, exactly written down what will change, what the government is proposing and what the uh, uh, government is recommending, what is the positive and what is the negative. And most of the time there is parties who are affiliated to the uh, to the points, right? So let's say it's about immigration, then the right parties will say, this is our point, right? This will do this, right? If we implement this and on the other side, the, the left. So you have uh, you have options and you have clear visual visualization of each party, what they want to achieve and what is going to happen and impact your country. Instead of having like in France, who is an, actually he's like a monarch, right? He can oh, just yeah. implement rules and you have nothing to say about it, right? And the, yeah. it's uh, most of the countries is like this. You vote for a president, but four years or five years he's in place and you basically can do nothing if he has the majority. So with us it's different because we ask the people directly do you wish to do that yes or no yes then it will be implemented and that's for me democracy that's for me the most nearest you can get to yeah i agree with you yeah 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 but uh, <laughs> don't say referendum and france that, that is not fitting in one word in paris <laughs> they did it last month or two months ago they did a referendum about suvs in the city about the cars, SUVs. Um, so to raise the the parking tickets for SUVs, <laughs> and there was like one percent when voting from the French, uh, from the uh, people that living in Paris, and they were all green guys. <laughs> so, and it counts. Even one percent of the votes of the number of people that's voting, it counts. So the, the, the referendum result was, if you go to Paris with an SUV, you're going to pay a lot, but a lot of money to park your car in the city. It's actually disgusting. But it's uh, not just this, Mr. Lambo. It's not just this. The government by themselves implemented new rule. You need to put some sticker on your car, how much, uh, um, uh, how much pollution your car is doing. And according to that, yeah, exactly. That's so according to that, you 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 have some problems if you don't uh, actually pay this uh, this uh, this amount of money which you need to pay. Yeah. But the, like I said, democracy is just working when you go vote. That's for, for why it, what they say is believing in democracy and in, in 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 voting because you need to go vote. You can bitch about it on the open mic all you want, but if you don't go and take your vote and vote then it's useless you can just complain bitching about it but it's not going to yeah. change anything you what, need to what go i can vote. agree but i can agree in it like if you need to go vote you can put within your votes thing you can put a few referendum questions that the people are able to decide when will when they are going to vote that's that's maybe a good idea by like for big decisions that they need to do for the for the government um but like the thing that they did in paris that they are that they are going to accept a referendum after just one percent of the people come to vote is actually disgusting well we're not asking in france uh, a referendum about a lot of things which is much more useful about like the retirement age everybody asked about referendum yeah. in france everybody asked and he said no fuck you i will just pass it through uh, 49. Yeah, that's because the friends are lazy. It's not about laziness. It's if You're the government is telling you shut the fuck up and you can do it, you can't do it, right? But if you have yeah. the option to do it, yeah. then you can do it. But, that's the difference. The French but people doing don't a have referendum the about it is a good idea, indeed. Yeah, of course. That's it's really, it's, a, it's yeah. a principle thing, if, in my opinion. It's, a, it's just a matter of principle. If the person have no principles, then no, even if the referendum, he can still don't do it. No, it's like, you know, you see in the UK, it's the same thing. 
they made the referendum on Brexit and then after that, you know, the people voted for to Brexit. Then the government was like dragging their feet all the way and then causing themselves you no know, joke geopolitical problems because EU saw saw the results and EU started to go against the United Kingdom. They started to see United Kingdom as an enemy. They started to make policies to you no know, take down the UK. And the UK was like dragging their feet still, you know, trying to hug that new EU and they, oh, love, I love you, don't leave me, you know, that kind of shit. It's, and then and then no yeah, so, so I don't want to go there, you know, to Boris Johnson and everything. You know, I have a lot of opinion about that. But so the so for me is is that the political parties must first show that they believe in that system. For example, let's say I, it doesn't matter which country you are. For example, if this political party want to eventually push a Swiss a Swiss system of similar to a Swiss system of referendum based democracy then they need to first do it within their own party first <laughs> within their <laughs> own members okay. their own. because you, you if you don't do it you don't do it at the level of your party level then what's the point of who will believe you that you we have a party in, in something like this yeah. when you're in power right it is it, it, bullshit right if the political party now don't listen to the don't 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 uh, get feedback from the citizens what makes you think that when they are in power, they will get you know, feedback from the citizens? Is the they you have to leave your principle. The, the thing is that if political parties mostly don't, they have a lot of rhetoric, but they don't leave what they say they are. And that's a problem. So the which is why you come back to the same point. If you don't have the political parties that is there right now, that is really represents what you hope, then you may have to go into politics and create that system. And it may be totally uh incompatible with the current political system if you look at russia they still have the freaking communist party and they are they are the second most biggest party in russia and russia just let them be you see and they have to try to survive in this system you know it's very interesting so you, know, you still give people the option and that's what something admirable about russia is that they are a democracy but they allow the communist party to exist I think that alone is very admirable because it's basically banned in like most most uh, anti-communist countries. Okay, uh, I, I thought we were going in order uh, go uh, about yeah next God. So there's no we are we are now. in. It's, it's based on the finger, right? It's because I to raise my finger. Yeah. I, God, <laughs> I God say was man. the one after me. Uh, all right, guys. I wanted to speak about the referendum. Uh, there is a census on the referendum, which means uh, fifty-one percent minimum turnout. So if uh, there is no 51% turnout of the people, the referendum doesn't succeed. The, uh, the decision is not made, okay? It fails. Uh, this is what happened in Macedonia. The referendum failed. They accepted the decision. They ignored the results. So what would you do if they ignore the results of your referendum? That was a rhetorical question. The elections on the other side, I don't know who, who counts the votes, but apparently they're fake in America, they're fake in Macedonia, they're pretty much fake everywhere I see. Uh, in regard to the flags, there was a couple of flags forbidden on Australia Open. Among them, one of them was this one here, okay? You can look it up. Palestina, Israel, and this one is forbidden on uh, Australia Open tennis. Uh, so that's what I wanted to point out, that uh, we are stuck in a position where we cannot elect uh, democratic candidates because uh, the candidates which we are electing either are selected by one oligarchs or the other oligarchs or the deep state they are over there uh like a like a dynasty you know uh, yeah so it's a dynasty that been going on in united states here the deep state has been ruling this and i don't know how we're gonna get out of it it was a question of nanya earlier how we're gonna how we see the the exit of this uh uh deep hole we are all stuck in and apparently something is fishy and we can all see it and smell it but uh, I don't know how we get out of it, guys. It, it is a, it's a centralized power on some kind of a grand scale, uh, you know, throughout NATO, throughout the whole world. So we'll, I hope we are alive to see how it's going to all, you know, clarify for everybody. Thank you. It's my turn, I think. I wanted yeah. to add something about uh, the Wyatt comment about internal democracy in the political party. In France, we have this serious problem. Basically, a political party, uh, for at least uh, three to of, uh, four of them, for the main one, are dictatorship. 
the leader is chosen by the very small number of people who make deal between themselves and they don't care about whoever is behind them. That's for the from the left side, the LFE, the far left party. They do whatever they want. So the boss is the boss. Macron, of course, is the boss. Huh? He don't care about what you said uh, when you are in his party. And the far right, it's the same thing. The top guy decide what they want. And if you are not a friend of the Le Pen family, you are nothing. So maybe the the party is really, really, really declining now. That's the conservative right, and the not too much uh, hard left, the Socialist Party. They have an uh, internal uh, democratic system, but they are very, very low uh, today in the poll. I'm great. Next one, yes. Okay. I'll call for you. Yeah. I don't know. You don't want to go, Jordan? Okay, okay. So yeah, okay, you're first. Your finger was first. So why I changed it? Uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah. yeah so I'll, I'll give it quickly and then I'll give it to you. Um, yeah, Shadow, we yeah, agree. The uh, but it's also why these parties, these both political parties, are so low because they were the power for so many years and they fucked it up so for so many years and nobody believes them anymore. That's why we have oh, yeah. now. Either it's going to be a left, uh, extreme left guy, or extreme right person on the on, on uh, as the next president, because there is no the people get more extreme because they don't uh, the like uh, Gotcha said right the people just uh, talking and uh, doing nothing and just representing themselves and that's why the people go away in democratic countries right in other countries that's another topic right because it's much more corrupt and uh, it's much more easy to fake the elections and. Also, we need, don't need to forget uh, about uh, about France that it's very difficult to change things. Many presidents try to change things, but if you touch on important topics, you have one million people on the street. You know, tomorrow, you know, it's it's not that easy in France. It's, France France is, I think, one of the most difficult country to to rule because all the time when you want to make slightest changes, there's so many people mad for. And even they don't know about the, what is changing for them, or they, they just do it for principal reasons. Like some people like retirement age, everybody knows that we live longer and that we need to put more money on the side. And still some French people think they can retire with 60, you know. It, obviously some of them, they have the reason when they've worked very hard in their life, right? When they're very young, right? When they're like 14, 15, they started then, and then they, they get to 60 and they wanna, and they had a hard job. Okay, I understand. But there's so many of our French people, they are just fucking lazy bastards. Let's just be honest about it. They're just lazy bastards who like to complain and like to take a lot like of money me. doing nothing. I'm one of them, okay? You're one of them? Oh, fucking. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fuck this shit, man. Fuck you. That's uh, yeah, why yeah, yeah. You have down, to know man. who you are. <laughs> okay, so, okay. Jordan, Jordan, go on. So, the, the, the upgrade, you just explained perfect example why referendum uh let's say specifically about retirement age wouldn't work it will be still be like a half half and tight decision but uh, we see that the retirement age is a political decision it's no there's no economic basis for it it's a simply political decision yes but you believe and like all of you believe this for fake colonial economics it's for colonial uh economics i mean it's the purpose these economic theories that you guys believe are designed for colonies it's not for the proper uh uh countries or uh how to say it's not proper it's not correct economics theories they're designed so for colonies. Colony so you colony believe colony? What is it's designed for the US colonies, colonies, you have to understand for it colonies to believe it's a fake theories. So if it's the population believe fake theories, like most of the you do believe in those fake theories that the Austrian school, that monetarist propagated, that whole media is talking about, it's not allowed to uh, give proper Keynesian or uh, uh, MMT. It's not allowed to be discussed anymore even though it was normal before, but now it's not allowed. You all believe in the bullshit economic theories. 
and that's why it's easy to cheat you out of your rights. You are, you really the think the age to is simply what? political decision. The the age. Are thinking about no, 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 don't interrupt me. Don't interrupt me, please. Uh, the, it's a simply political decision. The retirement age in the level of the retirement, how much uh, you uh, are supposed to get. It's a political decision. Simply that. But it's also okay? a monetary. It's always risk. been. It's not economic. If you want to go with economic, you will go with a higher level of uh, retirement, higher mm -hmm. income in retirement than lower. That's better economic decision to do. But all of you believe because like people live longer. So why why everybody uh, uh, shouldn't uh, work longer, right? We need to yes, work. office workers can work longer. What about those, the physical workers that use their physical body for the That's work? That's what I mean. What That's what them? I mean. That's what I mean. We need to See, adapt it to the jobs. You understand that this reform is 150 page document. If you work in a construction work. Okay, yeah, I'm saying they decided politically to keep it the same. It's political decision. You should understand that. No, no, no. That. Everybody wants to decision. keep it the same. And then the he decided to over. increase it without the, 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 the population agreeing with it. That's why we wanted a referendum. Yes. It's a political That's, decision. It's not, yes. it's not about, it's it's not not about political. It's not about political. It's because we need to pay more money. Because if not, the, the, the pension no, system will be bankrupt. Not true. Of course. That's what you believe. Those are fake That's economic theories That's that you the numbers, believe in. Man. You believe no, 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 no. You believe in those not, uh, what they tell you. You believe in those theories. Okay, data is wrong. Data is wrong. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Okay. Uh, That's what I'm yeah. telling you. You will vote against your benefits because you believe fake economic theories, and they spend so much, so many years, Thatcher and Reagan, uh, Reagan policies. Those are that are fucking you over. But you don't understand. We, you cannot get. Jordan, again. what do you want? Before, then? Do you want to work less and get more money, or <laughs> how is it working? Okay, okay. Before their time, before the Thatcher and Reagan, the economic policies were different because people believed in different policies, in different economic theories. They understood them, but they brought it, and since then. It's whole media, everyone is spilling you, the school, everyone is spilling you wrong economic theories. So what is everyone. it all about? Euro, Euro. Uh, Euro, Euro. Yes. Uh, you need to be specific. What is the economic theory I'm exactly. talking about now? I'm a bit, a bit confused now. Like, which countries are they all following the same theory? And uh, like, a bit, Most more, of them a bit more specific. Okay, I'm talking about uh, the correct one is Keynesian theory and modern monetary theory. Because it uh, built up on Keynesianism, okay, the classical economic theories. What you believe is in the monetarist theories, where a state uh, depends on its debt, it, uh, the taxes pay, finance the uh, the state, and so on. While Keynes says, when there's unemployment, the state is uh, practically it must do must employ those people, even if you uh, it's better to have people employed to dig uh, the hole and bury a gold or paper money in it and then employ others to dig that money out and make a profit it's better to do that than to lay let them sit unemployed okay that's the Keynesian the theory but you believe oh there's no job we cannot employ people yeah. and you know, one employed pay for the uh, for the pensioner, one pensioner. It's not like that. It's how many people need to be employed to fulfill everything that pensioners need. Because of automatization, you have uh, uh, now one person can can you know produce for thousand people because of automation, robotics, and everything. One person employed. In working, doing good things, can fulfill needs for one thousand people. That's the reality now. Uh, um, Thirty years ago, it was like four employees needed to fulfill that what pensioner need. But now that's why we have unemployment, and they making up bullshit jobs, advertising. 
how much advertising jobs there are. It's huge number. How many entertainment jobs there are? Huge number. It increased so much in last 30 years because there's nothing for them to do. So they're making stuff up, making stuff, uh, making jobs. You know, go uh, government pays advertising campaigns, support them in order to employ people to do that advertising. It's a Euro, Euro, it's, Euro. It's job for the economy. Advertising Euro, before is you, damaged. You because it just takes Euro. the market from one business to another one. Okay, no, that's before why you dig the whole even whole, even deeper because I need we need to ask you a question. If not, you you will lose us because we will go to you go too far. Now I want to ask you: Is it something to do with the 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 way how we print money now? Because now we do not, no longer pack the currency to go. Is this something to do with that? Same. Because no, even before that, nothing new, nothing new. Yeah, yeah. Like, because uh, because I can like see the, I can. See, I can see some problems with, let's say, we don't, we don't uh, create the jobs. Okay, I can imagine there is problems in Singapore, like the Singapore government, like even during COVID, right? We we are the government is literally paying everybody's salary. Exactly. Like exactly. Yeah. So so you know that, that I can imagine you no know, because it's a competitive issue. If we can do do it. No, we still wouldn't die. Like like what you say, you know, the uh, one person can create all the food, but the problem is. You cannot compete with other countries because it's all GDP, right? It's all you know the so it's 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 not even if it's a made up GDP, you know, because if you people don't work, the GDP drops, the valuation of real estate will drop, everything will drop. And then that it, it, it because Singapore, you know, like Singapore's GDP, you know, the real estate is so expensive, that's why the GDP is so high. And that is also through this, you know, this cycle, you see, because we hire so many people. No, no, no. You you consider it in an absolute, like uh, nobody to have a job uh, while uh, you know government pays for it. No, uh, that, that of course that cannot work. You see, uh, you have to have you have to produce for hundred percent. But how many people need to be employed today to produce for hundred percent of population? Right, uh -huh. it's much smaller number today than uh -huh. 30 years ago especially than 50 years ago like uh, uh 100 years ago you need to have at least 70 percent people employed in producing the food alone rest of it was agree, industry agree. government teachers and so on but 50 That's years that, ago that, that, yeah. yeah no so the question is the other people no we you established that point very clearly already the, the about the people who produce the food so what about the people who now no need to produce the food what do you do with them economically i mean for from your per perspective what it should be done with these people okay okay they there, there, there's so much need right to do uh i, I would like uh, let's say take care of uh, some environmental issues right so you can employ uh, to fix uh the city to repair you know uh, facades facades to clean uh, so many things can be done right but also my idea because there is so much need to entertainment and there's so many older people right there's so many older people that are alone are alone so i would and so many people like to talk so i would pay people to entertain older people to be their friends Yes, it's crazy, so it's, but this is the No, future. no, it's not crazy. No, no, this is no, no, already what we are doing. Upgrade is looking yes. at me like I'm crazy. Upgrade is no, no, looking no, no. at it, me like I'm crazy. This is exactly I'm what the government is doing. Exactly. We are paying yes. welfare officers to do these jobs. We are paying, yes. you know, the construction yeah, workers to... Already. The problem with pensions... This is something we already done. Another one. The problem, no, no, the in much larger the... scale. Much larger scale, yeah. individually. Have you, have you seen <laughs> Singapore? <laughs> you know, have you seen how clean we are? We are at that scale, hundred percent. We are at that scale. Well, service is most of the our societies nowadays is based on service. This is there is nothing unusual about it. It is true we need nowadays to produce much less than we used to. But let's not forget the richest countries in the world still are producing uh, countries like Germany, China, and these people. Uh, do spend much more time working in producing goods than other countries. And you also see that in these countries, we have actually a lack of people for those yeah, types of... But I didn't finish. Okay, 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 okay. 
and that's there where we have lack of people for those entertainment stuff. It is true. But let's uh, you guys were, were saying about the um, uh, the pensions and the pension funds and all that. The problem about it is a huge amount of quantity of money that is stuck on these pension funds, and we have been seeing a kind of an assault to those uh, to those funds lately. There, what people worked in their whole lives will be enough for them to oh, still. Those 14 live. minutes is for well, Prada well, 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 well. It will still be enough for us to live 100 years. That's not the problem. The problem is what we have been doing with the money. And the money has been invested in stuff that might disappear. Uh, oh, gosh. Prata, Portugal, Nice, Salazar, back. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but anyways, uh, the problem is that uh, ten, uh, after 2009, there was an assault to those monies that were like a little bit invested on, on well, they were, they were just there standing in funds. And they decided to start investing these monies. And, so, and also there was a, an assault on all the social, um, all the social uh, service that these funds were supposed to create. So uh, hospital bills are nowadays in many of the developing countries just huge. It's insane. It's amazing. The, the medicines they are choosing as well to, to keep people, um, the most expensive ones. I remember before 2009 in Portugal, there was a big discussion because of the cost of the medicines. And they decided to create, to, to give the opportunity. Well, the hospitals were obliged to use generic, generic uh, well, medicines, the same compounds, but uh, uh, without the brand. And this was much cheaper. But we still we saw that this came back all back again. So the the brands are back. They have a huge. The farmers have a huge um, lobby on Brussels everywhere. Now they, for instance, they decided to uh, oblige all medicines in European Union to be recertified again. And many of these little uh, generics decided they are not going to do so. Many hospitals now are even without medicines. So we have these kind of schemes to take as much money from the from the pension funds as they can? Is it to the hospitals? Is this uh, with, um, um, uh, oh, it's here in Germany, they pay a lot of monies for uh, recoverings. They, they do nothing to people. It's just they, they pay a massage and little things. And they actually, they, they bring very little to, to what people really need. And, and that's it. But otherwise, people, what people uh, paid for the pension funds over their life work, it's enough for them to live over 100 years. There's enough money for everybody. And like, if, if Jordan reconsiders what he said himself, we don't need as many people to produce goods in order to support the whole society, right? But still, uh, let's have into account that even this theory is a bit putting in cost because the richest countries on earth, the most secure ones, are the ones that still produce goods and not just sell service. So we can look at the UK as a parasite and we can see the Germans and the Chinese, the real, uh, the real ones working for the common society. A parade or wait? Yeah, that's a fake. So, uh, no, fake, no, I have uh, to intercept so, because I need to do closing soon because I need to run. So uh, closing, upgrade. Are already closing no, right I now. Didn't finish. Yeah, uh, closing because I have to go to reduce. The I, I have to go. Week to I have to accompany hours. my wife. Yeah, I have to accompany my wife to send my kids to home uh, to school yeah, because it's shit. the first day she drive it, drive drive the kid to school, just in case. So, so okay. another we have suggestion to was to reduce thirty-two uh, work week to thirty-two hours. Okay. Wait, wait, closing, but closing. We, wait, wait. You have, yes, uh, you, okay, I didn't you, finish you, the last okay. one. I Euro closing. Euro, you close first. Euro, you close okay, first. I wanted to. Okay. Um, quickly uh, about what needs to be done uh, for the uh, the uh, to something to change to take to change. It doesn't matter. In my opinion, it doesn't matter uh, who is in power. But we need to make them do things that we want. We shouldn't let them ignore us. But because most of the people, especially on conservative right, these believe these strong fake theories. And uh, uh, they voted for those people that brought in the Citizen United in the United States. They always uh, follow for the cut, tax cuts. That's conservative, right? 
rights conservatives they vote for they want that they want to destroy the state and now they ever they complain about how nobody can stop the wealthy they control the world they fucking us over they just bribing all the politicians right it's a conservative rights but i still do hear from those that destroyed that believe those fake ideas that destroyed this uh world basically they destroyed with these ideas about tax cuts about destroy destruction of, of union they still hate towards the liberals yes now liberals became the same as them but they still blame them for what they caused conservative rights is to blame for destruction of the world as, as uh, in the last 40 years and the liberals 40 years ago when they were different were warning about this we're warning that this is going to be happening when the uh, rich take full control, where they have too much money to bribe the politicians, to force them to do, to open the revolving door and, and so on, and to do, to do the total unlimited campaign uh, money for them. And the uh, conservative right still blames liberal for something. They just want to dis keep destroying the world. They want to double down. That's what needs to change. First, the people needs to change, and then can, the government can change. That's my closing. Thank, thank you. Euro. Sorry, I need to rush you guys. So two, three minutes max, so that I need to go, because I need to finish this in ten minutes. Like really, really. Uh, I'll be so short, since we, like since a minute. Euro, then go there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'll be really short. Um, I'll speak fast. You, you, listen widely. Okay, uh, democratic, they all declare that they're democratic, liberal democratic, democratic party, they all have democracy in their name. Um, democracy, according to Aristotle the Macedonian, I said it right, you should look it up, it means what's good for the people, what works for the people. Democratic is uh, alive, democracy is alive, meaning what is working for the people, what's going to make them happy. If majority, 99% are happy, that's democracy, functional working. Now, in this case, we have one tractor working for one village, producing uh, abundance, abundance of food. What do we do now? How do we implement democracy? Uh, there is five things. You have education uh, to be satisfied, for one person to be to be creative. You have education, give them education, give them medical, give them socialization, uh, give them food and give them roof over his head. These five things, if they're satisfied, this person can, uh, he's not going to sit around and be a bum and couch potato all day. He, he will, uh, with the help of the education, he will find uh, uh, something to create, to to uh, explore his potential, potential and fulfill his potential in his life. If you give him these five things. Now, let's see. Education, instead of free, it's expensive. Medical, it's instead of free, it's expensive. Socialization, it's expensive for everybody. Food, very expensive. And roof over your head, also very expensive. So I would say we have oligarchy, not democracy. If this was democracy in time of tractor with abundance, we can all have all these five things satisfied if we had a... Uh, democratic government as they declare themselves, we would be all fed, roof over your head, socialized, medical and education, and then you can dedicate your free time to do uh, charity, to produce food, to work for money or whatever you want to do with your free time, be creative and, uh, you know, fulfill the potential for the good of the other people, you know. So that was my ending. Thank you. Thank you, Godzilla. Prata, Prata, show one, show one. You're, you're muted. <laughs> so, Europe is in a turmoil with politicians making all types of the most stupid, absurd, warmongering comments, and then take it out, take it uh, out, and put it again. And I, I find this it has a little bit, especially Macron. It's, uh, the guy is really strange. But what I find is there is a kind of an experiment. They are trying to see the reaction of the population, which is strange enough, has not been reacting much at all. So we haven't had demonstrations for pro-freedom uh, on the streets like we had last year. So um, I'm, I'm, uh, I am I'm I don't know if people really are awake or if they are dormant, what's happening. They are waiting for the Olympic game. Again? They are waiting for the Olympic game. <laughs> the people? No, I don't, think, I, don't think, I don't think people are waiting for the Olympic games. But they do are waking to wake up because people are 
they they if you talk to people on the streets they they feel this is too much like they are paralyzed by so much and i i do hope that in the next weeks people start to wake up and start making comments because our politicians in europe have gone too far and if it was for them we would have world war three next week i hope we don't so it was my closing short as possible thank you brother <laughs> no worries. Should it be, should it be? yes uh, I, we have begin to see some uh, news article in uh, u.s media about uh, ukrainian uh, killing civilian uh, in russia and uh, in uh, yes in russia and i think uh, we are going to see more and more uh, news article on the media speaking about how the ukrainian are also the bad guys so we could uh, let them uh, be killed by the russian uh, and uh, it's a good thing to do basically the u.s mainstream media i think are uh, slowly uh, preparing the opinion to uh, let uh, ukrainian uh, down so that's my finishing I was Thank surprised they're they are telling the Ukrainians are Nazis now. The first oh, time yes. I read that. Lambo, Lambo. Closing, closing. This was an yes. exchange. Um, there was a friend who opened my long time ago I came because, yeah, the dates were not good for me. Um, yeah, Ukraine. Ukraine is fucking losing very hard. We're seeing with the FAPS. FAPS is for me a big topic. Um, says enough for me. Um, Russia is, is still a little bit cranking up. Now I, I think it's going to be much more cranking up because congratulations to Putin winning his elections again with more than 87%. So he's going to crank more up because, yeah, he has now a term again. He doesn't need to pay attention anymore about his population or what he's doing. So I, I still, I thinking that the future is going to be very bad for Ukraine. Sadly for them, it's going to be very bad because he's going to crank up. I am waiting for it. They're already busy now with uh, drones, uh, Garan uh, strikes over Ukraine for the moment. So I see, I may be going to see, we go, may be going to see some cruise missiles. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I don't going to add more of it. I, I, I was hoping to come earlier to talk more about Ukraine. But um, just to give you some numbers, Russia made last year more planes than they lost new planes. They built new, more new planes than they actually lost. So, uh, yeah, that's a nice figure. figure. Um, also, if you hear some things about planes shooting down, wait for the pictures to see some proof. And the era where you have cell phones and... Uh, and all these possible ways to see footage and all these claiming propaganda bullshit. Uh, yeah, pictures or, or it's not proven, you know. Um, then I have a personal message to Mr. Sleffy. I will, I still want to microwave you, and my lesbian Subaru wants to date uh, your GT86. Bye bye. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Lambo. I'm great. Yeah, uh, I just had to uh, uh, disagree with uh, what Jordan said about a lot of things, but I will not go over it. It's too long. And uh, yeah, just don't count on your pension money to have money on the end of your life. Invest money <laughs> in uh, in stocks and whatever you can, you know, uh, take care of yourself. The states, fuck them, you know, they don't care about you. If you don't have money to pay your bills, nobody going to help you, you know, just yourself. So have a nice one. And Wyatt, good luck uh, with your daughter. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye, you. guys. Thank you Bye. for participating. Yes. Bye. So I will be oh, doing Putin. my own. Uh... Uh, Putin. Putin. Yeah. <laughs> nice big image of Putin fabbing. He's fabbing on his bomb. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. So, okay. Uh, thank you for watching uh, for the episode uh, 70 of the DPA Open Mic. Sorry, I have to rush off uh, because I need to accompany my wife to send the kids to school because I just bought a car. And then I need to make sure that uh, my wife knows the road because uh, she she's not Singaporean, so she need to get used to the road. And uh, yeah, so 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 that's the main thing why I need to rush off. And uh, thank you for watching. And uh, I think it's a very good open mic. Uh, but I'm not going to talk too much because uh, I run rushing for time in case no. I, so anyway, um, yeah. Thank you for watching, and uh, I will see you guys in the next update.